Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 2 of what if I was reborn in Naruto as a civilian orphan trained and became the wind calamity. The playlist is above and with that being said let the tale begin. Chapter 31 Graduation Exam Only a week was left for fourth year's exams. Jenki followed the same procedure as last year and asked the students interested in participating in the graduation exam to meet him after class. Fujin thought, I guess it's time to finally become a ninja. There's not much that I can learn in the academy anymore. At best I could learn another element or a few more jinjutsu. If I don't attempt the exam this year, the teachers and maybe even Haruzen could grow suspicious. And I'll definitely won't receive much help from them in the future. As for tanking the exam, I am not confident that I could fake my performance convincingly enough for someone who has decades of experience. Either way, I believe I am ready now. After the class, Fujin visited Jenki and confirmed his participation. Jenki smiled and wished him good luck. With just a week left for the exams, Fujin started to focus on the syllabus for written exams. The syllabus was actually quite surprising. He recalled back when Jenki started teaching this in the academy. He was teaching trigonometry. Fujin's first thoughts when he saw that was, Trigo? For fucking nine-year-old kids? What's next? Differentiation and integration? As annoyed as he was by it, he was extremely surprised when Hannah was able to solve them perfectly. He mentally screamed, how the fuck can nine-year-old kids learn Trigo so easily? He sighed at how much smarter the kids here were and continued with his studies. He also wanted to be perfectly prepared while going on missions. He stopped learning new seals and instead had his clones focus on making a few essential objects for him. He bought two ninja waist bags, two ninja leg pouches and a couple of metallic wristbands. He then had his clones make storage seals on these items. The Fuinjutsu scroll in Section D of the library expanded a bit on the storage seal. It explained ways to increase or decrease the size of the storage space, as well as manipulating its shape. It wasn't very difficult as it only increased or decreased the number of space symbols involved. So the seal itself was still very basic. However, this was very useful for Fujin. In the interior of the ninja waste bags, Fujin managed to draw seven storage seals. For Ninja Leg Pouch, he was able to draw four seals. These had a lot less space as compared to the seals he made on scrolls, however, considering that their purpose was to enhance the capacity of the bags and pouches, it was very handy. For the Leg Pouch, two seals could store six kanais each, and other two seals could store 24 shurikens each. He then created various triggers to refill the pouch from weapons in the storage seals. This way, his weapon supply would be much larger. For the waste bag, the seals could store a lot more. But he hadn't yet decided what to fill in here. He did have some ideas like a first aid kit, ninja ropes, scrolls, seals that stored elements, more weapons, explosion tags, soldier pills, ration bars, and so on. For the wristbands, he made one small seal on each of them. When he wears the wristbands, these seals will be directly under his palms. The seals created a cuboidal storage seal which was around 15 cm asterisk 15 cm asterisk 100 cm. Both these seals were made to store swords. This way, he could quickly access his swords whenever he wanted to. Other than this seal, he planned on drawing three more seals on each wristband. For the seals on the opposite side to the current one, Fujin planned on buying huge sturdy shields and storing them there. If he ever gets in an awkward position where he can't defend himself with the rock shield, he'll depend on this shield to provide cover to himself. However, since he wasn't sure about the size of shield he buy, he didn't draw that seal. Other than these two, he planned on inscribing two more storage seals on the wristband, but for now he didn't have any idea what to store in there. So he left it for the future. A slash in, ideas for the above are welcomed. On the day before the exam, Fujin, under a disguise, bought a lot of weapons. He bought 96 shurikens and 24 kanais to fill both the leg pouches. He also bought 12 explosion tags to attach them to 6 kanais in each of the pouches. In all it cost 65k ryo. 
He bargained and got them for 55k Rio under the false promise of buying again in the future. Next day, the final exam began. Since he intended to pass and wanted to be rank 1, he aced the written exam. He was sure that he'd score full. With the absence of Teru, Nobu and Yori, he also did the best in the shuriken throwing competition. In Taijutsu, he still ranked 2 behind Hoka. While in the ninjutsu exam, he made sure to perform only as good as Hana. There wasn't any chakra control exercise in the exam. But Fujin wasn't very surprised as nearly everyone in his class had very good chakra control and could do both tree climbing and water walking as Jenki had held a lot of sessions on it this year. The exam also tested the students on the various basic skills that were taught in the previous year. Fujin again ensured that he be ranked near the top in this exam. After the results were out, Fujin ranked first, Hana ranked second and Hoka surprisingly ranked fifth. He had improved his written exam scores a lot to be able to get such a high rank. A week later, the graduation exam was conducted. Fujin noticed that there were students from three different batches. His own, his senior batch, and the batch one year junior to him. Twenty-three students from his class were participating. Unknown to Fujin, the exam was held by Nara Kisho. He looked at the list of students participating. There were 68 participants from the fifth year, 35 from the fourth year, and 8 from the third year. He sighed thinking what a drag this exam would be and instructed to begin the exam. The first exam was a written test. Fujin looked in the paper expecting some more theory questions. However, he was surprised when he read them. They weren't any theory questions, but instead scenarios were mentioned and the students had to write in what they would do. After reading all the scenarios, Fujin sighed, just basic ninja protocols and confirming that the students are brainwashed. To think that I actually expected something good. He answered as any, ready to graduate, academy student would answer. The exam was an hour long. Once the hour was up, the papers were collected and sent to Nara Kisho. He had six academy teachers check the answers and decide whether the student is ready to graduate or not. It took half an hour to completely check them and then they provided the results to Kisho. One of the teachers said, Sir, we've completed checking. Out of 111 students, 79 have provided satisfactory answers. Rest aren't ready yet. Kisho nodded and said, Dismiss them. Those 32 students were asked to go back home and prepare well for the next year. Fujin was surprised by this. Wow, they just asked the kids to leave? Won't that be demotivating? Or are they just trying to reduce the number of participants for the next exam? Fujin wasn't alone with those thoughts. One of the teachers, who taught a normal class, asked Kisho, Kisho Senpai, won't this demotivate the students? The ones who participated in the exam are among the brightest students in the academy. Kisho looked at the teacher. He was two years junior to Kisho in the academy, but he wasn't very talented and had barely become a chunin during the war. Kisho shook his head and said, if they get demotivated by such a small failure, then there's no hope for them. They would be better off in the Jinin reserve force and will save the resources needed to raise someone more worthy to chunin rank. The teacher wasn't very convinced with the answer, but didn't say anything as this wasn't the first time Kisho had supervised the graduation exam. After the written exams, the students were tested on various parameters like shurikens, stealth, camping, chakra control, etc. It was similar to the tests conducted for Fujin's class a week back. Since the tests for elite classes were already conducted, they weren't tested again and their scores from a week back were carried forward. The academy teachers observed everyone's performance and failed another 15 students over these exams. On getting the reports, Kisho thought, wow, that's so convenient. Now the Taijutsu tournament will be so much simpler to conduct. Right before the Taijutsu tournament began, Hokage arrived to watch the exam. He was followed by a character that Fujin recognized very easily, Hataki Kakashi. Fujin was very surprised to see him. He thought, why is Kakashi here? Hiruzen wouldn't force him to start training kids right now, would he? I really hope not. Canon timeline will be fucked up if Hiruzen assigns my squad to him. 
I am not sure how strong I'd be in another six to seven years, so for now I really hope something doesn't change due to me. Next was a Taijutsu tournament between the 64 remaining students. Kisho arranged for a knockout tournament. So one student could fight for a maximum of six times. Fujin breezed through to the semifinals. In the semifinals, he had to fight with a Hyuga who was a year older than him. Fujin fought very hard against him, but was still at a lot of disadvantage. While he did get a few critical hits and with one strong punch on his right rib, another on his nose, and a strong kick under his left rib, in the end, he still lost the fight. Fujin was initially a bit irritated at the loss, damn, how exactly do these guys train? I lost despite so much progress I made over the past couple of months. He then calmed himself and analyzed the fight better, on other hand, it's probably reasonable. I'm guessing the elders from the Hyuga clan regularly spar with them. I on other hand could only spar with my clone. Also, the Hyuga fighting style is entirely Taijutsu. I, on the other hand, was a lot more dependent on wind propelling jutsu, body flicker jutsu and earth military movement jutsu during my spars. Removing them does reduce my fighting ability considerably. Perhaps if ninjutsu and kinjutsu were allowed, I'd have won this fight. Not to mention, I didn't even use chakra to enhance my punches and kicks in the fight. He then watched the finals between Hoka and that guy. Due to the injuries he suffered against Fujin, he lost after struggling for a bit. However, having fought both of them, Fujin knew that even without those injuries, Hoka would have still won the match. Hoka ranked first, however Fujin wasn't worried much, my points in the normal exam were much higher than Hoka's. So this difference won't affect much, I should still rank first in my class. Fujin noticed that no one was eliminated in the Taijutsu tournament. Chapter 32, Graduation Exam For the next test, a few academy teachers brought the kids to a part of the training grounds. On reaching there, the students noticed a long white line drawn on the ground and a bunch of obstacles placed ahead of it. Fujin thought, is this an obstacle race? However, he soon shook his head denying that thought, no way, this is too simple. All the 64 students were made to stand behind the white line. Jenki then appeared and announced, this will be the next phase of your exam. This is an obstacle race, and you have to run 500 meters straight to the white line that is drawn there. This announcement excited all the students. They thought, finally an easy exam. The ones who had taken the graduation exam previously thought, why wasn't this exam there the previous year? Fujin was confused by such an easy exam. However, he noticed that there was another man standing behind Jenki. And when Jenki finished his announcement, he looked at him and nodded. Kisho looked at the excited kids and chuckled, he thought, this should be fun. Sadly the kids don't know that the guy standing there is an experienced Jounin from the Kurama clan. He is Kurama Illumi. In the previous war, hundreds of enemies fell prey to him and his bag of tricks. Jenki then announced, on your mark, get set, go. However, while he was announcing, Kurama Illumi was making some hand signs. And when he heard go, he casted his jutsu, demonic illusion, heaven and earth reversal. As soon as he launched his jutsu, all the 64 students were shaken. It was as if someone grabbed the ground and the sky and reversed them. The gravity felt upside down. Most of the students were incredibly frightened and tightly hugged the ground underneath them. There were only four exceptions. A young girl from the third year, who was from the Uchiha clan. She activated her Sharingan as soon as she felt the changes. Two students from the fifth year, who were from the Kurama clan and aware of this jutsu. And Fujin, who kept an eye on Alumi and saw him performing the hand signs. He also felt someone trying to influence his nervous system, which let him know that it was a Jinjutsu. He was planning to disrupt the Jinjutsu, however when he noticed that others were being affected too, he didn't disrupt it so as to not attract any attention. Even though Fujin noticed the Jinjutsu, he was extremely impressed at the guy's ability to cast a Jinjutsu on 64 students at the same time. Kurama Illumi smirked looking at the reactions of all the students. He had used rank B Jinjutsu on them. 
He had used this Jinjutsu many times to disrupt his enemies enough for his allies to kill them in the Third Great Ninja War. Kisho observed the students attentively. He thought, this test will test the willpower of the students. If they don't complete the race, then there's no way I'll pass them. While all the students were struggling, Fujin was trying to find his balance. He thought quickly about what this test is about. He quickly figured out that there were three possibilities which were either they're testing our ability to break the Jinjutsu, or test our willpower or perhaps our capability to react in an unexpected situation. Either way, this is just a Jinjutsu. I should just look downwards and try to move along. If others break the Jinjutsu, I'll do so too. With those thoughts, he took his first step. Apart from him, only the two students from the Karama clan were moving. Soon a few others took their first step. The girl from the Uchiha clan resisted the Jinjutsu and after 15 seconds was able to break through it. She then ran the obstacle race with absolute ease. Fujin sensed someone moving along at a very rapid speed and observed the girl. He was incredibly surprised, Sharingan. At this young age? He continued his race. After the first few steps, he tried jogging along the race. The other students too slowly managed to get a hang of the conditions and increase their speed. Fujin ranked fourth in the test. In all, only 41 students passed. Of the remaining 23, a few fell unconscious, and many didn't dare to take even a single step. Kisho dismissed them and asked them to leave. Immediately after the test, the Ninjutsu test was started. Kisho's thoughts were, the previous Jinjutsu would have shaken these kids. So they won't be at their full potential while performing the Ninjutsu. Which is how it should be as they won't get normal conditions to perform Ninjutsu in a real fight. Six academy teachers observed one student each. To improve the effect of the previous test, Kisho arranged the tests in such a manner that the ones who completed the previous test last had to attempt the ninjutsu exam first. The requirement to pass the ninjutsu exam was pretty lax. Just the three basic ninjutsu and any one other ninjutsu. Though the kids in the start struggled a bit, they didn't have any issue in completing the minimum requirements. What surprised Fujin, though, is that 16 students display fire release, one jutsu, and another seven display fire release, two jutsu. Fujin's thoughts were, land of fire indeed. Most probably all of them have fire affinity. Also seeing how everyone has practiced it, I guess most of Kanoha's jounins with fire affinity can use the most advanced form of this jutsu. Considering that, I guess all the other villages should have their own counters for this jutsu. But since they are still asking the kids to focus on this jutsu, I suppose it still is very useful. Apart from it, the majority of the kids displayed the jutsus their clan specialized in. When Fujin's turn came, he performed the three basic ninjutsu, then performed wind clone jutsu and created eight clones. He then showed his wind explosion jutsu and finally displayed great breakthrough jutsu. Of course, he only displayed one fourth of their power use hand signs and perform them a bit slowly. While not too outstanding, he still outperformed his classmates. What surprised Fujin the most is the performance of the Uchiha girl. She announced that she'll first perform fire release, three jutsu. Fujin became very interested when she announced it as he wasn't aware of what this stage of the jutsu could do. Right after she announced it, two academy teachers stepped forwards and held a metallic string between their hands. Fujin was a bit puzzled, isn't this the same thing they did for fire release, two jutsu? Just that instead of one teacher, two stepped up. After making the hand signs, she raised both her arms and pointed her index and middle finger out. Heat rays were released from both her fingers from both hands and in a few seconds, they cut both the metallic strings. Fujin thought, that's it? It's the same as fire release, two jutsu. Just that in that, they could release the heat ray through only one hand. There's basically no increase in the power of the jutsu, just the quantity. Still very weak for a rank C jutsu. Strange! Does the jutsu suddenly get much stronger in the later stages? She continued her test by displaying fireball jutsu and fire dragon jutsu. Her performance was very good. 
In Fujin's opinion, in terms of ninjutsu, her performance was only second to a student from the Hataki clan from the fifth year. After the exam was over, the teachers began tallying the score. Nara Kisho passed this work to his subordinates. His job was over when he decided to pass these 41 students. Kisho then reported to Haruzen, Lord Hokage, all these 41 kids have passed my exam. Overall there is one from the third year, nine from the fourth year and thirty-one from the fifth year. They should make splendid shinobi. Combined with the ninety-four that passed from the senior most batch, this year's results have been very good for us. Hiruza nodded and said some kind words to the Nara shinobi. After tallying the scores, they were displayed for all the students to see. Fujin was still ranked first in his class. He was followed by Hana and then Hoka, whose rank increased due to superior performance in the graduation exam. After that, all the 41 students were gathered before Haruzen. Haruzen smiled and began giving another speech on the will of fire. Only this time, he was much more passionate, spoke with more fever and his speech was more intense than any of his earlier speeches. Even Fujin was a bit dumbfounded on how someone can brainwash so openly, with such vigor and be extremely proud about it. However, as the speech ended, Fujin smirked internally thinking, Will of fire, will of fire, will of fire. Let me now see how much will of fire you actually have. Ha ha ha. After the speech, Haruzen said, Hataki Rei, Suzuki Fujin, Achiha Mieko stepped forward. All the three kids stepped forward and stood in front of Haruzen. He said, All three of you have worked very hard and performed splendidly. Speak. What reward would you like for your performance? As soon as he said that, Hataki Rei stepped forward. It was seen as rude by many, including Fujin and Mieko. While Fujin didn't mind it, Mieko did pout. However, Rei's next words made everyone understand why he stepped so hurriedly. He said, Lord Hokage, my mother is very sick and the doctors we visited couldn't cure her. Could you please arrange a good medical ninja to treat her? While everyone now understood why he was so restless, it did pop another question in their mind. Fujin's thoughts were, isn't he from the Hataki clan? Sure Sakumo is long dead, but their condition shouldn't be that desperate, should it? Also, shouldn't they have enough money to arrange it anyways? Unless it requires someone like Tsunade to deal with it, then I can understand. But even then, I don't think Haruzen can call Tsunade back anyways. Kakashi too was visibly confused. Only a few teachers and Hiruzen knew the truth. Hiruzen thought, sigh, the Hataki clan has really deteriorated after Sakumo's death. Sadly Kakashi hasn't paid much attention to the clan. This kid suddenly began performing really well this year, and hence I had looked into his background. His father died in the Third Ninja War, and his mother was only a civilian who wasn't even from the Hataki clan. Therefore she hasn't been paid any attention by the clan. She fell sick half year back and became the motivation for this lad to work hard. Though I do want Kakashi to lead a squad of Jinnins, this was my main purpose to bring him here today. For him to take reins of the Hataki clan and bring it back to prosperity. Hiruza nodded and said, I'll arrange the best medics to treat your mother. He then smiled and said, keep training hard. Ensure that the will of fire in you burns brighter than ever. Hataki excitedly said yes and promised to keep training hard. Kakashi observed the young kid and decided, I need to take a proper look at what's going in the clan. Hiruzen secretly paid attention to Kakashi's reaction and was very satisfied with it. He could see the Hataki clan making a comeback soon. Chapter 33 I Really Am a Ninja after having Hokage's word to treat his mother, Rei stepped back. Mieko then stepped forward and said, Lord Hokage, I don't want any reward. This surprised everyone. Even Hiruzen was surprised, but he hid it and calmly analyzed, is this a way the Uchiha are retaliating for their constant monitoring? He then tried to convince her a couple of times, but she declined to get any reward. Hiruzen sighed and looked over at Fujin and thought, the Uchiha matter makes me feel my age. Well, at least he should have a reasonable request. This day should end properly. Fujin, on the other hand, was dumbfounded by both his fellow toppers. 
he thought, what the fuck? One begs for his mother's life, and the other refuses to accept any reward? Why do they want to make my life harder? He then calmed himself and muttered to himself, sigh whatever. It doesn't matter. The Tao of shamelessness must live on. He steeled himself and stepped forward. He put up a smile and an excited expression while thinking, this is it. For this moment I carried two swords in person for five whole months. He then said, Lord Hokage. For my reward, I want two swords made entirely of chakra metal. He then looked at the Hokage with excited and hopeful expression while hoping that somehow his eyes sparkled like in anime. Majority of the students weren't aware of chakra metal. However, almost every teacher knew it. And they were absolutely shocked by the request. Jenki, who was standing close by, had his jaw dropped after hearing what Fujin said. If Fujin had seen him, he would be sure that he could fit an egg in Jenki's mouth. Kakashi's eyebrows twitched at request. He thought, talk about extravagant. Even my father's blade wasn't entirely made of chakra metal. The one who was shocked the most, however, was Haruzen. Despite wearing the Hokage's hat and having excellent control over his emotions, Fujin could still see his shock. Of course, he totally ignored it. He thought, whether Haruzen is happy or so shocked that he dies of a heart attack is none of my business. Hmm, wait. If he dies right now, then it'd be very bad. But, yeah, I don't think just this much shock would be enough to kill this old freak. He did live through three brutal wars without even taking a single major injury. Hiruzen's mind went totally blank for a second. He then thought, made entirely of chakra metal? Even the ones they sell in Kanoha only have around 15% chakra metal. Rest is made of other common materials. The last time someone made a sword entirely of chakra metal was when Sensei commissioned to cast that sword. And it cost well over a hundred million Ryo to make that sword. Of course, this kid is probably not aware of that fact, and I could fool him, but that's still worth tens of millions of Ryo. He then looked at Jenki to see if he knew what's going on, however he was clearly shocked too. In fact, he didn't even notice the Hokage looking at him. Hiruzen thought, now what to do? I can't directly say no. That would be too demotivating. Also it won't look good for me to deny him. If I do, I'm 100% sure that Danzo will spread rumors saying that the Hokage lies to academy students. Hiruzen thought hard for another few seconds and came up with a reasonable excuse. Seeing that Hiruzen was ready to talk, Kakashi noticed and chuckled internally, it took Lord Hokage 13 seconds to answer. That kid sure is something. Hiruzen finally sighed and said, Sadly I can give you what you want because no one makes swords made entirely of chakra metal. Fujin wasn't aware of the fact that chakra blades weren't entirely made of chakra metal and thought that Hiruzen is just making an excuse. He showed a dejected expression and said, A couple of Tonto made of chakra metal then? Kakashi's eyebrows twitched again at Fujin's new request. He did struggle to keep his laughter in after seeing Hiruzen's expression. Jenki, on the other hand, was even more shocked. Hiruzen replied again, Sadly, even they aren't made entirely of chakra metal. Fujin was almost pissed at hearing that reply. But he calmed himself and thought about what Haruzen had said. A few words stuck in his mind, aren't made entirely of chakra metal. It then clicked him, wait, in my previous world, didn't such production involve a lot of alloys, or other materials? Even gold jewelry wasn't 100% gold. Is that what he is referring to? He then asked, Lord Hokage, what do you mean by aren't made entirely of chakra metal? Do they only put a little bit of chakra metal and then something else in the sword? Hiruzen nodded nervously, not liking where the conversation was headed to. Fujin then excitedly began saying, Lord Hokage, then. However, he was cut by Hiruzen. He asked, Fujin, can you tell me why exactly do you want a sword made of chakra metal? While asking this question, he was desperately thinking, I need to change topic fast. Can't let him continue talking about this. Fujin, upset at being cut, said, I was told that they assist in chakra flow. I like using swords, and want to be better at it by using chakra flow. 
Haruza narrowed his eyes and asked, How do you know about chakra flow? Fujin did get a hint that Haruzen was aiming to change the topic, however he wasn't much concerned. He could always innocently get back to the topic. Haruzen might be a hundred times better at negotiating, however being a ten-year-old kid had a lot of advantages. He answered without any hesitation, Michi-sensei. Haruzen then looked over begrudgingly at Michi who was at the sides. He thought, that's it, I'm assigning him a weak gen and squad and will make him do nothing apart from D rank missions for half a year. We have pretty much recovered from our losses, so loss of one chunin won't be felt. He then explained very kindly to Fujin, you don't need swords made of chakra metal to use chakra flow. You can use them on normal swords too, however they break if you do. Fujin thought, yeah, I know. Get to the point. Haruzen continued, there are actually special swords that are made to aid chakra flow. In the land of iron, many samurai use those swords. As for chakra metal, it's a bit problematic and could get you in trouble. Fujin naturally knew that. Having swords worth tens of million ryo would put a target on his back. Which is why he was planning on leaving them with Haruzen. He thought, that's a valid concern. Though I'm sure that it isn't the main reason for him to not give me chakra blades. But this new info does intrigue me. Why didn't any of the weapon shops have it? He left that question for later and asked, Is it possible to make those swords to assist wind chakra flow? For the first time today, Fujin asked a question genuinely. However, it still put Haruzen on edge. He thought, Yeah, it can. They would have to use wind nature chakra metal for it though. And it'll still take the cost to millions. Haruzen replied, Yes, it is, but it's better for you to not get it yet. How about this? When you are ready, I'll help you get in touch with the right people to make a sword like that. Fujin dejectedly thought, I am sure I could get in touch with them myself pretty soon. However, he still nodded. Haruzen was finally happy that he saved millions of Ryo. He was going to talk, but Fujin spoke again. He asked Lord Hokage, You said the sword that you'll give me is used by samurai, right? Haruza nodded while really hoping that there were no more extravagant requests. Fujin continued, Then could you have someone teach me samurai saber techniques? Please. Haruzen thought about it. For one, he was happy that the request didn't involve tens of millions of Ryo. Secondly, he had noticed Fujin's interest in swords. He thought, having a sword master sensor who specializes in wind release can be a very useful asset. Though we can't teach samurai saber techniques liberally, teaching it to a few kids is acceptable. He nodded and said, All right, I'll assign you a teacher for it. Fujin then politely thanked him and stepped backwards while secretly thinking, being an innocent little kid has a lot of advantages. Though I don't think I can ever beat Haruzen again in negotiations. That old monkey has the experience of negotiating after three great ninja wars, and the ones he negotiated with were a hundred times more unreasonable than me. Looking at Fujin stepping back, Hiruzen released a sigh of relief. He then congratulated everyone and left quickly. While leaving, he decided that this would be the last year he'd give out rewards to the topper. After Hiruzen left, many teachers awkwardly stared at Fujin. However, he just ignored them and pretended to not notice any of their stares. After Haruzen left, all the respective class teachers handed the headbands to their students and praised them for graduating early. They were asked to visit the academy after three days. On getting the headband, Fujin put it on. His first words after that moment were, Wow, I really am a ninja now. Chapter 34 Analysis and Plans Fujin sat down in a meditative posture in his living room. He cleared his mind and began planning. He thought, the academy is finally over. Though I had to graduate two years early, it ain't much of an issue. The only major event that will happen anytime soon is the Uchiha massacre. But right now I am not really strong enough to even think about interfering in it. While I do have two years, at best, I'll only be a chunin officially by then. He thought for a bit more and decided, all right, I'll ignore the event. It shouldn't affect me in any way. Secondly, my strength. Right now, though experience is lacking, 
it won't be wrong to say that despite not having many ranked C jutsus in my arsenal, my ninjutsu is probably barely at Shunin level. The three months of daily sparring helped me iron out many issues in my ninjutsu. My chakra reserves have increased rapidly too. I can now make three shadow clones that satisfy the requirements mentioned in the scroll. Which means that my chakra level is well into the Chunin level. As for Taijutsu, hmm. It's a bit confusing. I'm confident that I'm stronger than most who took part in the Chunin exam in Naruto. But I still lost to that Hyuga. If I assume that he and Hoka are already at Chunin level in terms of Taijutsu, then it'll mean that I am probably at that level too. Worst case, I'm probably at the peak of Jinin rank in terms of Taijutsu. I really need a better Taijutsu style. Only good thing is that my physique is very good for my age. My Kenjutsu should be sorted when I learn Samurai Saber techniques. So it'll be a lot more lethal than my Taijutsu, but Kenjutsu has its own weaknesses. Holding two swords would mean that I can't make any hand signs. And techniques like Raisingan and Wind Explosion that knee hands can't be used. But I guess getting a mid-range slash might compensate for it to some degree. Anyways, I should think about it more after I learn Samurai Saber techniques. My capabilities as a sensor have grown too. My chakra field can now extend over 750 meters and I can do pretty much everything expected from a sensor, though I will need a few years to master all those tricks. My current fighting ability is majorly based around 10 ninjutsu body flicker, wind propelling, earth military movement, shadow clone, wind clone, great breakthrough, wind explosion, gale surge, rock shield, and projectile control jutsus. Apart from that, it is heavily dependent on swords, kunais, and shurikens enhanced with chakra flow. I also know Raisingan, but I haven't trained to use it in combat yet. Though I do have good ideas of using it, for the time being, I can't risk anyone knowing that I know it. So overall, if I am willing to use everything I have to its fullest potential, then I think I'll be at Chunin level, though just barely. I'll probably be able to beat the likes of Irika and Mizuki, but against someone stronger like Janki or even Michi, my only option would be to run away. Speaking of escaping, with my wind and shadow clones, along with body flicker jutsu and earth military movement jutsu and my ability to hide my chakra, escaping from an elite shunin might actually be possible. Unless it is someone specialized in tracking, it shouldn't be an issue. In fact, if anyone asked me what my best skill right now is, my answer would definitely be the art of escaping. As for what to do next, I need to go through section C of the library. I have to learn the rank C wind release jutsus. If any rank C earth release jutsu is handy, then I need to learn it too. Apart from that, I will need to learn one rank C Jin Jutsu and complete the current Fuin Jutsu scroll and move on to the next one. He concluded, hmm, that much should be enough. After that I could work on improving the Jutsus I know. There's still medical ninjutsu that I'd like to learn, but... Sigh, I have my plate full. I'll check it sometime later. Satisfied with his immediate plans, he decided to start making long-term plans. He thought... Now that I have spent almost half a decade here, I have a much better idea about this world. At the rate my physique and chakra has been growing, I'm positive that I'll reach Jianan level. And if the section A of the library has good jutsus, then becoming an elite Jianan shouldn't be an issue too. But, how do I step beyond elite Jianan and be as strong as Kagez? He thought long and hard about this. After half an hour, he concluded, Probably the easiest way I have is to learn Sage Mode. The second way is learning the eight inner gates. However, I'll have to create a very good relationship with Guy for him to teach me that. Not to mention, I'm not sure if merely hard work will be enough to learn it. The third way would be to somehow get the Impure World Resurrection Jutsu and create my own army of Rank A and Rank S Dead Ninjas. The fourth way would be to get and master Flying Thunder God Jutsu. The fifth way would be to invent my own rank A and higher jutsus. Combined with high speed, enhanced strength, and swordplay, it might be enough to reach that level. Another option could be to become a Jinchuriki. However, that will put Akatsuki on my ass, not something I think I want. Though if I'm strong enough, I could still take that risk. Getting a few strong summons would help too. 
After concluding, he sighed thinking, even the easiest way is crazy difficult to achieve. I really wonder if I'd be able to reach that level. However, just then, Fujin was struck with a crazy idea. He thought, that's right. I can explore that option. However, can that really be done? He analyzed for a few minutes and thought, I can't say for sure. But, if I am able to pull it off, I will get the means to become incredibly strong. Not to mention, I know exactly when I'll have the right opportunity to get the resources needed for it. He thought a bit more to analyze everything he could and decided, all right, I should definitely work towards achieving that. If it works, then entering Kage level won't be an issue. Even if it doesn't, the work done for it won't exactly be a waste. The idea lifted his spirits. With not much time left in the day, he decided to have his dinner and meditate before going to bed. Chapter 35, Jin and Squad The next couple of days were very hectic for Haruzen. Grouping the fresh Jinans and assigning them their sensei involved a lot of paperwork and analysis. A lot of discussion had to be done with the academy teachers as well as with the decided sensei. He first started by forming teams of three. He thought, and all 135 students became Jin in this year. Over 200 from sixth year failed and they will be added to the Jin and Reserve Forces. As for the ones that passed this year, the 94 from the sixth year don't have much hope. We had already graduated the talented people from their year earlier. Even if just a quarter of them became Chunin, then that will be enough. So I will just assign Chunins to guide them. As for the 41 who graduated early, all have good potential. They all should at least become Chunin, and around half have the potential to become a special Jounin. So I'll have to arrange 14 Jounin Sensei for them. Even though Kanoha's numbers have almost recovered, we are still weaker than before the Third Great Ninja War when it comes to high-end power. So we need to train all 41 of them with the intention of raising them to Jounin rank. Even if not everyone becomes a special Jounin's, becoming an elite Chunin will be sufficient. As for becoming Jounin, it's hard to say. I'm confident that Uchiha Mieko will become a Jounin, just like Senju Teru from the previous year. Just like him, she has the potential to become an elite Jounin. But I can't comment on others. Sigh, I hope that we get at least 10 to 12 Jounin from this batch. The QB attack killed a lot of our Jounins. He then called the academy teachers to begin forming the teams and got busy with required paperwork. After the academy teachers prepared a rough draft, however there were a few disagreements like every year. They approached the Hokage to discuss it. Hiruzen said, so which are the top teams you formed? Jenki replied immediately, according to their performance, Hataki Rei, Achiha Mieko, Suzuki Fujin, Hyuga Hoka and Hyuga Hana show the highest potential. However, Rei's performance was high due to his conditions back home. Now that his mother has been treated, we can't be sure if he'll train with the same gusto. And the two Hyuga can't be on the same team. So I propose forming a team of Achiha Mieko, Suzuki Fujin and Hyuga Hoka. However, soon another teacher, who was the class teacher to Hitaki Rei spoke, I disagree. In a mere half year, Rei has made huge progress. In fact, his talent can be considered even above Mieko. He should be placed within the top squad. I suggest making a squad consisting of Mieko, Rei, and Fujin. Another teacher commented, actually, Fujin is just a civilian orphan. His future won't be as smooth as the children from shinobi clans. Even his great breakthrough jutsu was provided to him by Jenki. So I think that a squad of Rei, Mieko, and Hoka might be more optimal. Jenki rebutted him, I disagree. Even though Fujin is just a civilian with no background, his performance has been the most consistent in my class. He deserves to be on that squad. Not to mention, he is also a sensor and has wind affinity. Being a sensor, he'll complement the Byakugan. And his wind release jutsus would assist Mieko's fire release jutsus and make them more lethal. Also, both him and Hoka kind of have a rivalry in Taijutsu. So their teamwork would be much better. He secretly thought, not to mention that they are so aloof that they barely had any other friendships. So I have no idea whether they can cooperate with others. 
the previous teacher was about to rebuke him again, but, however, he was caught by Haruzan, all right, that's enough. I have decided. The squad will be made of Mieko, Fujin, and Hoka. Ray's class teacher was visibly upset over this. He was about to speak, when Haruzan said, their Jounin sensei will be Senju Rinjiro. The teachers were confused by this revelation. One asked, but Lord Hokage, we hadn't selected him to be a sensei, had we? Haruzan shook his head and said, no. This change was due to Fujin requesting guidance on samurai saber techniques. Rinjiro had trained under a samurai. Also he is an expert in fighting against Sharingan and uses water and earth jutsus. So it'll provide Mieko an opportunity to understand how she can be countered and would help her develop more. And Hoka could learn water release jutsus from him. And his taijutsu is strong enough to handle Hoka's obsession with it. He then looked at Rei's class teacher and said, Sadly Ataki Rei doesn't practice his clan's kenjutsu, or else I'd have put him on the squad instead of Hoka. Everyone was satisfied with this explanation. They moved on to the remaining students. It took over 13 hours for them to form all the squads and decide their sensei. Once that was done, Hiruzen sent an umbu to deliver the news to all the ones selected to be a sensei. If they had any issues, they could approach him the next day. The next day, many approached Hiruzen to meet him. At noon, Rinjiro visited him. On entering, he greeted Hiruzen and said, Old man, I didn't agree to becoming sensei to snorty little brats. Besides, I have already raised one Jinin squad. Rinjiro was a bit close to him while growing up. Which is why Hiruzen didn't mind his words. Hiruzen looked at Rinjiro. He was dressed casually and hence Hiruzen could see all the on his face and arms that he had taken over his career. Hiruzen sighed and said, You've been doing missions almost non-stop since the end of the war. This assignment is for a couple of reasons. One, for you to get some rest. And secondly, as one of those Jinnins wants to learn the Samurai Saber techniques. Rinjiro looked skeptically at Hiruzen and asked, You do know that I can't teach it lightly to anyone. So, is there any reason for me to teach it to him? Hiruzen sighed and said, he ranked first in his class. And asked for this as his reward. Rinjiro asked, eh, what reward? Hiruzen replied, it's an initiative I took to encourage the students and get them to train harder. Hearing that, Rinjiro nodded. He knew the shortage of ninjas that Kanoha faced. He sighed and said, couldn't you get him to ask for anything else? Hiruzen didn't reply, but his sweat dropped thinking about what was the something else that Fujin had asked for. After discussing a bit more and getting to know a bit more about the students, Rinjiro left. He wasn't surprised by the fact that his squad was the one with highest potential. After all, he has been an elite jounin for over a decade. Later that day, Fujin visited a shop to buy new clothes at a shop that sold clothes to ninjas. He bought a completely black attire. He noticed that the cloth used for these clothes was a lot sturdier. The shopkeeper said that it is harder to cut, has some resistances to fire and lightning, and is harder to get wet or dusty. He put one on and checked himself in the mirror. His whole attire, i.e., boots, trousers, and shirt were completely black. It suited his fair skin tone, black eyes, and black spiky hair well. He thought, I guess I should get a black mask sometime, maybe then I could play hiding in shadow, haha. He looked at himself again. He wasn't bulky, but his muscles were properly toned. There was barely any trace of any fat on his body. He was around four feet, nine inches tall. He thought, all right, it fits properly, and also looks good. He bought three sets of the attire. He also bought a pair of gloves with metal plates on the backhand. He also inscribed a hard seal in the interior of the glove. While it didn't do much, Fujin felt that there was no harm in even slightly increasing its defenses. He did wish that he could take the metal plates out, inscribe them with hard seal instead of the whole glove and then put it back. But he knew that he wouldn't be able to put the metal plate back in properly. Next day, at 7.30 a.m., the graduated students reported to the academy. 
the classroom used wasn't the regular classroom that Fujin went to. Forty-two students were present here. The teachers took attendance and then gave a scroll to each of the students. Jenki called his students one by one and gave it to them. The class teachers of other students did the same. When Fujin's turn came, he noticed that Jenki was incredibly happy. He wasn't sure why, but since he didn't particularly care, he went back. Jenki was happy because Haruzen had allowed him to take the Jounin exam. After distributing it to everyone, a teacher announced, the storage scroll provided to you has a first aid kit, 24 shurikens, 6 kanais, 12 senban needles, 1 ninja rope and 100 meters long ninja wire. He then smiled and said, this is the final gift from the academy to you. Congratulations on graduating. We will now announce your Jinin squads. When Fujin's squad was announced, he sighed and thought, an aloof guy who doesn't care about anything apart from taijutsu, and a stuck-up brat who probably thinks herself to be as talented as Madara. Fuck our teamwork. Sigh, makes me wonder if I should have graduated last year. Teru was the only one matured enough. He analyzed a bit more, anyways, it ain't exactly bad. Taijutsu spars with Hoka have always been very helpful. And Mieko should give me a bit of practice against the Sharingan. Granted that she ain't nowhere near Abito or Madara, but neither am I. He then looked at Mieko and thought, also, since she'll die after around two more years, it'll mean that I won't be restricted in this squad for very long. Now then, I wonder who my Jounin sensei will be. I really hope that it ain't Kakashi. Also, what of my rewards? Jenki didn't talk about it, and Hiruzen didn't call me to meet him. After the Jinin squads were announced, the teacher said that the Jounin sensei would come and pick them up from the class, and then they all left. While they were leaving, Fujin had a thought and sighed, Naruto and his gang should start the academy next year. And I won't be here. What's with me meeting so few canon characters? Soon Jounin started entering the class and called out for their teams. A couple of minutes after the academy teachers left, a tall muscular guy entered and announced, Team 3, come with me. Fujin, Hoka, and Mieko followed him. Rinjiro moved to the terrace of the academy. A few seconds later, all the three Jinins arrived. When he reached there, Fujin observed his new sensei. He was around six feet six inches tall, very muscular, looked middle-aged and had three scars on his face, one going right across his right eye, but I was fine. His hair was black and very long, a bit similar to Madara's. He held two swords on his waist. From the symbol on his clothes, Fujin understood that he was from the Senju clan. Actually, there was another thing that allowed Fujin to know that he was from the Senju clan. He had massive amounts of chakra. For obvious reasons, Fujin never tried to sense Haruzen's chakra, so this was the highest chakra level he had measured so far. It was around seven times that of Jenki. When Fujin tried to measure his chakra, Rinjiro noticed. He looked at Fujin and stared at him. Fujin merely smiled. Rinjiro thought, so this is the kid who wants to learn the samurai saber techniques and the kid who asked for swords made of chakra metal. Not bad, he seems to be a good enough sensor. And even after I stared at him, he merely smiled back. I wonder if that makes him foolish, brave, or just shameless. He then looked at his remaining two jinnins and thought, the Hyuga has the same stoic face as their whole clan and just looking at the Uchiha's face showed how much pride filled in her. He sighed thinking, this is gonna take a while. Chapter 36, Senju Renjiro Renjiro said, I am Senju Renjiro. I'll be your Jounin Sensei. Let's start by getting to know each other. So just tell me something about yourself. Mieko asked, what should we tell? On the other hand, Fujin remembered the tell me about yourself question that used to be asked in interviews in his previous life. Rinjiro replied, T. Tell me about your likes, dislikes, dreams, hobbies and similar stuff. Fujin then replied, I am Suzuki Fujin. I like swords and cool jutsus. My hobby is to train and read shinobi history and wars. I dislike the carnage that wars cause. 
and my dream is to become a strong ninja in the future so that I could bring peace to the world. Rinjiro stared at Fujin and was very impressed with his dream. Of course, if he knew Fujin's real thoughts, he might have vomited blood. After looking at an impressed Rinjiro, Fujin thought, yup, that's exactly what Kanoha higher-ups would like to hear. I couldn't care less about world peace, but saying that is what will get me in the good books of these guys and could provide me with the opportunity to learn flying thunder god jutsu and also make Haruzen protect me in case Danzo tries to recruit me. Either way, it's not like I can do anything about world peace right now. So why not just say it, he he. Rinjiro then looked at Mieko. She said, I am Uchiha Mieko. I like cats. I dislike anyone treating me like a small child. My hobby is practicing ninjutsu and playing with cats. And my dream is to be the strongest Uchiha ever. Fujin looked at her and chuckled internally thinking, well you've got two years to surpass Madara. Rip. Rinjiro nodded and looked towards Hoka. He said, I am Hyuga Hoka. I like taijutsu. I dislike studying. My hobby is to spar with others and my dream is to be the strongest taijutsu user. Rinjiro nodded and said, Well congratulations on graduating early. But that doesn't mean that you are Kanoha Shinobi. You guys will be on probation for three months. And after that I'll decide whether you're ready to be a ninja or not. This announcement had mixed reactions from the three jinnins. Fujin wondered, eh? No test? After thinking for a bit, he realized, ah, they are probably still recovering. That's why there's a probation period instead of a test to check whether we are ready or not. However, the other two kids didn't take the announcement lightly. Mieko impatiently asked, but why? Didn't we pass the graduation exam? Hoka took her point further and said, Yeah, I even defeated everyone in the Taijutsu tournament. Rinjiro replied, Graduation exam is the bare minimum you require to be a ninja. Your attitude, temperament, courage, values matter more. And I'll be the one to judge that. Mieko and Hoka were still unsatisfied and wanted to complain more, but Rinjiro didn't give them a chance and announced, We'll meet tomorrow in training ground 17 at 6 a.m. I'll check your skills tomorrow. Be on time, I hate tardiness. After saying that, he flickered away. When he left, Fujin thought, he didn't say a single thing about himself other than his name. Heck, I think even Kakashi talked more with his team. After he left, Mieko huffed and started to leave without saying anything. Hoka, on the other hand, said goodbye to Fujin and was planning to leave too. Fujin sighed and said, Oi, wait a minute. This got both their attention. Hoka looked at him without saying anything, whereas Mieko annoyingly asked, What? Fujin replied, Tomorrow we'll most probably have to fight against Sensei as a team. So we need to understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. And we also need to plan how to fight together. Hoka agreed with that and nodded. However Mieko replied smugly, You two don't need to worry about it. I'll beat him by myself tomorrow. Fujin gave her a deadpan look, which irritated her and she asked, What? You don't think that I can beat him? Fujin resisted his urge to facepalm and replied, Do tell how you plan on defeating a Jounin by yourself. She smirked and replied, I'll catch him off guard and use fire dragon jutsu on him. Fujin said, He is from the Senju clan, who specialize in earth and water release jutsus. Assuming that you somehow catch him off guard, he'll still be able to defend. This reply caught her by surprise. She thought a bit and then smirked again and replied, I know Sharingan Jinjutsu. As soon as he looks in my eyes, I'll put him under a Jinjutsu. Fujin mentally scoffed, as if he will fall for something so basic. But I'm tired of dealing with her. He said, All right, we'll call that plan A and we'll start with it. Now let's discuss plan B. Mieko replied, Why do we need plan B? Fujin replied, Well he knows that you have the Sharingan. So what if he never looks into your eyes because he knows that your eyes are so awesome? It'll be stupid if we just stand there doing nothing right? Worse, he may think that you are just a little kid. This finally got her attention. 
seeing that Fujin was relieved and thought, finally. So I have to either praise her or say someone will think that she's a little brat or both to get her on board. She then asked, so what should we do if plan A fails? Fujin replied, first, let's talk about what each one of us can do. I'll start. I'm a sensor and can sense in a 500 meters radius around me. I'm good at taijutsu and with swords. And I know wind release jutsus, the ones you saw on the exam. I can also perform shadow clone and body flicker jutsu. What about you guys? Mieko then replied, I am good at taijutsu too and can use the Uchiha taijutsu style. My Sharingan allows me to see chakra and use Jinjutsu. I am very good with shurikens. Other than the basic jutsus, I can perform a few fire release jutsus. You saw them in the exam. And I can do body flicker too. In fact, I was taught it by the very best. Fujin was surprised at that information and thought, did Shur Sui teach her this jutsu? Hoka then replied, I am a master at the gentle fist style. I can close enemies' chakra points and my eyes can see up to 800 meters away. Apart from it, I know fish spit jutsu and rock shield jutsu. Fuji nodded and advised, if you can, then learn body flicker jutsu. If all three of us can use it, then it'll be very helpful and we could use a lot of tactics. Hoka groaned a bit and said, but I don't want to learn more ninjutsu. Fujin replied, well it's just a movement jutsu. You can move at incredibly fast speed. It'll help make your taijutsu way more lethal. Just imagine your normal jab, then imagine you appearing out of nowhere and performing that jab on the enemy. As Fujin expected, that got Hoka interested and he agreed to learn it. Fujin then talked a bit about tactics that they could use. He said, we need to decide who'll fight Sensei up close and who'll perform support attacks from a distance. I. However, Hoka cut him off and said, I want to fight up close. Fujin was about to nod when Mieko said, No, I want to fight up close. Hoka rebuked her and then they started arguing. Fujin sighed, thinking, Kids. He then stopped them both and said, Among all of us, Hoka was ranked one in the Taijutsu tournament so he'll engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Sensei. Mieko was about to talk, but Fujin continued, but he can't handle Sensei all by himself. So you and I will assist him from time to time. Also both of us have mid-range jutsus, so it'll be a waste if we can't use them. Hoka, wanting to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat quickly supported Fujin and Mieko had to begrudgingly agree. Fujin thought, I planned on discussing a lot more, like the fire-wind combination, and even wanted to ask Hoka to learn more advanced water-release jutsus as they work well with wind-release as well. Sadly, I was too impatient. It'll take a lot of time before they're ready to listen to those tactics. Kinda makes me wish that Renjiro beats both of them up tomorrow to make them a little less stuck up. But I'm afraid that if he does that, then he'll beat me up too. And without using Earth Military Movement Jutsu and Wind Propelling Jutsu, it'll be hard to dodge for long. Sigh, I wonder when I can use these Jutsus publicly. It's very uncomfortable to fake hand signs, limit their power and not use half of the Jutsus I know. Sadly, it's necessary. I hope I reach the Jounin level soon, as after that, there won't be much worries about Danzo trying to recruit me. It'll be too late to attempt to brainwash me at that stage. Fujin had also planned to ask them to grab a bite together at Ichiraku. However, he had enough for today, soon they said goodbyes and left. Fujin went over to the library. Now that he had become a Jinin, he was allowed to access the Section C of the library. However, that's not what he was here for. Becoming a ninja allowed him to see a certain book. He went to the librarian and showed his card and asked, Can I see the bingo book? She was surprised by a ten-year-old kid asking her that question. However, since he was a ninja, she nodded and asked, Would you like to see the smaller one or the bigger one? Now it was Fujin's turn to be surprised. He asked, What's the difference? She replied, Well, the smaller one only has names, bounty, affiliation, and some basic information, whereas the bigger one has more in-depth information. Hearing that, Fujin asked her to show the bigger one. 
she nodded and brought it to Fujin. When Fujin saw the book, he was shocked. His first thought was, it's freaking huge. He opened to see it. Apparently, every page covered the data of only one ninja. And the book had 2,197 pages. After analyzing, Fujin thought, well it makes sense, considering that there are over 100k ninjas in this world. He then mentally thanked the ones who made such a good index. Everything was arranged properly according to the village and alphabetically as per their names. There were also lists that arranged the ninjas as per their rank in their village and in the descending order of their bounties. After searching for a couple of minutes, he found the name he was looking for, Senjurinjiro. He began turning the page, but while doing that, a thought occurred to him, it's funny that I thought my biggest advantage in this world would be information. But considering how vast this world is, I don't think I have the information on even 1% of the ninjas. Heck, apart from Tsunade, I didn't even know any living Senju. Anyways, this data is very detailed. I am surprised that we can read it for free, but it makes sense I suppose. This data is compiled by the ones who make the bingo book, and since it's already out in the open, why not just let all your ninjas read it for free? He opened the page and began reading, and he was very surprised by what he read. His bounty was 45 million Rio. It was even higher than Asuma's during Shippuden and was put on him by Kirigakure. He thought, not bad at all. I guess Haruzen did appoint someone very competent as my sensei. He read further. The information that Fujin obtained was, Senjurinjiro, rank A, 39 years old. He became Jinin at 8, Chunin at 10, Jounin at 16 and Elite Jounin at 28. He specializes in water and earth release ninjutsu, but can use jutsu of other elements too. He's an excellent swordsman who was trained in the way of swords by a samurai. He fought in both the second and third great ninja wars. In the third war, he had served as Orochimaru's deputy on the Kiri front. Later on, when Orochimaru had to join a different battlefield, he became Kanoha's commander on the Kiri front. Due to his skill with the sword, his proficiency in water release jutsus and his summon, a sloth, he was very effective against Kiri ninjas. He killed 13 Kiri Jounins and over 50 Kiri Chunins over the course of the war. His biggest accomplishment was killing one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist in that war. Though his army was defeated by a surprise offensive launched by Kiri, he managed to retreat with the majority of his army and kept Kiri at bay until Kanoha's yellow flash reinforced him and pushed Kiri back to the seas. After reading that, Fujin thought damn fuck. He's strong. Not Sanin level, but very close. Anyways, it says that he was trained by a samurai, so I guess he's guide Haruzen arranged for me. I do wonder what that summon is though. It's the first time I'm hearing of a sloth. Ain't that a deadly sin? But that sounds a bit too overpowered and not something from this world. Well whatever, I'll look into it later. He then looked into the data of the ninja he knew from Naruto. He sighed in relief, confirming that it was very similar to what he knew. He also got a better understanding of the shinobi world. He thought, Kanoha is way stronger than what was shown in Naruto. Fathers of Shikaku, Inoichi and Shibi are still alive and leading their clans. Each of them is an elite jounin and are very close to rank S. Though I guess that their strengths will decrease over time due to their age. In all, Kanoha has just three rank S ninjas now. But Jiraiya is barely in the village, and Tsunade can barely even fight. However, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, the bingo book has no mention of Danzo. Also, it's quite possible that Fugaku is hiding his Manjikyu. Same with her sway. I'm not sure how many gates guy can open, but he might be able to forcibly rise to compete with rank S ninja if needed. Also, it's quite surprising to see Koharu and Hamira are rank and ninjas. I don't recall them ever fighting in Naruto. In all there are 22 elite jounins from Kanoha mentioned in the bingo book. And it's quite possible that there are a few more who haven't been mentioned here, like Danzo and others from Root. There are also a few more rank in ninjas who haven't yet become an elite jounin like Kakashi and Guy. He then sighed, 
I didn't think there would be so many elite Jounins in Konoha. And despite this Haruzen chose to sacrifice his Ashi. Makes me wonder how bad Konoha's losses were in the lower ranks due to the war. As for the other villages, Kumo and IWA are pretty strong too, though not as strong as Konoha at least when it comes to Kage level and elite Jounin level combat strength. Kiri is actually quite impressive too, or would have been if so many of their top-ranked ninjas weren't labeled as Rouge Ninjas. I guess Abito has pretty much wrecked Kiri. Suna, on the other hand, is doing really bad. Their Kage is easily the weakest out of all five Kages. Though they have two more rank S ninjas, both are retired and very old. And their number of rank N ninjas is pitifully low. He closed the book and thought, well that should be enough information for now. I'll get more as and when there's a need to. He handed the bingo book back to the librarian and went back home. Chapter 37, A Spar with Sensei Next day, at 6 a.m., all the members of Team 3 gathered in the training ground 17. It was a small open area in the center of a mini forest. Renjiro was the last one to arrive. On seeing his Jin and squad already there, he wished them good morning and said, as I said yesterday, before I begin training you three, I'll like to see what you can do. So we'll have a spar, you three versus me. He paused for a few seconds and said, we begin now. As soon as he said that, he jumped forward with the intention to punch. It caught all the three Jinnins off guard. Mieko jumped backwards hurriedly and Hoka jumped to his left. Fujin, on the other hand, just flickered away. Rinjiro's punch landed on the ground where the three Jinnins were standing initially and the ground cracked, causing a lot of dust to rise, which hit him. Rinjiro thought, not bad. I only intended to punch the ground in front of them, but I didn't think that all three would react so quickly. Especially Fujin, did he use body flicker jutsu without any hand signs? As soon as he used body flicker, Fujin thought, damn. He attacked so suddenly that I flickered away by reflex. He then saw the dust rising up and covering Renjiro and so did Hoka and Mieko. Fujin immediately started sensing him, Mieko activated her Sharingan and Hoka activated his Byakugan. On sensing Renjiro, Fujin thought, well now that I've shown it, I can't hide it anymore. So might as well spam it. Still I didn't think hiding my power would be so difficult. I really need to be more careful, in case he pulls a few more stunts like that. I hope I can protect the rest of my secrets for at least another year or two. While Fuji was thinking that, both Hoka and Mieko ran towards Renjiro to engage him in combat. Renjiro just stood there, waiting for them to begin their assault. Hoko was the first one to reach him, however, Mieko launched a few shurikens on Renjiro. Renjiro dodged them and then engaged Hoka in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was able to counter his gentle fist style very easily. When Mieko joined in, he suppressed both of them with rather ease. However, he soon frowned. He tried to sense, but he couldn't sense Fujin at all. Taking the opportunity provided by his teammates, Fujin had disappeared from his sight and hit his chakra. Though Renjiro couldn't sense Fujin, Fujin closely monitored their fight, waiting for an opportunity to butt in. He soon found one when Renjiro punched Hoka. Fujin threw a shuriken with all his power. However, Renjiro smirked and thought, a fake opening. Always works against brats. He moved a step back to avoid the shuriken, however, the shuriken curved towards him. That surprised Renjiro. He was about to dodge again, when he felt no, something is weird. So instead of dodging, he just caught the shuriken right out of its trajectory. However, as soon as he caught it, he sensed two small chakra signatures behind him. He turned to see two wind spheres heading at him. He took a step to dodge, however, at the same time Mieko launched fireball jutsu in the direction he was planning to dodge. Seeing that, he adjusted his direction and dodged both the jutsus and created distance from his students. Seeing that, Hoka rushed forward to engage him in close combat. While Hoka was rushing towards him, Renjiro thought, not bad at all. This doesn't seem planned, and their teamwork still needs a lot of work, but they are able to take advantage of the opportunities created by each other. 
Not to mention that I felt wind on that shuriken, which means that Fujin used projectile control jutsu on the shuriken. And instead of pressing forward on a hopeless assault, he took the advantage of that fireball to disappear again. He engaged in another round of combat with Hoka and Mieko. Fujin, who was secretly observing the combat, thought an elite jounin indeed. That opening was a bait to understand my location. Not to mention, he grabbed the shuriken out of thin air. Though, I wonder what he'd have done if I had infused that shuriken with wind chakra. Anyways, I wonder if I can fool him using a shadow clone. Fujin kept hiding and made a shadow clone. After a minute, it looked like both Hoka and Mieko were about to lose. So the clone interrupted Renjiro by launching two wind explosion jutsu on him. He followed it up with shurikens. Renjiro dodged everything and moved towards Fujin to engage him in close combat. However, the clone flickered and moved behind Mieko and Hoka. Seeing Renjiro approaching, Hoka began moving forward to engage him. However, Fujin sensed a huge chakra built up by Mieko and shouted, Hoka, move aside. That shout alarmed Hoka and he turned to see that Mieko was weaving hand signs and had gathered almost all of her chakra. He quickly got out of her way and created distance by running to his left. Mieko, actually, was very frustrated by this fight. Poor girl had been trying to use Sharingan Jinjutsu on her sensei since the start of the fight, but not once did he look in her eyes. Due to her frustration, she launched Fire Dragon Jutsu and nearly poured all her chakra in it. Fujin's clone sensed that and used Great Breakthrough Jutsu. He timed his jutsu just after Mieko launched hers and tried to limit the range of his jutsu to just cover her fire dragon. The result increased the power and the size of the dragon. Not wanting to take that jutsu head on, Renjiro flickered away. The power of this jutsu really surprised Hoka and Mieko. Especially Mieko, who was awestruck by it. Fujin was still keeping an eye on Renjiro. He noticed that Renjiro had flickered without using any hand signs and had flickered just enough distance to barely dodge the jutsus. He thought, sigh, that's the first time he has used a ninjutsu. Anyways, it seems like this fight is pretty much over. Hoka has taken quite a beating. So has Mieko and she is out of chakra too. Only I am still fine. Sadly there's not much me and my clone can do. Not having a good long-range jutsu sucks though. Despite being perfectly hidden, there's not much I can do. Right then, Fujin suddenly used body flicker jutsu purely with his instincts. However, right when his feet left the ground, a hand came out of the ground and caught his right leg. This caused him to fall forward at a very rapid speed. Luckily for him, he managed to put his arms forward, ensuring that his face didn't get badly damaged. Soon, another hand clutched the back of his neck and pinned him to the ground. He realized that it was Renjiro's chakra signature and thought, what the fuck? I didn't sense him at all. He soon got his clone's memories. His clone had been dispelled, and Hoka and Mieko had been defeated. He thought, a clone? But when? On thinking a bit he realized, was it when the dust provided him cover? But I had almost immediately begun sensing him, was that fraction of a second enough for him to make a clone and hide it or his main body? And why didn't I sense him? I should be able to sense anyone sensing me. Heck, even if someone merely looks at me, I sense that too. Rinjiro thought, he was able to see an attack coming? No, that doesn't seem right, my chakra control was perfect. It seems like he decided to move purely on his instincts. He then took his hand off Fujin's neck and said, That's enough. Follow me. Fujin followed Renjiro to where Hoka and Mieko were. Both were lying on the ground. He thought, Poor kids. They really got beat up. Both their faces are swollen. And there are bruises even on their limbs. Renjiro, who had beaten up these two and dispelled Fujin's clone, dispelled himself. Fujin then looked at Renjiro and thought, did he beat these two up to curb their arrogance? Well whatever, I hope they think more now. After getting his clone's memories, Renjiro looked at Fujin in a new light and thought, very good. He was successfully able to hide from my clone not only once, 
but twice. If not for the fact that his clone had only half his chakra, my clone might not have been able to identify him as a clone. He has a very good mindset. Unfortunately, he doesn't have any good long-range jutsu. Which meant that him hiding such a long distance away was disadvantageous to him as well. Also, he gave up a bit too quickly after I caught him. Something I should correct, though I suppose it did save him from receiving a beating. A shame really, though he doesn't seem as arrogant as the other two, some beating would have been good for his development. Luckily for Fujin, he was totally oblivious of Renjiro's plans and thoughts. He then looked at Hoka and Mieko and thought, but that still makes him much better than these two. Sai, which Jinan engages a Jounin in a head-on confrontation. But other than that, their skills are very good. Hoka is very good at Taijutsu and he is very fast too. And Mieko's fire release jutsus were quite strong for a Jinan. I'm still surprised by the combo attack of Fujin and her. While Renjiro was engaged in those thoughts, both Hoka and Mieko got up. Though they still were groaning and looking at their sensei with a lot of complaints. Mieko also looked begrudgingly at Fujin, who seemed to be in a much better condition. Renjiro of course ignored those looks and said, You have ten minutes. Sit here quietly and think about our little spar. I'll ask you some questions after ten minutes and I expect you to answer them. Fujin sat down and began to analyze the fight. Hoka and Mieko did that too, however they were still looking at Renjiro angrily. All the three Jinnins became analyzing and had the same first thought, an elite Jounin is incredibly strong. While Fujin had to take some effort to dig up information on Renjiro, Hoka and Mieko got it very easily from their parents. Renjiro's exploits were common knowledge among the shinobi who fought in the Third Great Ninja War. That had made them a bit more respectful of Renjiro. After the ten minutes were up, Renjiro asked, The first question for you, when did I make a clone? Fujin raised his hand and replied, Most probably when you punched the ground and raised a dust cover. Mieko, who was thinking hard, replied, Yes, I don't think there was any other opportunity for you to make a clone. Fujin could sense anger in her voice due to being beaten up. Hoko was still confused though. He asked, But Sensei, why couldn't my Byakugan see you? Rinjiro replied, There are ways to hide even from Byakugan. Take this as a lesson that just because you don't see it, doesn't mean you can relax and put your guard down. Hoka nodded with a conflicting expression. Knowing that the pride of his clan wasn't foolproof was a big blow to him. Fujin then asked, But Sensei, how are you able to approach me from underground and still hide your chakra? Also, how did you keep a track of where I am without letting me sense you back? Rinjiro replied, There are ways to hide from a sensor. Also tricks to sneak up on a sensor. Just because you don't sense anyone, doesn't mean that you should completely drop your guard. Mieko was the next one to ask a question. She asked, Sensei, how did you fight me without even once looking in my eyes? Rinjiro smirked and said, The Uchiha clan has been using Sharingans for hundreds of years. There are many ways to combat your Sharingan too. The one I showed you was just the most basic one. The answers made all the three Jinnins fall in a deep thought. Fujin especially was very worried. He thought, does that mean if someone was spying on me, I wouldn't even have an idea? This thought worried him. However he calmed down on thinking, well he is an elite Jounin, capable of leading a whole battlefront. Surely Kanoha won't send an elite Jounin to spy on a nobody. I should still be safe. Rinjiro cut the thoughts of his students and said, now all three of you will think and tell me why you lost and tell me how you could have performed better. Hoka, you first, followed by Mieko and then Fujin. Hoka thought for a bit and said, You countered my gentle fist and I couldn't land even one hit on you. Also my Byakugan couldn't see your clone. And you were also a lot faster than me or anyone else. Rinjiro then looked at Mieko who replied, Your Taijutsu is much stronger than ours. And you were always able to dodge all of our attacks, no matter how thorough we were. Also you knew exactly how to counter each one of us. He then looked over to Fujin who said, Our teamwork wasn't proper. We barely ever even spoke to each other. 
I saw Hoka and Nieko tag team against you, but they weren't in sync with each other. And I, despite being hidden, couldn't help much from such a long distance. And we didn't have any plans to defeat you. Not to mention. Fujin paused for a few moments and continued, You were just too strong for us to handle. Rinjiro nodded and thought, Decent. Hoka's tactical thinking would have to be developed more, but the other two are much better. He then said, All right, this is it for today. You can go home and heal yourself. We will meet here tomorrow at 5 a.m. You have one assignment for tomorrow. Write down your daily routine and bring it tomorrow. And Fujin, stay here. Hoka, Mieko, you two can leave. On getting the permission to leave, they said goodbyes and left. Fujin did have to suppress his urge to laugh as they both were walking very weirdly. Though that urge went away very quickly as he had a horrifying thought, wait. I was the only one not beaten up. So he didn't make me wait for. Her. He quickly got rid of that thought, no way. He's a reputed commander from a great ninja war, he won't be so petty. He screamed internally, where the fuck are those human rights activists? Also, why the fuck didn't that old monkey make laws to prevent child abuse despite warming the Hokage seat for decades? Fujin kept seeing his teammates walk away in a weird manner, while desperately hoping that his thoughts won't ever come true. Chapter 38, Light Morning Workout In training ground 17, Fujin and his new sensei were alone. Rinjiro asked, Why didn't you use swords during the spar? Fujin replied, Cause I don't have any. I checked the prices, and even the cheapest one costs 12k Rio. Sadly I can't afford them. The answer was within Rinjiro's expectations. He nodded and said, I'll be teaching you how to wield swords from now onwards. Don't worry about the swords, I have a few you can use. We will first test your skills and also the size of the sword that'll suit you. After that, the third Hokage will order two custom-made samurai swords for you. Fujin nodded and thanked him. Rinjiro took out a scroll, laid it on the ground and rolled it open. Fujin noticed that it was a storage scroll. And looking at the number of storage seals, he probably was the one who made it. Rinjiro made a hand sign and twelve swords appeared on the scroll. Fujin picked up two, which were very similar in size to the ones he already used and said, Sensei, the ones I used in the academy were of this size. Rinjiro replied, All right, we'll start with these then. Let's have another spar. I want to see how good your sword skills are. Fujin and Rinjiro then sparred to compare their sword skills. While sparring, both had different thoughts. Fujin was happy that his sensei wasn't the same monster he was earlier. Rinjiro on the other hand had mixed feelings about Fujin's swordsmanship. He thought, this kid's basics are extremely solid. Especially considering that he has only trained with swords for less than a year. However, apart from the basics, he has nothing at all. There's no style to his swordplay. It's just a simple straightforward attack and defense. While he has been attacking and defending well, it's only due to him leveraging his speed and strength. If I were to increase my speed and strength to match his, he most probably won't even last five seconds. The spar continued for a few minutes more before Rinjiro halted it. He concluded, he's like an unpolished jade. Not having any other styles means that he doesn't have any bad habits. While in the long run it may be disadvantageous, but for practicing just one style, this would be very convenient. Of course, since he hasn't practiced any styles yet, I can't say how fast or slow he will be at learning the samurai saber techniques. Rinjiro then suddenly increased his speed to match Fujin's and skillfully hid both his swords consecutively to create an opening, and then placed the tip of his sword very close to Fujin's throat. He said, All right, that's enough. I'll teach you some new forms. He then displayed a few forms for Fujin and asked him to copy and practice them. The training continued for three hours, after which Rinjiro dismissed Fujin. After dismissing Fujin, Rinjiro reported to Hiruzen. On entering his office, Hiruzen asked him, So how were the kids? Rinjiro replied, Very promising old man. They are much stronger than an average jinin. 
Hoka is already at Chunin level in terms of Taijutsu. And Mieko is the same in terms of Ninjutsu, though her chakra reserves need to increase. Fujin's Ninjutsu isn't bad either. Though his Ninjutsu was weaker than Mieko's, he was more skillful with them. And his chakra reserves are higher than hers. The most surprising thing is that his tactical thinking is already on par with someone who has gone through many missions. And, even though they didn't actively strategize, they were smart enough to take advantage of the openings provided by their other teammates. Even if I had conducted a test, they would have easily passed it to become Jinnins. Hiruza nodded and thought, just as their results indicate. Though Fujin's tactical prowess is surprising to hear. I guess that is why he was able to easily rank first in the written exams. He then asked, what about Fujin's sword skills? Rinjiro shook his head and said, I can't say yet. His basics are good, but whether he can learn further or not depends on his talent and the effort he puts in. Hiruzen replied, All right. I'll lead it to you and dismissed him. Next day, Fujin got up at 4.20 a.m. and thought, I thought waking up at 5 a.m. was too early. Now this guy asks us to gather there at 5 a.m. Not to mention, that training ground is over 15 fucking kilometers from my home. Sigh, whatever. I guess I'll get a good morning run at least. Not sure if his training will be as intense as my morning workouts, so I could increase the pressure applied by the seal on my body during that run. Fujin reached the training grounds just before 5 a.m. and saw that both his teammates were already there. He wished them good morning and waited for Rinjiro. Rinjiro appeared right at 5 a.m. and said, Morning. The kids wished him back. Rinjiro began by saying, From today onwards, we'll meet here daily at 5 a.m. Our mornings will begin with rigorous physical training. He then looked at Mieko and said, Fujin's and Hoka's physiques are very well developed. However, Mieko, you don't have any seals on your body to help build your physical strength, do you? Mieko shook her head. Rinjiro said, Today, you'll ask your parents to get that seal for you. And get the seal before this week ends. Mieko nodded and said, Yes, Sensei. He then looked at Hoka and Fujin and asked, How much maximum pressure can your seals apply? Hoka replied, Maximum, it can apply 125 kilograms weight. Fujin replied, Mine can apply a maximum weight of 250 kilograms. Hoka looked at Fujin with a bit of jealousy as his seal was better. Rinjiro then asked, All right, and how much percent of the pressure do you two use? Hoka replied, 30% and Fujin replied, 13.5% On hearing Hoka's reply, Fujin sighed internally, No wonder he can keep up so easily with me. Whereas Hoka's mood cheered up as he thought, Even though his seal is better, I apply more pressure on my body. Mieko, on the other hand, was upset and annoyed thinking, no wonder these two move so fast. Why didn't anyone ever tell me about this method to get stronger? Rinjiro thought, really impressive. It seems that I can make their physical training more rigorous than I had planned. He said, all right, let's begin with our training. And Team 3 began their first training session under their new sensei. Everyone was very enthusiastic. Getting personally trained by an elite Jounin would be really helpful. No matter what their dreams were, becoming an elite Jounin would be the minimum requirement for them to reach. Only after that could they think of making their dreams a reality. In the first 30 minutes, all three were very energetic. In the next 30 minutes, their enthusiasm died down. After one hour, Mieko could barely keep up with the training. Even an aloof Hoka could clearly notice that she was trying her hardest to hold back her tears. Hoka could still keep up and was the only one looking forward to the next three hours. Fujin could keep up too, but he had a very bad feeling. After two hours, Fujin was badly regretting the decision he made in the morning. He thought, which fucking demon put the thoughts of turning up the pressure of the seal to fucking 25% for the morning run to this training ground? When the training finally ended at 9 a.m., Hoka and Fujin dropped to the ground. They could barely even move any muscle. Mieko had already dropped unconscious some time earlier. Neither Fujin nor Hoka were aware when exactly, but Rinjiro picked her up and laid her under a tree. 
Fujin would have screamed for child protection laws, but he was too tired to even think about it. He noticed that Mieko got up a few minutes after the training ended, and that felt very fishy for some reason. Looking at that sight, Rinjiro chuckled internally. He said, no need to overreact so much. It was merely a light morning workout. Now get up and move under that tree. They both barely got up and wobbled somehow to those trees and sat there, while resting their backs on the trunk of the tree. Rinjiro then tossed a couple of ration bars and a water bottle to all three and said, You can rest here for the next hour. Eat those ration bars and hydrate yourself, preferably after half an hour. I'll meet you here again at ten. He then flickered away. As soon as he left, both Fujin and Hoka slid down and began sleeping. This pissed Mieko who said loudly, Wake up you two, we can't sleep all day. That woke the two of them up. Hoka dismissively replied, We didn't sleep for over an hour during the workout. Fujin continued in the same tone, Yeah, wake us up after thirty to forty minutes. And they both went back to sleep. Mieko was very annoyed and made some noise, but both were too tired to respond to her antics and just ignored her. After around half an hour, Mieko woke them both up. As soon as they woke up, they ate the ration bars and emptied the water bottle. The short nap brought their energy levels up, but didn't do much to stop the muscle ache all over the body. Fujin sighed and said, I think every single muscle in my body is aching. Hoka replied, Yeah, same here. I don't think it's gonna stop anytime soon. Fujin replied, especially if this has to be done every morning. That sentence scared both Hoka and Mieko. Mieko asked, No way, right? Unlike you two, I didn't even last the whole workout. How will we do this daily? Fujin chuckled internally and thought, Poor girl. She is totally freaked out. Ha ha ha. Still, this sensei. I was upset at not getting a chance to meet Guy and hence not having any opportunity to learn from him. But with this, I don't think it was such a bad thing to not meet him. As insane as this workout was, Guy, probably, still beats this by a long distance. Otherwise there's no way he'd learn the eight inner gates all to the eighth gate. Hoka tried to console Mieko and said, Don't worry. I have been doing such physical workouts for years. After some time, our body will get used to it. And the results will be worth it. That calmed Mieko down a bit. However, Fujin thought, now that I think about it, this is a good opportunity to curb her Uchiha pride a bit. He countered Hoka by saying, I don't think that will be the case with Renjiro sensei If we get anywhere near being comfortable with this workout, he'll probably change it. Even if that isn't the case, he could just make us increase the pressure on our body. That again freaked Mieko out. She quickly asked, But can't we fool Sensei by lying about how much pressure we have applied? Hoka commented, Yeah, we can. There's no way for others to check it. However, Fujin countered again, even if he can't check it, he'll understand by how tired we are after the workout. So that we could fake the pressure, I don't think we can fool an elite Jounin about how difficult the workout is. On being countered again, Hoka wondered what Fujin was up to. He thought, I'm going out of my way to make her feel better, but Fujin is making her more and more scared. He thought for a bit, but couldn't think of anything and let it go, whatever, I don't care. Still though, for a physical workout to push me to this extent. I need to get stronger. Mieko tried to think of more ways out, but couldn't think of anything. She had one thought which she was planning to ask her teammates, can we ask Sensei to decrease the difficulty of the workout? However, her pride didn't allow her to say that. She decided, fine. I'll just work harder and improve my physique. I'm the only one to graduate from my class, which shows how much better I am as compared to others. There's no way a single routine will stop me from achieving my dream. Fujin didn't see the look of determination on both his teammates. His body was still very sore to pay much attention to them. However, another person did. Chapter 39, Rank C Wind Release Jutsus Rinjiro was hiding nearby and watching his young students. Looking at the determined looks of Hoka and Mieko, 
he smiled thinking excellent. With this determination, their power will increase very rapidly. Sadly, Fujin isn't looking that determined. He thought a bit and concluded, well just because there's no determined look on him doesn't mean that he's discouraged. Though he did speak about future challenges, it didn't seem like he wanted to back away. Anyways, I should get a better idea after a few more sessions. If he isn't determined, then I have a few ways to make him determined. If Fujin knew his sensei's plans for him, he would have shuddered. When just five minutes of break was left, Fujin and Hoka got up and began stretching. Mieko copied them. They weren't sure which crazy session awaited them and decided to loosen up their muscles. Rinjiro soon appeared in front of them and said, Before we begin with the next session, let's talk about your routines first. Rinjiro then discussed everyone's routine one by one. He planned to train them from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. and from 10 a.m. to noon. For Fujin, there'd be additional three hours of training from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. He modified everyone's routines to fit his own training plans. He also recommended everyone their diets. And that involved a lot of ration bars. Rinjiro recommended then to eat one at 4.15 a.m., two at 9.30 a.m., and another one or two during lunch. He explained that ration bars were created for ninjas who'd be on very long missions away from Konoha. So they have absolutely everything necessary that a ninja must consume. Apart from that, food items rich in proteins were recommended by him. Fujin groaned a bit at his schedule. He thought, no freaking way. Since when did Jounin Sensei begin spending so much time to train their jinnins? Heck, Apart from Kakashi teaching Sasuke Chidori and Guy teaching Lee, I don't think any of the remaining ten were taught anything significant at all by their sensei. With him practically taking my whole day, I won't have any time to keep practicing Fuinjutsu or learn any new ninjutsu. I am not sure if the trade-off is worth it. He thought a bit more inside, I don't really have a say here, I really hope that the trade-off is worth it. Rinjiro began the next training session. Considering how tired his students were, Rinjiro decided to let them have it easy. The session focused on teamwork and team formations. Nothing fancy, just the application of what they were taught in the academy. At noon, Rinjiro stopped the training and gathered everyone. He then said, Fujin, for today, we'll skip your sword practice. I have another assignment for you. All three of you will visit the library and decide what you guys want to learn over the next year. We will discuss it tomorrow. And don't forget, we'll have daily training sessions here at 5 a.m. Fujin, Hoka, and Mieko nodded and thanked him. Hoka and Mieko left for their home, whereas Fujin went over to Yakiniku Q for lunch. Fujin did train hard over the past five years. However, nothing came close to what he went through today. Despite the pain, he was actually looking forward to how much stronger this training would make him. After lunch, he went over to the library. He entered the section C of the library and began searching for wind-release jutsus. He also wanted to look at rank C earth-release jutsus, but he thought, that old freak can sneak up without me even sensing. And given that he has given us this task, I won't be surprised if he is keeping an eye here. I'll just check the rest sometime later. What surprised him was that the number of rank C wind release jutsus exceeded the number of rank D and rank E wind release jutsus. On going through all of them, he made a list. The list of rank C wind release jutsus was Gale Palm Jutsu, Great Breakthrough Jutsu, Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsu, Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu, Wind Dragon Jutsu, Wind Cutter Jutsu, Faithful Wind Blade Jutsu. Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu Air Current Wild Dance Jutsu He had already learned Great Breakthrough Jutsu. He read scrolls of the remaining Jutsus to get a better understanding of them. After reading, he concluded So Gale Palm Jutsu is basically just a more advanced form of Gale Surge Jutsu. It does provide 360 degrees coverage, but its power is still lacking. Not to mention, Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsu is a much better defensive Jutsu. Not only does it defend, but it also reflects back all attacks made on it. Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu is similar to Body Flicker Jutsu. The body moves along with a gale of wind. 
It's an escape jutsu. And the user can move over a kilometer. Wind Cutter Jutsu and Faithful Wind Blade Jutsu are offense oriented jutsus. Wind Cutter basically just uses wind to cut through the enemies. And Faithful Wind Blade needs a sword or kunai or any blade as a base. Using that, it creates a 10 feet long blade of wind. Since it is made of wind, it is almost weightless and is very sharp and difficult to block. I guess the jutsu that Baki used was a more advanced form of this jutsu. Air Current Wild Dance Jutsu is a battlefield control jutsu and can be used to restrict enemies. Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu and Wind Dragon Jutsu sound incredibly fun. A wind sphere has to be made, and then the caster has to make a wolf or a dragon from that sphere. But both jutsus take different routes ahead. In Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu, I can make more wolves as I get stronger. Whereas, in Wind Dragon Jutsu, the dragon can shoot out wind explosion jutsu. He began analyzing, once again, these jutsus are very interesting. Most of these jutsus are restricted by their ranks and can perform even as good as in rank S jutsu if the caster is strong enough and has mastered these jutsus to their limits. In fact, spinning shield of wind jutsu, wind gale wolf jutsu and wind dragon jutsu are classified as rank CS depending on how strong their user is. At rank C, Spinning Shield of Wind can only deflect weapons back. But as it is made stronger, it can reflect low-level ninjutsu back, and at its peak, it is said to be even able to reflect rank A jutsus back. For Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu, it's about the number of wolves that can be formed. At rank C, only one can be formed. But at rank S, the caster can make hundreds of these wolves. Something that'll be incredibly useful against an army. For Wind Dragon Jutsu, it's about the size of the dragon and the number of wind explosion jutsu it can spit out. According to the scroll, someone with large amounts of chakra and excellent chakra control could make a dragon that is over a kilometer long and can shoot out hundreds of wind explosion jutsu. Even though the other jutsus aren't stated to be able to reach such a level, I can imagine them to be much stronger. For instance, for Faithful Wind Blade Jutsu, the size of the wind blade could be extended even further or it could be made much more sharper. Similarly, wind instantaneous body jutsu could probably be used to move tens of kilometers away. He then calmed himself and thought, the only issue is, why haven't I heard about anyone using these jutsus? Even if these jutsus have that potential, if no one can reach it, then there must be some issue. He analyzed for a few minutes and concluded, I guess using my memories about Naruto is very unreliable. Also, it is very likely that Wind Affinity Ninjas in Kanoha do practice these jutsus, just that I'm not aware of them. Not surprising. But I do want to know if there was even one character in the past who used these jutsus to their full potential. He noticed, I lost my focus. Let me first decide which jutsus to learn. After analyzing, he decided, I will learn Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsu, Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu, Wind Dragon Jutsu, Faithful Wind Blade Jutsu and Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu. I don't need the battlefield control that Air Current Wild Dance Jutsu provides currently. And for defense, Escaping Into the Ground and Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsu are better options than Gale Palm Jutsu. Wind Cutter Jutsu could have been useful, but I have another idea. While analyzing the Jutsus, Fujin noticed two peculiarities. His thoughts were, wouldn't Faithful Wind Blade Jutsu be a better option than Chakra Flow? It makes me wonder if instead of sending a slash of Chakra, I could use this to send a slash of Wind in Samurai Saber techniques. Also, can this be used in conjunction with Chakra Flow? The others are Wind Dragon Jutsu and Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu. The starting point of both these Jutsu are the same. So can I create wolves that shoot out Wind Explosion Jutsu or can I create multiple dragons? These ideas intrigued him a lot. He decided to experiment with them when he was strong enough to do so. After deciding the jutsus to learn, Fujin thought, all right, decision made. Now I'll dig up this entire library to see if anyone ever used these jutsus to their limits or not. He got up to keep the scrolls back. On getting up he noticed, eh, Mieko's here? I didn't even notice. He then tried to sense and noticed, oh, Hoka is here too. And he is in Section D. 
Chapter 40, Second Kazakage Both Hoka and Nieko had arrived in the library some time after Fujin. Unlike Fujin, they had guidance from their ninja parents. As they were talented enough, they were also guided by their respective clan elders. So they hadn't visited the village's library before as all their jutsus were directly taught to them. However, this time, respecting Renjiro's wishes, the elders allowed these kids to go and research in the village library. Of course, they would discuss Mieko and Hoka's plans with them before they talked to Renjiro. Hoka was reading the scroll on Body Flicker Jutsu in Section D. He thought, Sai, the library is full of ninjutsu. I tried reading scrolls on Taijutsu, but they suck. Nothing comes close to our gentle fist style. Sai, I don't want to waste my time on ninjutsu. I'll just tell Sensei that I will learn body flicker jutsu. It was very cool when Fujin just blitzed everywhere. Also, if my enemy knows this jutsu, I won't be able to even touch him. Though father would probably still yell on me. Can't they get that I want to focus only on taijutsu? Mieko, on the other hand, had directly arrived in Section C and began looking for more fire-release jutsus. She thought, why did my father make me search through jutsus here? Couldn't they just teach me stronger jutsus? However, while searching, she found something that surprised her. She thought, fire release, for? Why is this jutsu in Section C? Shouldn't it be a rank B jutsu and fire release, 5 jutsu be a rank A jutsu? She took the scroll and began reading it. On reading it, she was very satisfied, she thought finally. This jutsu finally has some power behind it. The fire release, for jutsu was similar to fire release, 2 jutsu. Point two fingers and release a heat ray. However, in this stage the power was much higher. It was comparable to using a very hot kunai. Mieko thought, with this, I could compete with Hoka and Fujin in close combat. Getting hit by this will be very painful and it'll be very hard to dodge in close range. Though I don't like to admit it, both of them are much stronger than me physically. And Hoka's gentle fist style is difficult to counter despite having Sharingan. With this jutsu, I could become as strong as them in close combat and I am already superior to them in ranged combat. She then looked for other jutsus and decided to learn Flame Sphere Jutsu and Fireproof Jutsu thinking, I don't have any defensive jutsus. So these might be a bit useful. Fujin ignored his teammates and began his search with the Kazakages. He wasn't aware much about the Kazakages. He thought, the syllabus didn't focus much on the past Kazakages. In fact, they didn't talk about which jutsus were used by any foreign Kage. I do recall Gara his father, and the third Kazakage. However, not much was shown. Gara manipulated sand, Raza manipulated gold, and his predecessor manipulated iron. And all their combat was based around that. I hope the first and second aren't the same. Also it isn't necessary for third and fourth Kazakages to not know anything else. It took him a while to gather all the data on the three Kazakages. He had already read about Raza in the bingo book. Sadly, the bingo book didn't maintain information on the dead. After almost two hours of going through various scrolls and trying to summarize it, Fujin understood I see. So the first Kazakage was a user of magnet release Kekiai Jankai. He was the one who created Sunagakir. And unlike Hashirama, he did it with an iron fist. Many tribes and clans in the vicinity were forced to join in or evacuate. It seems like he wanted to keep the position of Kazakage within his clan as he had announced his second son as his successor. Sadly for him, Tobarama killed all his three sons in a clash in the first war. And later on, he was killed by the second Suchikage dust release in the same war. Not having anyone strong enough in the clan, they had to appoint a student of the first Kazakage as the second Kazakage. And at the same time, they began raising the first Kazakage's grandson for the third Kazakage's position. Though all the Kazakage's have been an expert at wind release, it was the second one who was a true master of the wind. It seems that the legends from these scrolls came from him. In order to defend an important location, he had created a wind dragon so huge that its tail couldn't be seen at all. 
He could also create hundreds of wolves to attack enemy armies. He could fly, and had clashed with the second Suchikage a few times. And it seems like all the Danzo's vacuum jutsus came from the second Kazakage too. However, towards the end of the first war, Tobarama killed the second Kazakage. Though, despite that, they didn't surrender and retreated back into their deserts, where no one dared to march on them. So, how exactly did Kanoha get these jutsus? It's very unlikely for Kanoha and Suna to both have these jutsus. So either Suna or, more likely, Kanoha stole it from the other. Fujin thought a bit and reached three conclusions, well either Tobarama had an Uchiha keep an eye on him and copy his jutsus, or, Tobarama used impure world resurrection to get those jutsus from him, or Suna were asked to hand these jutsus over after their disastrous loss in the second war. Hmm, knowing Tobarama, I'd say it is very likely that he employed both the first two ways and Haruzen took the opportunity provided in the second war to show that Kanoha has acquired these jutsus in a proper manner. Of course, I can't be sure that this is what happened. Either way, it does seem that the potential of these wind-release jutsus is very real. Still, the first great ninja war was so brutal. At the end of the war, every village had to elect the third kage. Only Tobarama and the second Rekage were alive, but they were killed during the peace talks when the Ginkaku brothers revolted. Probably that's why the next wars weren't that intense. No Kage died in the Second Great Ninja War and the Third Rekage was the only Kage to die in the Third Great Ninja War. I guess they did learn some form of constraint. Makes me wonder if the First War is the reason why Haruzen talks so much about peace and why Anoki chose to just watch and be known as the fence-sitter instead of being more proactive. On validating the potential of the Jutsus, Fujin decided to read one scroll up entirely to understand how the Jutsu should be learned. After analyzing, he decided I'll start with Faithful Wind Blade Jutsu. It should assist in my Samurai Saber Techniques training with Renjiro. Though, I'll need to confirm it with him first. Mieko and Hoka had already left the library when Fujin was searching for information on the Kazakages. When Hoka reached home, his father asked, So what have you decided to learn? Hoka put up a very serious face and said, Father, I have decided to learn Body Flicker Jutsu. And then he paused. His father kept waiting to hear his son's further plans, but Hoka didn't speak. He asked, and? Hoka showed a confused expression and asked, and what? He impatiently asked, what will you learn in addition to body flicker jutsu? Hoka again put up a very serious face and said, I'll learn more taijutsu. This statement finally broke his father's stoic expression and got Hoka a punch right on his head. He then dragged his son to his clan's library to pick out more jutsus for him. A similar scenario took place at Mieko's home. Her parents were happy with her choice to learn fire release for jutsu. But for the rest, her mother told her, those two jutsus don't provide much defense. Flame sphere will at best help you defend against one attack, and fireproof jutsus will only make you immune to fire release jutsus. Actually, Fire element doesn't provide a good defense. Why don't you learn earth or water release jutsus for defense? Mieko thought about what her parents said and agreed. She said, all right, but I also want to learn flame sphere and fireproof. Knowing their daughter's talent, her parents agreed. They then went to the Uchiha library to pick more jutsus. Chapter 41, Importance of Rank C Jutsus the next day again began with the brutal morning workout. At 10 a.m., Rinjiro asked, So what have you guys decided to learn? Mieko, wanting to talk first, quickly said, Sensei, I've decided to learn fire release, four jutsu, flame sphere jutsu, fireproof jutsu, earth military movement jutsu and hiding like a mole jutsu. Rinjiro nodded and asked, Why? Mieko said, I already know fire release, three jutsu, so fire release, 4 is the next step. It'll also be a very strong option in close combat. Earth military movement jutsu and hiding like a mole jutsu are to evade an enemy attack and once I'm underground, it'll be a strong defense too. And if I have jumped and can't reach the ground, then I'll use flame sphere jutsu to defend. And fireproof jutsu would help me become immune to fire release jutsus. On hearing her reason, 
Fujin thought, he he, she memorized the whole thing. Still hiding like a mole jutsu. I should learn that one. I hope that jutsu has some way to breathe underground. Though I did develop a few ways to ensure cracks in the surface to allow some flow of air underground, it is not very reliable. Rinjiro too noticed the memorized answer and sighed internally, they still assisted her in the decision. Though this plan should be good enough. He then said, that should be good enough. However, you will train to be able to perform fire release for jutsu without any hand signs. Mieko was confused, without any hand signs? How and why? Rinjiro replied, do you think that your enemies will wait for you to perform your hand signs when you are in a close combat? As how, don't worry. I'll teach you. Mieko was very intrigued by it and nodded excitedly. He then looked over to Fujin. Fujin said, I've decided to learn spinning shield of wind jutsu, wind gale wolf jutsu, wind dragon jutsu, faithful wind blade jutsu, and wind instantaneous body jutsu. This surprised Renjiro a bit. He thought, that's surprising. He wants to learn five rank C wind release jutsu? I did have plans to suggest a couple of jutsus in case he chose only one or two. I suppose this will be good too. I'll just teach those to him sometime later. Though Renjiro hit it soon, Fujin did notice him getting surprised. He sighed internally, I would have preferred to train in them in secret, but he barely allows me any free time to do that. So if I only mention one or two, then there's a chance that I might be stuck with only those for some time. Rinjiro then nodded and asked, Why? Fujin replied, Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsu will help me defend from frontal assaults and even counterattack. Gale Wolf and Wind Dragon Jutsu will allow me to attack from a distance and control the battlefield. And I could attack from both land and the sky with them. Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu is an escape jutsu. As for Faithful Wind Blade, I think that it'll complement Samurai Saber techniques well, so I plan to start with it. Rinjiro thought, very good, considering that he didn't have anyone to guide him. Two jutsus very long range, one defensive, one close range and one escape jutsus and he already has two usable mid-range jutsus. He then commented, good thinking. But, later on, you'll also have to learn your second element. Wind is good to attack, but not very good to defend. Also, don't learn faithful wind blade jutsu right now while it will complement Samurai Saber techniques, but that's only after you've mastered it. Right now it'll become an obstacle instead. Start with Wind Dragon Jutsu. Fujin nodded and asked, why should Wind Dragon Jutsu be learned first? Wouldn't it be easier to learn Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu first and then learn Wind Dragon Jutsu? Rinjiro was impressed with the question. He answered, I have some plans for your Wind Dragon Jutsu. So don't worry about it. As for the learning order, once you learn Wind Dragon Jutsu, it'll be much easier to learn Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu. Fujin nodded while thinking, yeah, but that doesn't make learning Wind Dragon Jutsu any easier. Rinjiro then looked at Hoka. Hoka said, I've decided to learn Body Flicker Jutsu, Stone Shuriken Jutsu, Rock Thorn Bed Jutsu, Rock Thorn Launch Jutsu, and Water Shuriken Jutsu. Both Fujin and Mieko noticed the sorrowful tone of Hoka. Rinjiro thought, I know you don't like ninjutsu, but is there a need to look at me like I owe you a million ryo? He ignored that and thought about the jutsus, just like us, the Hyugas focus on earth and water elements too. The gentle fist style has both the sturdiness of earth and the flexibility of water. So even if they don't have those affinities, they are still trained in those elements. Luckily for him, he does have the earth affinity. Still, he chose only one rank C jutsu. All others are rank D. I guess I need to take it slow with this kid. Rinjiro asked once again, why? Hoka replied the answer that his father had made him memorize, body flicker is to increase my speed. My gentle fist style is restricted by range. So I can use body flicker to force the enemy in close combat. And if an enemy stays barely outside my range, then I can engage him with Stone Shuriken Jutsu. If the fight is on water, then I can engage him with Water Shuriken Jutsu. 
Rockthorn bed jutsu is to stop the enemies from running away and rockthorn launch jutsu is in case the enemy jumps to avoid the rockthorns. Rinjiro nodded and thought, the usual Hyuga tactic of using rockthorn bed jutsu for the reverse purpose. Though I'll have to make him learn more rank C earth and water release jutsus. Rinjiro then looked at all three of his students and said, I'll now explain to you why I made you go through this exercise. But first, tell me, which rank jutsu would you guys like to use? Mieko replied immediately, I'd like to learn and use rank S jutsu. She then looked at Rinjiro with hopeful eyes. Rinjiro chuckled internally and looked at the other two kids. Fujin was in thought, and Hoka appeared tense. Hoka, while sweating, said, R.A. Rank D. Ju, jutsus are enough for me. Mieko glared at Hoka for saying that. Rinjiro then looked at Fujin and asked, Fujin? Fujin looked at his sensei and said, I'd like to use rank A or S jutsus too. But I'm not sure of how much chakra they would need. If just using one rank S jutsu completely drains my chakra, then it's kind of pointless, isn't it? Rinjiro smiled on hearing that answer, perfect. This kid's analytical ability is very good. Rinjiro said, you are right. This exercise is for you guys to find the jutsus most suited for you. No matter what rank ninja you become in the future, the jutsus you'll use the most are rank C jutsus. The reason is that the jutsus that are rank B and above drain a lot of chakra and affect your ability to fight for long. He waited a few moments for the jinnins to understand. He continued, So, in future, how good ninja you become will depend on how good you are at using the rank C jutsus you have. He then looked at Mieko and said, It isn't about the number of rank C jutsus you know, but about how good you are at using them. He then looked at Fujin and said, Fujin, use your great breakthrough jutsu on those trees. Fujin nodded, made the hand signs, and released his great breakthrough jutsu. The jutsu created a lot of winds, causing the branches to shake wildly and a lot of leaves and twigs to fall down. The winds left deep cuts in most trees. Many. After a minute, the winds died down. Fujin thought, all right, that's about 25% of my full power with this jutsu. Rinjiro said, good, now watch this. Rinjiro then made one hand sign and then used great breakthrough jutsu himself. The power behind his jutsu was easily over 10 times of what Fujin had done. The winds went through a few trees. Three trees were uprooted. And even though the jutsu wasn't directed at them, Fujin, Hoka and Mieko all felt those winds and had to hold onto the ground. Hoka and Mieko were very shocked by what they saw. Whereas Fujin had only one thought, isn't this illegal deforestation? Someone called the cops and the media. Old man, Hashirama is no longer alive to just create more trees out of thin air. Mieko asked enthusiastically, but how? Why is your jutsu so much stronger than Fujin's? Rinjiro replied, because I have mastered this jutsu to a greater degree than Fujin. Fujin rebuked internally, incorrect old man, you still had to use one hand sign. You just charged the jutsu with way more chakra than I did or can. Though I guess you were more efficient in chakra use. Rinjiro continued, and this wasn't my full power. Nor have I completely mastered this jutsu. Had it been Lord Hokage, then he could have leveled this whole forest with just this jutsu. Mieko, Fujin and Hoko were very surprised and excited at that information. Or at least the other two were. Fujin sighed internally thinking, Hiruzen is a lot scarier here than in Naruto. I really wonder if Orochimaru will really be able to kill him or not. Satisfied with his students' reactions, Renjiro said, So this is why, you need to focus on learning and mastering the proper rank C jutsus. In the future, these jutsus are what you'll be using the most. Of course, it doesn't mean that you should not learn higher rank jutsus. The additional power they provide is very useful. However, if you don't have a good set of rank C jutsus mastered, then you won't ever be able to become truly strong. Mieko and Fuji nodded, but Hoka still looked a bit reluctant. Rinjiro looked at Hoka and said, Hoka, no matter how good you become at Taijutsu, you'll never become a strong ninja without mastering a few good rank C jutsus. 
Hoka looked down and softly murmured, even without ninjutsu I can still become a very strong ninja. Rinjiro sighed and said, All right, we will have one spar between Fujin and you right now. Mieko pouted as she wasn't involved in the spar. Rinjiro made Hoka and Fujin take their positions. While they were heading towards their position, Rinjiro secretly whispered to Fujin. Chapter 42, Fujin vs. Hoka Hoka and Fujin were facing each other and were ten meters apart. Rinjiro announced, You can use everything you know in this spar. Ninjutsu, Jinjutsu, Taijutsu and Kinjutsu are all allowed. But don't hurt each other fatally. Both kids nodded. Rinjiro announced, Fight! As soon as he said that, Hoka activated his Byakugan and rushed forward as fast as he could to engage Fujin in close combat. However, Fujin just flickered away. On gaining sufficient distance, he prepared one wind explosion jutsu in each hand. On seeing that, Hoka stopped and quickly started using hand signs for rock shield jutsu. Fujin recognized the hand signs and threw one wind sphere on Hoka. That put a lot of pressure on Hoka, but he managed to create the rock shield in time. The wind sphere hit the rock shield and exploded, creating a lot of winds. Seeing that his jutsu worked, Hoka sighed in relief and put his guard down for a moment. That turned out to be a mistake, as Hoka's Bikugan saw a wind sphere heading towards him from the left. He tried to jump away quickly, but the wind sphere exploded near him. The explosion created more winds, which hit Hoka while he was in the air. The winds threw him off course, causing him to fall badly. Hoka quickly got on his feet, only to see one more wind sphere headed straight towards him. This time, he didn't jump and instead tried running away. However, more and more wind spheres kept heading towards him. For the next 15 seconds, Hoka just kept dodging. The winds created by the explosion had created small scratches all over his body, and his clothes were in a very bad shape. Finally Hoka adjusted himself and began dodging the wind spheres properly. He used his Byakugan to see the wind spheres as soon as they were launched and dodged in the right directions. Fujin thought, excellent. The rate at which I'm creating the wind spheres is just one-fifth of what I'm truly capable of, while their power is one-third of their max power. Still he's struggling so badly. Oh well, time to end this farce I guess. Fujin had the number of wind spheres he was throwing. This allowed Hoka to close the distance between him and Fujin. He thought, finally. He slowed down. Time to finish him with my gentle fist. When the distance between the two was just 10 meters, Fujin began moving backwards. Hoka thought, it'll be annoying if he creates the distance again and increased his speed. However, Fujin quickly made a few hand signs. Seeing Fujin making hand signs, Hoka tried to increase his speed further, however, he quickly realized and panicked. He quickly tried making hand signs for rock shield jutsu, but it was too late. Fujin, who was merely a few meters ahead of him, blew strong winds straight at him. The resultant winds blew Hoka back with force. Rinjiro, who was planning to jump in, noticed, I see. Fujin put a very low amount of chakra in the jutsu. And it seems like he also made it very mild. Had he used as much force as he displayed earlier, that jutsu could have maimed Hoka. The winds blew Hoka around 50 meters back. Though Fujin tried to limit its power, Hoka still got dragged along the ground, causing him a lot of scratches which bled. After the wind subsided, Fujin picked up a small pebble nearby and threw it at Hoka. As Fujin had expected, Hoka still got up and wanted to fight more. He noticed the pebble heading towards him and stepped aside. He was about to rush towards Fujin again, however, the pebble suddenly took a hard turn and headed straight at him. Hoka couldn't react and the pebble hit him straight on his chest. It didn't cause any damage to Hoka, but Rinjiro announced, that's enough. Winner is Fujin. On hearing that, Hoka dropped to his knees dejectedly. Though he didn't want to admit it, he knew that if Fujin had used a shuriken instead of a pebble, he'd have been injured very badly. This loss hit him hard. Fujin expected it, and so did Rinjiro. During the four years of his academy, Hoka had never lost a fight to any of his classmates. 
In his second graduation exam, he even beat his seniors. However, this time he was defeated, and he never even had a chance. Looking at Hoka's crestfallen expression, Rinjiro sighed, while I expected this result, I didn't think it'd be so bad. He didn't even have a chance. He then looked at Fujin and thought, this kid though. Even though I asked him to maintain distance while fighting, I didn't expect him to do this well. He controlled the flow of the whole battle and had Hoka moving exactly how he wanted. He even threw a sphere on Hoka's defense on purpose, just to get his guard down. There's a lot more to this kid than we thought. Hee <laughs> hee, it makes me very interested in his future. Perhaps in the next great war, he might be an important figure. He then looked at Hoka and said, So, do you understand now why ninjutsu is important? Hoka looked up at his sensei. Rinjiro continued, Your opponent used two rank D and one rank C jutsu. One was a movement jutsu and the other two were mid-range jutsu. While you only used one defensive rank E jutsu. You specialize in taijutsu, but you didn't even get a chance to engage your enemy in taijutsu. Hoka nodded sadly. Rinjiro then put up a kind smile and said reassuringly, I know that you like taijutsu a lot. And I support your enthusiasm for it. But you need to know ninjutsu too in order to be able to use your taijutsu effectively. There hasn't been any ninja who has become strong by only focusing on taijutsu and neglecting everything else. While he was saying that, he secretly thought, though there was one ninja who could challenge what I said. My Duwei, he killed four swordsmen of the mist and forced the remaining three to run away. Just like Minato was credited for our victory against IWA, Duwei can be credited for our victory over Kiri. They never dared to ever fight us again after that incident. Though, I would still stand by what I said to Hoka. Despite Duwei being as strong as he was, he still struggled at completing normal missions. Not knowing any good jinjutsu or ninjutsu and just depending on taijutsu is a bad idea. His son, despite preferring taijutsu and mostly using it, does know a decent amount of ninjutsu. But if his taijutsu keeps advancing at the same rate, he might make what I said invalid. Hoka nodded his head and said with determination, Yes, sensei. I will work hard on my ninjutsu too. Rinjiro kept his kind smile and sighed in relief internally, finally, I got another kid on the right track. I have to admit, the old man's tactics in handling kids are the best. No wonder he was able to train three Sanins. Anyways, my team is finally set. He then looked at all three of his students and said, I hope all of you have realized the importance of rank C Jutsus by now. Fujin, Hoka, and Mieko nodded. Rinjiro continued, in terms of ninjutsu, your next focus will be on learning and mastering rank C jutsus. Until I say otherwise, none of you will attempt to learn a rank B or higher jutsu. He then advised the kids more and ended the day by saying, this will be your today's assignment. Fujin, you and Mieko will take Hoka to the village hospital and see that his wounds are tended to. And Fujin, meet me here at 2 p.m. He then flickered away. On the way to the hospital, Hoka was walking in an awkward manner. The morning training followed by getting several cuts took its toll. Seeing him wobble, Fujin said, Sorry about that. Hoka replied, It's all right. Don't worry about him. Mieko said, Yeah, it's just a few cuts. Stop wobbling and walk faster. Hoka, however, replied with his usual stoic face, Perhaps if I slept for over two hours during the morning workout, I might have been able to walk properly. Hearing that, Fujin chuckled, while Mieko became very embarrassed. Fujin and Mieko accompanied Hoka in the hospital. Hoka was asked to go to a ward. First a civilian doctor arrived and cleaned all his wounds up. Five minutes after the doctor left, a medical ninja arrived and healed all the cuts on him and advised him to take rest for the remaining day. Fujin observed the entire process, and then looked at Mieko with a hint of jealousy. He sighed thinking, if only I had the Sharingan. I'd have just copied mystical palm jutsu and been done with it. They then said farewell to each other and left. Chapter 43, Progress In the afternoon, 
Fujin visited the training grounds where Renjiro trained him in the basics of samurai saber techniques. Next day again began with the same workout. At 10 a.m., Renjiro said, Today, we will begin learning new jutsus. Hoka, you'll begin with rock thorn bed jutsu. Fujin, you'll start with wind dragon jutsu and Mieko, you'll start with fire release, for jutsu. The kids nodded. Renjiro then made a hand sign and prepared three shadow clones. Each of the shadow clones took a scroll from the main body and then took one jinin. Hoka stayed at the same place, whereas Fujin and Mieko were moved to a different location in the training ground. The clones then gave the scroll to the jinins and asked them to read and start attempting the jutsu. As the kids began to learn them, the clone constantly kept a watch and gave tips and advice when they felt the need to. The training under Renjiro continued in this manner. The morning workout remained the same. Whereas, in the 10 a.m. to noon session, Renjiro alternated between training them in team formations and ninjutsu training. In the afternoons, Renjiro trained Fujin with the sword. And from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., Fujin trained by himself. He either practiced the jutsu he was learning or fought against his shadow clones. Fujin found the training under Renjiro to be very helpful. Even though Fujin was already able to perform a few jutsus without hand signs, getting tips from Renjiro on the same helped him optimize it even further. Learning new jutsu became much easier too due to the tips Renjiro gave. He learned the Wind Dragon Jutsu in a week, Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu in two days, Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsu in nine days, and Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu in three days. The Rank C Jutsus provided some challenge for Fujin. Wind Dragon and Spinning Shield of Wind was difficult to learn. Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu, however, was very easy to learn after having learnt Wind Dragon Jutsu. Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu too was very similar to Body Flicker Jutsu. Only, instead of depending on their own force, the user had to create a gust of wind and use it to move. Its range was larger than body flicker jutsu. Fujin was instantly able to move 300 meters away with the aid of this jutsu. Another advantage was that it didn't leave any traces behind for the enemy to track. While right now, Fujin could escape better by spamming body flicker jutsu, he was sure that once he mastered this jutsu, it'll be much better at escaping than body flicker jutsu. His sword skills too had improved drastically. He and Renjiro decided on the length of the swords Fujin should get. It was 57 centimeters. After three weeks as Jinin, Fujin received the two samurai swords he was promised. He was called to the Hokage's office along with Renjiro and given the swords. Fujin did note the fact that Haruzen took every opportunity he could in order to make the kids more loyal to Kanoha. In the training grounds, he held the two swords. Even though he wasn't an expert in swords, he clearly felt that these two were much better in quality. On that day, Rinjiro began teaching Fujin chakra flow. Fujin, who already knew it, calmed himself and acted like it was the first time he was seeing it. He thought, I am not sure I can hide my skill from him. I guess I should just not do what I know and follow his instructions to the T. Luckily for Fujin, Renjiro's methods to create chakra flow was much different from what he had tried. It was also much more suitable. So he just honestly tried that method. Due to the method being different, he struggled initially. However, once he got a hang of it, the remaining phase was extremely easy for him. In merely three days, he managed to flow his chakra through his new swords. He noticed, wow, this is so easy with this sword. Renjiro, on the other hand, was very shocked. He thought, the hell? He learned chakra flow in merely three days? Even assuming that he trained at home, he couldn't have trained for more than 15 hours. He tried to make sense of it, did he already know it? He tried analyzing, and concluded no, his struggle initially was very real. It's just that after he managed to do it a little bit, the rest became very easy for him. It's as if it was second nature to him. His analysis shocked him even further. He finally chuckled and thought, Master Miffian, it seems like I have picked up a student more talented than anyone in the Land of Iron. With that thought, he began laughing loudly, ha 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 ha, that laugh did attract Fujin's attention. He thought, did he notice? 
No, that shouldn't be it. I guess it's my talent. Sigh, there was no other choice. Still, he doesn't need to laugh like a retard. Rinjiro noticed Fujin looking at him with a concerned look, as if he was wondering whether his sensei needed some medical attention. He said, Don't worry about it, kid. I just recalled an old geezer who was bragging about the talents in his village. Anyways, now that you have learned chakra flow, we'll work towards mastering it. The intensity of the training too will increase a lot. Fujin nodded. From that day onwards, Rinjiro became much more enthusiastic in teaching the samurai saber techniques to Fujin. That also meant that the training became much tougher. It almost became half as intense as the morning workout. Mieko and Hoka too made a lot of progress. Mieko learned all her jutsus within the first two weeks, whereas Hoka needed a month to learn his. Learning body flicker made Hoka a much better ninja. By the end of the month, Mieko finally managed to get through the entire morning workout. As soon as she did that, Rinjiro asked her to start activating the training seal to 1% of its maximum capacity. Poor girl's joy at completing the workout quickly turned to horror. He had increased the pressure on Hoka's and Fujin's bodies too by making them increase the pressure of his seal to 32% and 15% respectively. A slash N, I'll call that seal training seal from here onwards. Probably should have named it when I introduced it. Apart from the personal improvements, the squad had also improved as a team. Within the first week, all the basic four-man and three-man formations were drilled into the trio. After that, Rinjiro began working on their teamwork and combination attacks. A lot of exercises and spars were conducted to improve teamwork. For combination attacks, Fujin and Mieko were made to combine Wind Dragon and Fire Dragon Jutsus. It took a few days to learn, but the result was excellent. The Fire Dragon was enhanced by the Wind Dragon, nearly doubling its size. Its power was around four times the power of both the Jutsus individually. The Dragon could shoot Wind Explosion Jutsu from its mouth, however, instead of normal winds, it was made of incredibly hot winds. On their first experiment, they nearly caused a forest fire. Luckily Renjiro was closely monitoring this training and quickly used waterfall jutsu to douse the fire. Seeing that Fujin thought, isn't this very similar to Scorch style? I guess, only the power is lacking. Fujin looked at Renjiro and asked, Sensei, is it possible for only one ninja to perform this combination jutsu? And I mean without using clones. Mieko was very intrigued by this question and paid attention. Renjiro answered, Yes, it is possible. You have to use both the nature transformations at the same time and release them together. One way to do it is by doing hand signs for fire dragon jutsu with one hand and for wind dragon jutsu with the other. But don't worry about it for now. This is too advanced. You can't do it right now. This answer surprised Fujin. He quickly asked, but sensei, wouldn't using two elements at the same time be a Kekiai Jinkai? How can anyone do that without having the bloodline? Rinjiro answered, This ain't Kekiai Jinkai. It's merely using two elements to complement each other. For example, the Yuki clan has Ice Release Kekiai Jinkai. Ice Release is a combination of water and wind. However, if you combine wind and water dragons, all you get is a water dragon that cuts very sharply. There is no sign whatsoever of any ice forming. Combination jutsus merely enhance each other, whereas Kekiai Jinkai bring a qualitative change to create something very different. On hearing that answer, Fujin fell into his thoughts, I see. So it's possible to combine jutsus in this manner. I didn't know it was possible. This does open up more options for me. I guess I need to start training other elements too. Wind works great with both fire and water. I wonder if it's possible to make it work along with lightning too. Sadly, I don't think there's a lot of scope in using the wind element with earth. I wonder when I'll be ready to learn this though. Would showing off all my cards make him teach it to me? Though, not having hidden cards in a world as dangerous as this will suck. He asked, Sensei, when do you think I'll be ready for this? If I learn a second element now, would I be able to do this combination jutsu by myself? 
Renjiro shook his head and said, Don't think about this right now. Think about this only after you become a Jounin. Your skills in chakra control, chakra molding will need to improve a lot before you begin practicing this. The amount of chakra you have will also need to be much higher. So as I said earlier, for the time being, you'll only be mastering rank C Jutsus. Fuji nodded dejectedly. Mieko too hung her head in disappointment on hearing this. Chapter 44 Combination Jutsus One day, when the 10 a.m. session began, Renjiro said, I have taught you one combination jutsu. And you can see how strong it is. I want you guys to think about more jutsus you can use in combination with each other. It doesn't have to be as strong as Fire Wind Dragon Jutsu, but it should increase your capabilities in some way. So think about it, but don't experiment. I'll meet you guys at 11 inch he then flickered away, without giving anyone a chance to say anything. Hoka said, so what do we do? Fujin, who had already thought a few over the past couple of weeks said, well let's just think about it. And then discuss to see if everyone is fine with the idea. Mieko said, all right. After around 15 minutes, Mieko said, Hoka, can your water element mix with my fire element? Hoka asked in a confused manner, but how, won't my water douse your fire? Mieko smirked and said, no it won't. Fish Spit Jutsu is the only one you have that can generate a stream of jutsu, and it is very weak compared to my jutsus. So my fire jutsu will evaporate all your water and create a lot of steam. Hoka fell into a thought after hearing it. Fujin was quite surprised with this suggestion. He thought, I didn't expect this brat to come up with something like this. He said, yeah, it'll generate a lot of steam, but can either of you control it? Both shook their heads. Fujin replied, in that case, that can only be used to create a cover and hide ourselves. Mieko sighed dejectedly and began thinking again. After a couple of minutes, Fujin said I have one idea. We can create a double layer defense. My spinning shield of wind jutsu can stop and reflect all thrown weapons and some weaker ninjutsu. However, if the enemy uses strong ninjutsu, it'll be breached. So my idea is to create a shield of wind, and right after that, Hoka will create a rock shield behind the shield to cover us further. Hoka thought and nodded, yes, that could work. However, Mieko groaned and said, hey, don't leave me out. Fujin chuckled and said, actually I have one more idea. Hoka, can you use your rock shield jutsu? Hoka was confused and asked, but didn't Sensei tell us to not test anything? Fujin replied, he said that to prevent us from causing an accident. Just using rock shield jutsu will be fine. Also, quickly move behind a few meters after using the jutsu. Hoka nodded and got up. He performed the jutsu and quickly jumped back. Fujin thought, not fast enough. He then said, all right, do it again. Only this time, I'll throw a small pebble on you. Dodge that by moving backwards. Hoka made the hand signs and slammed his hands on the ground. Fujin waited for the jutsu to be completed. As soon as it was completed, he threw the pebble on Hoka. Hoka quickly dodged back. Fujin nodded and said, All right, that's fast enough. Mieko asked, So what's the big idea? Fujin replied, I'm thinking that both of us should learn this jutsu too. If we do, then as soon as Hoka uses the jutsu and jumps back, one of us can create another rock shield behind his and repeat the same. This way a multi-tier defense can be made on the fly. Another idea is, if all three of us can channel our chakra in the same rock shield, then will the shield become sturdier or will it become larger? If that works, then it'll be very useful too. Both Hoka and Mieko nodded and agreed. They began brainstorming once again and came up with a few more ideas. At 11 a.m., Renjiro reappeared. He asked, So, what did you guys think of? Fujin started, We came up with an idea of a multi-tiered defense. The basic idea is for me to use spinning shield of wind jutsu and Hoka to use the rock shield jutsu to create the rock shield behind my shield of wind. And we can create more tiers by having Hoka move back as soon as he creates the jutsu and then Mieko could create another rock shield and repeat the same. 
Rinjiro was actually surprised by this idea and asked, What exactly are you planning to defend from? Mieko and Hoka looked at Fujin, who replied, Um. A very strong jutsu? Rinjiro rebuked him saying, If an enemy uses a jutsu so strong that you need to do this, then you are out of your league and need to retreat. Also it's never a good idea to have everyone in the squad defending. Also, rock shield jutsu isn't the strongest defensive jutsu. There are many more who can do a much better job. For now, the combination of spinning shield of wind jutsu and one rock shield jutsu is enough. However, if you and Mieko want to learn rock shield jutsu, go for it. It's quite handy in combat. Fujin nodded and sighed internally, I guess too much defense isn't a good thing after all. He said, another idea we came up with is for Hoka to use stone shuriken jutsu and for me to control them using projectile control jutsu. Rinjiro nodded and said, that should work. Anything else? This time Mieko answered, Sensei, I came up with the idea of Fujin throwing his wind explosion jutsus within my fireball jutsu. So the range of the explosion of my fireball will be extended considerably. The winds caused by wind explosion jutsu's explosion will make the flames of fireball go in all the directions randomly. Rinjiro nodded again and said, that's a good idea. However, Fujin, you will have to make your wind explosion jutsu much stronger if you want to help Mieko pull this off. Fujin nodded and said, Yes, Sensei. Hoka suddenly said, Sensei, I too came up with an idea. My idea is to throw stone shurikens within Fujin's great breakthrough jutsu and Mieko's fireball jutsu. That way, more chaos can be created and the enemy will have to be careful of the stone shurikens within those jutsus too. Rinjiro replied, I see. I won't recommend throwing your stone shurikens within the fireball jutsu. If the enemy dodges the fireball, then your jutsu will be dodged too. And if the fireball jutsu hits the enemy, then it'll do sufficient damage by itself anyways. Hoka nodded. Seeing that none of the kids were speaking, Rinjiro asked, Any more ideas? All the kids shook their heads. Rinjiro replied, All right, that's sufficient for now. Begin practicing these combination jutsus. Fujin, make a shadow clone and have it practice the combination of stone shuriken jutsu and projectile control jutsu with Hoka. You and Mieko will practice together. The genins dispersed according to the instructions of their sensei. Rinjiro too made a couple of shadow clones to keep a watch on them. Hoka and Fujin's clone weren't going to be an issue, however Fujin and Mieko were sure to start a few fires. He had no doubts regarding that. Hoka and Fujin's shadow clone moved to a different spot. The clone moved to different trees and marked a large X on them. They looked at each other and nodded. Both made the hand signs. Hoka launched his stone shurikens towards the various XS Fujin had marked and the clone tried to control those shurikens to hit the marks. However, the first problem, which Fujin knew, occurred. Hoka looked at Fujin and said, so you really can control only nine shurikens. Fujin nodded and said, Yeah, just as I had said. And because these are stone shurikens and not as well made as a normal shuriken, controlling it is slightly more difficult. Anyways, let's try the second approach. Hoka nodded and launched stone shuriken jutsu again. This time, Fujin used projectile control jutsu to manipulate all the shurikens. He used it to change the direction of the shurikens towards the left. Hoka observed, this time all the shurikens changed direction. However, only three hit the mark, unlike sixteen last time. Fujin nodded and replied, yeah, if I try to control all the shurikens, I can only move them in one direction. So there's not much control on any one shuriken. In fact, it also messes up the aim you have taken. Suddenly Rinjiro's clone flickered behind Fujin and Hoka. One month of constant exposure to Rinjiro suddenly flickering behind them had made them accustomed to it. Rinjiro asked, So, which approach are you going to use and in which scenario? Hoka, you answer first. Hoka began thinking. After a couple of minutes he said, The first approach will be more useful if the number of enemies is less. The enemy will first have to dodge my initial aim, and then worry about the shuriken's Fujin controls. 
The second method will be more useful when we are facing a lot of enemies. Sudden change in direction of all shurikens can result in a few casualties. Also, even if the enemy avoids it, they'll need to pay more attention to it, giving us more time. Rinjiro nodded and looked at Fujin. Fujin replied, same answer. Just that, I should try and improve my control even further. In the first scenario, the result will probably be satisfactory. However, the second scenario still has a lot of scope for improvement. For instance, if, after I change direction of the shurikens, if I can then take control of a few shurikens to manipulate them even further, then I am sure I'll get some hits in and it won't be all just luck-based. Rinjiro said, good, so keep practicing. Over at Mieko and Fujin, they too had begun their practice. Their practice was very straightforward. Mieko launched fireball jutsu, and Fujin threw two wind spheres at them from the rear. The wind sphere distorted the flames a bit, but it wasn't an issue. However, before the fireball exploded, the wind spheres left the fireball from the front. The fireball exploded as it normally did. The wind spheres, however, exploded with a lot more force due to the air being heated up and caused a small heat wave. Mieko spoke in an annoying manner, Hey, your jutsu speed was too fast. Fujin countered, Yours was too slow. This earned him a glare from the little girl. Fujin shrugged and said, Let's try again. This time Fujin matched the timing properly, and both the jutsus exploded at the same time when the wind spheres were still in the fireball. The result was a bit surprising. Mieko said, The power of the explosion decreased. Fujin nodded and added, But its range increased. And the increase is totally random. In some directions, the flames extended twice more than usual, whereas in some directions, the range of flames was seven times as high as usual. Suddenly, a jet of water was launched to douse the fires caused by the explosion. Rinjiro's clone looked at them and said, We are changing the location. Follow me. Fujin and Mieko ran behind the clone. On the way, the clone asked, So, what are your thoughts on this jutsu? Fujin replied, Unpredictable. The enemy won't be able to guess the direction of the flames. If he gets careless, he'll end up with a few burns. Even if he is lucky or skilled enough to dodge them all, he'll be put under a lot of pressure. Mieko agreed, yes. Once he gets burned, we can dominate him. Rinjiro asked, any score for improvement? Fujin and Mieko began thinking. After a few seconds, Fujin replied, I am wondering whether the explosion's direction can be controlled. I think that the position of the wind spheres within the fireball is what controls the direction of the explosion. For example, if the wind spheres are to the front of the fireball, then maybe the flames move more in the forward direction. If I know the direction in which the enemy will dodge, I can place the wind spheres in an appropriate position so that the flames move to his new location. While Fujin was talking, Rinjiro stopped moving. They had arrived on a riverbank. Rinjiro thought, as expected. He replied, good. However, don't forget that even your wind explosion jutsu by itself is very random. So you won't be able to control the direction by yourself. He then looked at Mieko and said, if you two want to improve this combination further, then it'll depend on how well you can analyze the explosion with your Sharingdance, Mieko. Mieko nodded, yes sensei. I'll improve it to its limits. Rinjiro nodded and looked at the river. Fujin and Mieko followed his line of sight. Rinjiro said, All your explosions must happen over that river. No more fires. Both nodded awkwardly and continued their training. Chapter 45 First Mission Exactly one month had passed since Rinjiro had begun training his jinnins. After the morning workout and some rest, Rinjiro announced, Today, we'll do our first mission as a team. The squad reacted as soon as they heard that. Hoka said loudly, Finally. Mieko too excitedly said, Yes. Now I'll show what an Uchiha can do. Sensei, what'll be our first mission? Will we fight with any enemy villages? Like Kumo or IWA? Hoka quickly followed up, Yes, Sensei, what will our mission be? 
I want to use my taijutsu to show how strong Konoha is to our enemies. Fujin looked at them and saw, Whoa! Their eyes really are sparkling. I need to learn how to do that. Fujin just maintained an excited expression, but didn't say anything. His teammates' reactions made him feel very awkward. He thought, if only they knew what our first mission will be. I wonder if all the adults have an unspoken truce to not mention this to any kid. Is it because they don't want to discourage anyone, or is it just the age-old human behavior, I had to go through this, I want you to go through it too? Eh, probably the second case. Just looking at Renjiro's smug face says it all. Renjiro thought, ah, it never gets old. Seeing fresh Jinnins so enthusiastic about their first mission. Now, I wonder if that cat has gone missing again or not. He said, the mission will be given by Lord Hokage. So wait till we reach there to know which mission you'll be doing. They began moving towards the Hokage's office. Hoka and Mieko ran at a lot faster pace than usual. On the way, Fujin thought, I didn't think we'd need to wait one whole month before taking our first mission. Such intense training for a whole month. I guess my timing of transmigration was really lucky. Having missed the third war and Kurama's attack, and growing at a time when Konoha is lacking in manpower. I hope that training under Renjiro continues for a long time. Though it doesn't leave me with much free time, it has been very helpful in increasing my strength. The team arrived at the Hokage building and had to wait a few minutes to enter the Hokage's office. On entering the office, everyone respectfully greeted Hiruzen, Lord Hokage. Hiruzen, like always, had multiple stacks of papers on his table. He looked at Team 3 and said, Oh, so you guys are finally doing your first mission. He stared at Renjiro while saying that. However, Renjiro just shrugged and ignored the stare. Hiruzen sighed internally thinking, he messed up all the protocols. No missions for his squad for a whole month. The only other instance like this was when Orochimaru didn't make his squad do any missions at all for six months. Well, at least he agreed to take a few rank D missions unlike my student. He then looked at his assistant and asked, so which missions do we have? His assistant pulled a paper out and handed it to him. Hiruzen looked at it and said, Lady Sago wants a squad to weed her garden. This will be your mission. He then smiled kindly and said, do the job properly. Ensure that she gives us good feedback and make Kanoha proud. Hiruzen's words shocked Mieko and Hoka. Hoka was muttering softly, We, Adaga. Ride, N? Mieko too muttered something similar. Fujin was shocked too. However, it was for a different reason. He really admired Hiruzen now. He thought, Damn. He said that with such a straight face and with such a kind smile. Screw Danzo, this old man here is the real evil incarnate. It's no wonder that despite being so scheming and commanding such a strong force, Danzo never could do anything to Hiruzen. Poor guy never even had a chance. It almost makes me pity him. Renjiro saw his Jinnin's reactions and chuckled. He thought, it's a pity that the cat isn't missing right now. He grabbed the paper saw the address and said, follow me. The Jinnins followed him, however, this time Mieko and Hoko were moving very slowly. On reaching the estate, Renjiro asked the guard to call Lady Sago. Fujin observed the estate. It was huge! Mieko and Hoka didn't have much of a reaction as their clan estates were even larger. In a couple of minutes, a lady arrived. She was around 40 to 45 years old, five feet nine inches tall, had long blonde hair, looked very mature and carried herself in a proper manner. She greeted them, Welcome Lord Renjiro. It's a great honor to have you here. Renjiro nodded and handed her the paper. She then looked at the kids and said, So these strong ninjas will complete my missions. I am very fortunate to get ninjas as capable as you. Mieko and Hoka cheered up a bit on hearing the praise. However, Fujin could clearly understand that she was teasing them. He sighed internally, there is no need for this mission to be given to ninjas. The only reason why she did that is for her own amusement. Sigh, these rich old ladies need to get a better hobby. She said, follow me, 
I'll take you to the garden. Team Ranjiro followed her. They went behind the huge mansion. And soon, the three Jinnins were shocked. Lady Sago kindly said, This is the garden you have to weed. Fujin was speechless. The thought, Garden? How the fuck is this a garden? Who the fuck has a garden that is more than an acre in area? Hoka muttered, This is a garden? Mieko almost lashed out and yelled, How the hell is this a garden? This is. However, she was held in place by Renjiro. Lady Sago suddenly showed a sad face and said, I actually wanted it to be at least five acres. Sadly, that much land wasn't available in Kanoha. It, once again, left the Jinin speechless. Mieko was pissed even further. Renjiro just chuckled and said, That's enough talk. Get to work. The Jinins began walking forward. Mieko softly asked Fujin, Hey, can we use Fire Wind Dragon Jutsu? Hoka perked up on hearing that. Fujin, too, was very intrigued by that idea. Though he'd definitely not act upon it. However, Renjiro heard that and announced loudly, No using any elemental ninjutsu. No using any tools. And increase the pressure of your training seals, Mieko by 1%, Fujin by 2.5% and Hoka by 5%. Mieko hung her head and walked forward. Fujin said, let's divide the garden into three parts and clear each. Hoka and Mieko reluctantly nodded and got to work. Their muscles still ached from the morning workout. And they still had more work to do under higher pressure. While they were working, Lady Seijo returned to the mansion. She entered a balcony that faced the garden and asked her servants to arrange a chair, an umbrella, and a few snacks for her and Renjiro. She sat there monitoring the kids doing the work. That pissed the Jinins even more. Fujin muttered under his breath, first that Haruzan and now this lady. The Tao of Shamelessness is very 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 strong in this world. Weeding the garden continued. Fujin got done with his part in an hour and a half. He then returned to where Renjiro was. While he was returning, both Hoka and Mieko looked at him with angry gazes. He thought, should I help them out? After a few seconds he dismissed that thought, nope, there's no need to. He just ignored them and left the garden. He found a clean spot and sat down. Unfortunately for Fujin, Renjiro flickered behind him and said, until they are done, run around this estate. I want at least one round per minute. That nearly triggered him, what the fuck? It ain't my fault that I did the work faster. Luckily, he held it in, put his head down and began running. Each round was over a kilometer long. After fifteen minutes, Hoka joined him. Mieko worked for another half an hour. Both Fujin and Hoka were sure that she was delaying on purpose and sent her a few glares. When she was done, Fujin and Hoka stopped after completing that round and glared at Mieko. Mieko smirked thinking, serves you right for finishing before me. That smirk pissed Hoka, but Fujin just sighed and said, who would have thought that the mighty Uchiha would need two hours and fifteen minutes to merely weed a garden? Hoka quickly nodded and agreed, yes, this was so unexpected. Is this what she meant by I'll show what an Uchiha can do? That jibe made Mieko go red with anger and embarrassment. She was about to reply angrily when Renjiro stopped her. Lady Sago stepped forward and said, Thank you for clearing the weeds in my garden, young ninjas. You guys did an amazing job. This earned her a glare from all the three jinnins, but she maintained her smile. She then handed Renjiro a paper, and they left her estate. They returned to the Hokage building. Renjiro led his jinnins to a room on the first floor. He handed the paper to an employee there. The employee checked the paper, stamped and filed it. He then gave Renjiro a white packet. They left the room. Renjiro then led them to another room. There were a few more employees working here. One of them was a chinin, while the others were just normal civilians. Renjiro said, Remember this room. In future, if you ever want to take any missions, you can come here and ask the Chinin who is in charge here. He will assign you your mission depending on your preference, past performance, and ranks. 
The Jinnins nodded. They then moved to the ground floor. Rinjiro said, that's it for today. From now onwards, we'll be doing one mission every week. The remaining training continues as usual. Fujin, on the mission day, you won't have training in samurai saber techniques. Fujin nodded. Rinjiro then took out the white packet he had received earlier. He said, this is the reward for our mission. We'll be splitting it 40-20-20-20. 40% for me, and 20% for each one of you. When you do missions with others in future, remember that this is how the rewards are usually split. The leader gets more than the other squad members. The Jennings nodded, but all three had the same thought, but you didn't do any work at all sensei. However, no one spoke it out loud. After splitting the rewards, the squad dispersed. On his way to Yakiniku Q, Fujin thought, hmm, 10k real reward for a two hours job. If I had made clones and worked with them instead of my teammates, I'd have finished faster. Not bad, but not as fast as earning money by selling scrolls. Either way, getting 2k Rio per week would be much better than the 1k Rio per month they provided me earlier. Though it won't be enough to allow me to make as big a purchase as I did earlier. I wonder if I should do a lot of rank D missions in a day or two sometime later to show that I've earned money via legitimate means. Or, should I come clean with my ability to create storage scrolls? He thought for a bit and decided, no, right now Renjiro barely gives me any free time. If I say that I'll study Fuinjutsu in the evening, then that'll be considered suspicious or stupid. I should leave it till my training under Renjiro is completed or the training time is decreased. He is an elite Jounin after all. I don't think Kanoha can allow him to train three Jinnins for very long. While thinking, he had already reached the restaurant. He went in and made the order. While waiting for the food to be delivered, he thought this world is pretty dangerous. While initially I was just being cautious, I'm now glad that I was so cautious and kept most of my abilities hidden. Even ignoring the crazy strong abilities so many here have, just the mere shamelessness of these people is alarming. Hiruzen saying what he said with a straight face, Renjiro taking 40% of the reward, today's clients sitting on the balcony to enjoy the misery of little kids. The Tao of shamelessness is crazy strong in this world. Their skins are thicker than the Hokage monuments. The same will also apply to the enemies. Sigh, I hope Abito and Negato play according to the script. If they don't, then it'll be chaos. The meal arrived. Fujin picked up the meat with tongs and laid it on the charcoal brazier. Waiting for the meat to roast, he thought, well, no point in worrying about these things. There is nothing I can do about it anyways. Let's just hope for the best. Concluding his thoughts, he turned his focus on his lunch. Chapter 46, Triggered The next day, after the morning workout, Renjiro had another discussion with his team. He said, you have made good progress over the last month. So I'll now tell you how to progress further. The Jinnins nodded and listened attentively. Renjiro looked at Mieko and said, the jutsus you know currently are sufficient enough. So you don't need to learn any more ninjutsu. Just focus on mastering the ones you know currently. Especially fire release, for jutsu. In addition to ninjutsu, you also need to learn jinjutsu. So in your free time, ask your parents or clan elders to teach you more Sharingan-based jinjutsu. And keep working on your physique. You need to be able to complete the morning workout while enduring 10% pressure from your training seal. Mieko nodded and said, Yes, sensei. I'll work hard. He then looked at Fujin and asked, Have you decided on your second element? Fujin nodded and said, Yes, sensei, I have decided to choose Earth as my second element. Rinjiro nodded and asked, Any ideas on which jutsus you want to learn? Fujin replied, I've decided to learn Rock Shield Jutsu, Earth Instantaneous Body Jutsu and Earth Holding Jutsu. Rinjiro asked, Why? Fujin replied, Rock Shield Jutsu will provide me with a very good defense. Earth Instantaneous Body Jutsu is a movement jutsu. And I can use Earth Holding Jutsu to trap the enemies or keep me and my squad on the ground. 
Rinjiro thought for a few seconds and said, Rock Shield Jutsu will be good for you. But why do you want to learn Earth Instantaneous Body Jutsu? You already have two movement jutsus. Also, Earth Holding Jutsu is very slow to actually trap anyone capable enough. So it isn't very useful. So why do you still want to learn it? Fujin replied, Well there's no harm in learning more movement jutsu. Also, escaping through the ground will also provide a good defense as well as stealth. If the enemy isn't a sensor, it can also be used to sneak up on the enemy. As for Earth Holding Jutsu, my main aim is to split the enemy's attention and have him keep an eye on the ground. Especially if I can do it without hand signs. I also wonder if I can suppress its chakra signature to perform it very stealthily. If I can trap the enemy momentarily, it'll be enough for us to incapacitate him. Rinjiro thought, hmm, nice thinking once again. Though learning a third movement jutsu is wasteful even with his explanation. Rinjiro nodded and said, all right then. Rock shield jutsu you can learn by yourself. The remaining two will be learned under my supervision. In addition to these, we'll work on mastering the jutsus you already know. Finally, Rinjiro looked at Hoka and said, Hoka, your current status in ninjutsu is much better than before we began the training. However, it's still not enough. Hoka nodded and paid attention. Rinjiro continued, you will learn four more earth release jutsus. They will be boulder throw jutsu, quicksand jutsus, stone spear jutsu and earth instantaneous body jutsu. Boulder throw is a mid-range offensive jutsu. Quicksand is a trapping jutsu. Stone spear is a mid-range jutsu and earth instantaneous body is a movement jutsu. Hoka sighed and nodded. Rinjiro smiled and said, don't worry. These would be the only rank C jutsus, I'll force you to master. I will advise you to learn more in the future, however the decision is in your hands. Learning rank C water release jutsus will help you. In addition, once you have mastered these earth jutsus, you should learn two rank B earth release jutsus. The first is earth dragon jutsu, which will increase your capabilities in fighting a ranged battle. And earth wall jutsu, which is one of the best defensive jutsus in existence. They will complement your gentle fist style perfectly and you can then focus entirely on your taijutsu. Hoka showed a look of determination and replied, Yes, sensei. I'll master these ninjutsu. Rinjiro continued, In addition to your ninjutsu and taijutsu training, we will also focus on your jinjutsu training. He wanted to continue, however, Hoka's expression was a sight to see after hearing that. Rinjiro chuckled and continued, whether you learn Jinjutsu or not will be left for later. For now, I will teach you how to counter Jinjutsu. Rinjiro's chuckling and his gaze gained the attention of his students. Both Fujin and Nieko looked at Hoka and had a laugh. The training under Rinjiro continued. Over the next six weeks, Fujin and Hoka had got all the Jutsus down and were practicing to master them. Fujin could now do all the newly learned rank C jutsus with just one single hand seal. Rinjiro's instructions while learning earth release jutsus were much better as compared to wind release jutsus. He also had a more in-depth explanation regarding how chakra should be molded and how to do it faster. Due to this, Fujin's speed of learning earth release rank C jutsus was almost comparable to when he was learning wind release jutsus. The practice of combination jutsus too continued and they got much faster at performing them. For Jinjutsu, Rinjiro's clone started by casting rank D Jinjutsu on Hoka and Fujin. Within a couple of days, Fujin was able to break them. Rinjiro's clone then moved on to rank C Jinjutsu for him. He began breaking the rank C Jinjutsu in a couple of weeks and was currently working on breaking rank B Jinjutsu. Hoka needed a month before he could break rank D Jinjutsu. Fujin's swordplay too had come a long way. All the basics of samurai saber techniques were drilled into him by Rinjiro. They were now moving on the more advanced maneuvers. Rinjiro had informed him that after he got these advanced forms down, he'll teach the flying slashes. In these weeks, they had done six more rank D missions. It started with bathing the dogs in the Inazuka kennels. 
Rinjiro pranked his jinnins by telling them that they would have to clean all the excrement in the kennels, causing Mieko to flicker away, only to be caught by Rinjiro and carried over by the back of her neck. On hearing the real mission, the kid sighed in relief. The next one was finding the dreaded cat, who scratched Mieko's face all over and bit Hoka a couple of times. Fuji now understood why everyone struggled so much to catch the cat. It was a freaking ninja cat and was a master in sneaking and using diversions. Even with that, the mission wouldn't have been challenging, however, Rinjiro added a condition. The Jinnins weren't allowed to walk or run on the ground and were only allowed to run on the walls. If there weren't any walls, they had to create rock shields in order to create such a surface. It was followed by cleaning all the emergency shelters. Fujin figured that it was the village's way to make them remember all the shelters around Kanoha. After that, they had to deliver mail all over Kanoha to various clans and nobles. It was followed by babysitting a couple of Yamanaka kids. And lastly, they had to sow seeds in a farm. Observing his teammates, Fujin was sure that they were very close to completely triggering and making a scene. One difference Fujin noted was that after the first mission, the remaining missions weren't handed to them by Haruzen. They were instead collected from the mission room on the first floor of the Hokage Tower. Fujin thought, didn't Haruzen assign all the missions personally in Naruto? So why not for us? Or perhaps, why for them? He thought a bit and concluded, either he only assigns the first mission, or he assigned their missions due to their importance. Naruto was a Jinchuriki, Sasuke was the last Uchiha as well as the Uchiha heir. And Team 8 and 10 were entirely made of heirs of important clans in Konoha. I guess he had to take responsibility in ensuring their safety. One day, after the morning workout, Mieko asked Fujin and Hoka, Hey, I saw a few ninjas from other villages earlier. So the Chunin exams will be conducted soon. Do you think that we will participate too? That gained the attention of both her teammates. Hoka excitedly said, I hope we do. I would like to fight against the ninjas from other villages. Fujin thought, if I recall right, the squad needs to have completed eight missions before being eligible. I wonder if Renjiro planned this way so that our team won't be eligible for the exam and hence no one would pressurize him. Seeing Fujin in thought, Mieko asked, What are you thinking about? Fujin replied, I heard that Chunin exams have a lot of danger. So I really doubt they would allow us to participate so early. Mieko angrily replied, Hey! We are ready to take the risks. Hoka nodded and said, I agree. We are ninjas, how can we back down from a little risk? Fujin shook his head due to his teammate's naivety. He replied, Yeah, but we are still only babysitting and cleaning dust. That statement downed their moods. Soon they went on a mini rant and looked at Rinjiro begrudgingly when he appeared, causing him to raise an eyebrow and ask, What happened? Mieko and Hoka merely humped and looked in the other direction. Despite waiting for a few days, Rinjiro didn't inform them about the exam. The next day, Hoka informed his team, I heard that Teru and Yori will be participating in this exam. Fujin asked, Oh, didn't they participate earlier? This time, Mieko replied, No, Yori didn't participate in the earlier exams. Fujin nodded and said, I see, I guess we won't be participating in the exam until next year too. Right then Rinjiro appeared, and Mieko quickly asked him, Sensei, can we participate in the Chunin exam? Rinjiro shook his head and said, No, you guys aren't ready yet. Mieko replied, Why? We are very ready, Sensei. Rinjiro denied her again and said, I'll be the judge to decide that. No more questions. The next day, when they visited the mission room, the Chunin in charge searched for a mission and said, Team Rinjiro, your next mission is to babysit the newborn of Lord. However, he was cut. Mieko finally had enough. She yelled, Hey you! Why the hell do you always give us such lame missions? Which ninja babysits kids? Get a nanny to do that. The Chunin replied with authority, Brat, you are just a... However, he was again cut, this time by Hoka. He commented with a stoic face, I agree with Mieko. 
This is a mockery of our skills. Fujin observed Renjiro's reactions and saw that he was chuckling. He thought, I guess we are finally moving on to rank C missions. Oh well, I might as well say something then. The Chunin was pissed at being cut twice, he angrily began saying, Now listen you brats. I'm ma. Poor guy was cut again. Fujin commented, You know mister, in the last mission we were very worried that Mieko would burn the whole farm down. Even though Sensei can use water release jutsus, it would have still caused a lot of damage. I am really worried what will happen if you make us babysit a little kid today. The Chunin shuddered when he understood what Fujin was implying. Renjiro was very amused too. He thought, well I was planning on making them do a few more rank D missions. But if they are able to win a debate against a Chunin official, I won't mind starting to do rank C missions now. If Fujin knew that Renjiro didn't plan on taking rank C missions just yet, he'd have kicked himself for opening his mouth. As boring as rank D missions were, they took very little time and left a lot more time for training and didn't have any danger. The Chunin was left speechless and didn't know how to reply. He opened his mouth a couple of times, but didn't manage to say anything. He looked at Renjiro, who nodded his head. He relented and said, All right, let me search for a rank C mission for you. When he moved to grab the rank C mission file, Renjiro stated, Just pick out a few bandit clearing missions in the vicinity of the village. Would be preferable if the bandit bases are near each other. The Chunin nodded and searched his file. He soon took out four papers from the file and handed it to Renjiro. Renjiro read them. He then looked at his squad and said, We'll do our first rank C mission today. Meet me at the main gate in a couple of hours. Pack up for a week-long journey. The Jennings nodded and dispersed. Chapter 47 Raiding Bandits After leaving, Fujin went to his home and sat down in a meditative position. He thought, finally I am going out of this village. So what do I prepare? As per the protocol, the ration bars will be arranged by the squad leader. So food wouldn't be a concern. Though I suppose I should pack up the ration bars I have with me as well. Regarding the weapons, I still have the stock that the academy had provided us with. Though some of them are damaged. I guess I should buy 12 shurikens and 3 kanais. That'll cost me 7k Rio. I probably should buy a couple of explosion tags too. That'll be most of the money I earn for missions. Hmm? Yeah money, I need to carry all my money with me preferably. It can go in the spare waste bag. Of course I still carry the stock I had purchased earlier and always carry them with me. As for the swords, I guess they'll be hanging on my waist. Though I do have the wristbands, explaining where I got them will be troublesome. So I'll let them be in my spare waist bag. He then meditated for half an hour and then got packed up to leave the house. On his right leg, he had a leg pouch. It had six shurikens and two kanais. In addition, it also had 48 shurikens, six normal kanais and six kanais with explosion tags attached to them in the seals in it. On his waist, he carried his waist bag. He had eight shurikens, three kanais and a small scroll in it. The scroll contained basic items like rope, tape, wire, and first aid kit. The bag had seven storage seals on it. In one he had stored his spare waist bag and leg pouch. Another had his stock of ration bars. There was an additional first aid kit in one. The fourth seal stored a few bottles filled with drinking water in it. The remaining seals were left empty for now. He then visited a weapon shop to get the stuff he wanted to buy. After buying them, he visited Ichiraku for an early lunch. He then went to the main gate and sat on a branch of a nearby tree. Hoka and Mieko arrived around 15 minutes before the couple of hours were up. On arriving, they both spotted and approached Fujin. Fujin thought, wow, talk about being excited. Rinjiro arrived five minutes after them. Rinjiro asked, are you guys prepared? Everyone replied in sync. Yes, Sensei. Rinjiro then grabbed three scrolls from his bag and tossed one to each of his students. They began wondering, what's in the scroll? Rinjiro said, this is a gift from me to you guys. 
Each scroll contains 100 shurikens, 24 kanais, 6 giant shurikens, 12 explosion tags, and 60 packets of ration bars that will expire after 12 months. Fujin, your scroll has a couple of spare swords too, though they ain't as good as your current swords. I don't know what protocols they taught you, however, this is the least you should always carry with yourself while leading the village, irrespective of what you expect your team leader to carry. The kids were a bit shocked by this gift. Especially Fujin. His mind went blank for a second as he quickly calculated 100 minus 300 minus 100k. 24 minus 72 minus 72k. 6 minus 18 minus 54k. 12 minus 36 minus 27k. That's worth over 250k Rio. And that's without considering the swords and the ration bars. Was I wrong about him being shameless? Everyone quickly thanked Renjiro for the gift. Renjiro continued, Though I have gifted this to you, from here onwards, you'll be responsible for maintaining this stock. So don't waste them and refill them after you complete your mission. Of course don't be a miser with them. Your life and the mission is more important. All the three kids nodded. They then left the village. Rinjiro said, Our mission is to clear a few bandit bases around Shikuba town which is northwest of Kanoha. He then asked, Do you have your training seals activated? All the three kids nodded. Rinjiro said, Deactivate them. Never keep those training seals active outside Kanoha. You never know who is out there to kill you, and those seals could become the reason for your death. Fujin and Mieko nodded, but Hoka asked, But Sensei, can't you just protect us from any such danger? It seems a waste to not train our body during this journey. Rinjiro shook his head and said, There are many ninjas who are stronger than me in this world. And there are numerous hidden jutsus. Even I can't protect you from every sneak attack. It'll be up to you to dodge or block them. Hoka nodded and deactivated his seal. Rinjiro said, With that out of the way, let's run. We'll move in a kite formation. Fujin, you take the lead, Mieko on the right, Hoka on the left, and I'll take the rear. And move fast. Let's get there in a few hours. As soon as they received the instructions, they moved into the formation. Fujin stood ahead. Mieko stood two meters to his left and behind. Hoka did the same, but on the right side. Rinjiro stood around six meters behind Fujin. The squad then began moving at a high speed, while maintaining those distances. By 3 p.m., the team reached Shikuba town. On entering the town, Renjiro said, We'll do the mission tomorrow. For now, let's rest in an inn. The kids nodded and followed him. On the way Fujin noted, Hmm, this town feels a bit familiar. But I don't recall where I saw it. Was it shown in Naruto? Sigh. I barely remember any scenery now. Rinjiro led the squad in the town. Fujin, Hoka, and Mieko noticed that the town had a lot of inns. They also noticed a couple of gambling houses and an area that had lots of games with prizes for winners. However, Fujin noted a peculiarity. He observed, every game here is based on luck. No game requires any skills. I guess it makes sense though. Making games like that is just asking to loot themselves in this ninja world. Finally, Rinjiro entered an inn. Mieko thought, finally. After skipping past 13 inns. When Rinjiro began chatting with the innkeeper, Fujin noticed, oh, he seems very familiar with the innkeeper. Is that why we skipped so many inns? After discussing with the innkeeper, Rinjiro approached the trio. He handed each of them a key and said, these will be your rooms. Stay in the inn. I'll scout out a bit and return in a couple of hours. After Renjiro left, Mieko asked, So, what should we do now? Fujin sighed and commented, I'd have liked to tour this town. Sadly, he asked us to stay in the inn. Hoka added, Yeah, and we can't even train physically. Fujin said, Let's just retire to our rooms and meditate. Tomorrow will be our first instance of real combat. Everyone nodded and retired to their rooms to meditate and rest. Renjiro returned in the evening and took everyone out for dinner. Next day, 
At morning 8 a.m., the squad assembled outside Rangiro's room and moved out. Their first target was located around 25 kilometers to the west of the town. After reaching there, Fujin sensed something. He said, Sensei, I can sense six normal people around 400 meters ahead. Rinjiro nodded and said, There's a village in that direction. So it's probably the villagers. Our target is the bandits that are harassing that village. Rinjiro continued in that direction. Fujin soon noticed those six people he sensed were farming. They continued further and reached the village. On entering the village, Rinjiro asked around and then reached the village chief's house. The house was very old, and the man who opened the door was even older. As soon as the village chief saw the headbands, he respectfully invited everyone in and said, Welcome to our village lord. Rinjiro nodded and said, Just call me Rinjiro. He then handed a paper to the village chief. The village chief read the paper and became very happy. He bowed to Rinjiro and said, Thank you Lord Rinjiro for saving us from the bandits. After you deal with them, we can live peacefully once again. Rinjiro stated, I need more details about the bandits. The village chief nodded and replied, Please ask. I'll help you however I can. Rinjiro asked, Since when did the bandits begin harassing your village? The village chief answered, Around nine months back. Just before our harvest in the previous year. However, they became a lot more aggressive in the past couple of months. Rinjiro continued asking, I see. And what crimes have they committed? The village chief answered in a shaking voice, Initially, they just stole our crops and money. But recently, th. Fujin could see the village chief tearing up at this point. He continued, They killed nine villagers and kidnapped six young girls. They eve. He began sobbing and said, They even killed my son. And he began crying. Rinjiro was about to calm the old man down, however, the old village chief quickly controlled himself and showed a face of determination. Fujin was very surprised, he thought, admirable. To have this strong determination despite not being a ninja. Seeing the look of determination on the old man's face, even Rinjiro was impressed. He asked, how many bandits are there and from where do they attack you? The village chief replied, in their attack five days ago, there were over fifteen bandits. And they always approach us from the north. Rinjiro nodded and said, All right, thanks for giving us the information. Don't worry, we will deal with them. The village chief quickly thanked him. Rinjiro and the kids left the house. Mieko asked Rinjiro, So what now, Sensei? Do we begin our search in the north? Rinjiro nodded and answered, Yes, Fujin then asked, But Sensei, why will they attack from the direction their base is in? Won't they attack from a different direction just to confuse us? Rinjiro shook his head and replied, These are just common bandits. I doubt they have enough smarts to think about something like this. If they were smart enough, then they wouldn't have killed the villagers or kidnapped girls. They then moved towards the northern part of the village. They noticed that a few houses were burnt. Rinjiro commanded, Mieko, use your Sharingan to see if you can find any tracks they left behind. Mieko activated her Sharingan and began investigating. Soon she found a few tracks that were left behind. She said, Sensei, found them. Rinjiro nodded and said, Good work. Lead the way. Kite formation, with Mieko in the lead and me in the rear. Fujin, Hoka keep an eye on the surroundings and try to find those bandits. The squad followed Mieko. On the way, Fujin noticed a few trees that had sword cuts on them. After traveling around 3.5 kilometers to the north, Fujin said, Hoka, check 500 meters to the northwest. Hoka activated his Bikugan and soon said, Sensei, found them. Rinjiro nodded and the squad traveled in that direction. On reaching there, they saw that there was a small hill with a cave in it. On the entrance, there were two bandits guarding the entrance. Each had a sword with them. They were standing behind trees, so those bandits couldn't see them. Rinjiro sensed everything within the hill and said, So which one of you wants to handle this? Fujin quickly replied, Mi-sensei. 
Mieko and Hoka, who were just about to reply, glared at Fujin. Rinjiro nodded and said, No clones. And our mission is to eliminate them all. Fujin began sensing once again. In all, he could sense 23 people within the cave, including the two guards. He then looked at Hoka and asked, Hoka, could you take a look to see if there are any traps? Also, what is the layout of the cave? Hoka nodded and activated his Byakugan. After observing properly, he replied, In all, I see three traps. Two are behind the first entrance and the second entrance. They are basic arrow traps, which trigger when you step on the wire. The third is a small hole dug in front of the second entrance and has spikes in it. As for the layout, there is another entrance inside this outer entrance. Then there is a big room, which has three more mini caves in it. Fujin replied, All right, thanks. And is there anyone who has tried to hide his chakra? Hoka shook his head and Fujin thanked him. Chapter 48 The First Kill Fujin closed his eyes and calmed himself. He thought, Finally the time for my first kill. He then took a deep breath and let it out. He made a few hand signs and disappeared within the ground. On the entrance, the two bandits were very bored of keeping watch. One complained to the other, Why do we have to stand guard here? I wish we could just go and attack the village again and capture a few more girls. The second bandit laughed in a lecherous manner and replied, Yeah, the girls we captured a few days back were so fun. I can't wait to get my Han. However, his sentence was cut short. While he was talking, a sword appeared out of the ground and moved towards his waist, a sword enhanced by chakra flow. Before either of the bandits could notice, the sword cut through the waist of one bandit and split him in two. He died without even knowing how. The remaining bandit panicked. His arm subconsciously moved towards his sword. However, before he could even grab his sword, his head was separated from his body. After killing the two, Fujin again disappeared within the ground and entered the cave. The next two bandits were on guard in space between the entrance to the hill and another entrance which was located inside the hill. They were standing with their backs to the wall and facing each other. Fujin moved through the hill and pierced one bandit straight through his heart. The bandit opposite saw a sword coming out of the chest of the bandit in front of him. However, before he could shout for everyone's attention, a shuriken came straight at him and went through his throat, killing him on the spot. Fujin moved back through the ground again and avoided the hole the bandits had dug. He had now entered the main hideout of the bandit. He stealthily observed through a wall. He saw the three more mini caves that Hoka had mentioned. The place where he currently was had twelve bandits there. The remaining seven were in those three mini caves, which made him think, are they leaders or something? He then observed those twelve bandits carefully, for were sleeping in a corner. Two seemed to be working on something. One of them was looking at something intensely, whereas the other was sharpening his sword. The remaining six were drinking alcohol and playing cards. Fujin moved through the ground towards the bandit who was sharpening his sword. He appeared behind him and chopped his neck off. Even before his neck could fall on the ground, Fujin moved towards the bandit who was looking at a map. He stabbed a sword straight through his heart and pulled it out quickly. At this moment, the head and the sword of the earlier one dropped on the ground, creating a noise. This attracted the attention of the six who were drinking. Seeing the chopped head of their fellow bandit shocked and scared them. However, before they could make a move, Fujin had already flickered behind them. He quickly chopped two more heads off in one clean swing. He chopped another two beads off before they could even know what was happening. Only the last two bandits saw Fujin, however, they too were killed before they could do anything. Two of the six bandits had alcohol bottles in their hand, which crashed on the ground. The noise woke up two of the four sleeping bandits. One ignored the voice and just changed his sleeping position. The other, however, got up to see what was happening. However, even before he could completely open his eyes, his head was slashed off by Fujin. Quickly, Fujin also stabbed his sword in the throat of the guy who turned and followed by stabbing the hearts of the remaining two. 
He then disappeared in the ground again and entered one of the three mini caves. The first one had two bandits, who were quickly stabbed through their hearts. In the second cave, Fujin could sense three people. Fujin quickly moved in and stabbed the one who was resting along the wall through his heart. He quickly moved in to kill the second one who was laying on the ground. However, his sword stopped a few inches away from her chest. The one who was laying there was a teenage girl who was nude, bruised and bleeding from a lot of places. He quickly shifted his attention to the other person in the room. The young girl's appearance had disturbed Fujin, causing him to pause for half a second. This gave the bandit an opportunity to grab his sword and charge towards Fujin. Fujin just raised his left sword to block his sword and stabbed his other sword through the bandit's heart. He decided to move in the remaining mini-cave, but he heard a loud shout. The last bandit yelled, Bastards! Who is wasting my good wine? It do! However, his words stuck in his mouth when he saw the gore in his hideout. All he saw were chopped heads and the dead bodies of his bandits. He saw all the blood that was flowing on the ground. He was horrified and asked in a shaking voice, W.H. However, he never completed his question as a sword pierced through his heart from his back. Fujin pulled his sword out and created a shadow clone. The clone went out to report to Renjiro and to call him in. Whereas, he began cleaning the blood off his sword. Finally, while cleaning his sword, he looked up at the dead body lying in front of him as well as the twelve dead bodies in the hideout. The sight and the stench caused him to vomit immediately. He thought, damn, as I thought, the first kill was a big deal. I didn't feel anything while I was in the midst of killing them. But now! He vomited more and shivered at what he had done. As soon as he began vomiting, Renjiro's shadow clone popped out of the ground and asked, Are you fine? After Fujin was done vomiting, he nodded his head. He got up and sat in a corner. Renjiro said, It's all right. The first kill is always difficult. In the future, you'll have to kill a lot more. Fujin nodded. Renjiro said, Close your eyes and calm yourself. Fujin listened to Renjiro and closed his eyes and began clearing his mind. At that time, the clone reached Renjiro and reported the success of the mission to him. Renjiro then brought Hoka and Mieko to the cave. When they reached the entrance, Mieko and Hoka finally got a very clear view of the dead bodies and smelled the stench. Hoka resisted his urge to vomit, however, Mieko couldn't and she vomited on the spot. Renjiro saw that, However, he didn't say anything. Rinjiro used Earth Spear Jutsu to disable all the traps and said, Follow me. They followed him to the interior of the cave. Mieko and Hoka tried their best to ignore the two dead bodies there. However, after entering the main hideout and seeing the twelve dead bodies and a few heads, they couldn't bear it. Mieko vomited again and Hoka too vomited this time. Rinjiro waited for them and said, These are just dead bodies people who were killed by someone else. How will you become a ninja if you can't even stop yourself from vomiting? How will you become a ninja if merely this sight makes you drop to your knees? Those words forced Mieko and Hoka to toughen up and they stood up. Seeing that Rinjiro had calmed Hoka and Mieko, his clone dispelled. Rinjiro then brought Mieko and Hoka to the mini-cave where Fujin was. Sensing them, Fujin got up and looked at them. Rinjiro was impressed with Fujin. He thought, excellent. To gather himself and calm down so quickly after his first kill. He then looked at Mieko and Hoka who looked with determination and thought, these two should perform well too. Fujin said, Sensei, there's a girl in the cave besides this one. Rinjiro nodded and led his team there. The gruesome sight made the Jinnins wince their faces. The girl laid bare without any clothes. She was bleeding from her private parts. She had multiple sword cuts all over her body which were bleeding. On her left hand, two fingers were cut, and on her right leg, three toes were cut. There were even some burns on her. Even Renjiro sighed at that sight, he thought, I didn't want them to see something like this so early. Renjiro then said, Fujin, Hoka, wait outside this cave. Mieko, apply her first aid. 
Fujin and Hoka left the cave, while Mieko took out her first aid kit and began cleaning her wounds and applying bandages. Outside, Hoka asked Fujin, You all right? Fujin nodded and replied, I didn't think the first kill would be so hard to adjust to. Hoka sighed and said, I was warned repeatedly by my parents. There were a few ninjas, who after their first kill, couldn't even continue as ninjas. He then looked at the dead bodies and stated, You are strong, Fujin. Fujin smiled and said, Thanks. But you should prepare yourself. Tomorrow, or the day after, it'll be your turn. Hoka nodded grimly. It took Mieko around 25 minutes to fix the girl. Renjiro then carried her out. He then looked at the girl and said to his students, Ensure that you become very strong. So that such a misfortune doesn't befall you. The Jinens could hear an uncharacteristic sadness in Renjiro's voice. They all replied with determination, Yes, Sensei. After leaving the cave, Renjiro made a clone. The clone grabbed the two dead bodies outside the cave and tossed them inside. He then used earth wall jutsu to seal the entrance to the cave. Fujin asked, Sensei, don't we have to give any proof to the village chief about completing the mission? Renjiro shook his head and said, not on rank C missions that require elimination of bandits. Proof is required for assassination missions. If the heads of the bandits are given to the village, then more bandits will target the village in the future. Renjiro then said, let's go back to the village. On the way, Fujin asked, Sensei, have we eliminated all the bandits? What if there are any who weren't in this base? Renjiro shook his head and said, doubtful. You can sense up to half a kilometer and still didn't find anyone. Even if there are one or two outside, seeing that their fellow bandits are dead, they won't cause any more trouble for the village. Anyways, we were told that there were over 15 bandits, and we killed 22. That's more than enough for completing our mission. However, Mieko argued back, but Sensei, in that case, won't the criminals roam free? What if they were responsible for torturing this girl? What if they joined some other bandits and continued doing this? Rinjiro replied, our mission was to eliminate the bandit group harassing the village. Anything further isn't our responsibility. However, Mieko wasn't convinced and she glared at her sensei. Renjiro sighed and said, just killing off an entire bandit group doesn't mean that more won't appear. In a couple of years, another group will be formed. This isn't something you or I can change. So searching for any bandit not in the hideout is pointless. If they join some other group, they'll die when we get the mission to eliminate that group. Mieko was still unconvinced, but she stopped arguing. Fujin sighed internally thinking, no matter the world, the cruelty of humanity always exists. It's many times worse in this world than in my previous world. To torture and mutilate this girl for nothing but fun and amusement. I can't even imagine what they did to the other girls they kidnapped. He then glanced at Renjiro and thought, Kanoha. It is reputed to be a very peace-loving village. Led by a Kage who propagates peace. Of course, anyone with little brains can see that Kanoha is nowhere near as peace-loving as it claims to be. The mere existence of Root throws that claim in the trash. However, there's no denying that it still is more peace-loving than the other four great villages. Still it engages in such a practice. While it's true that finding other bandits will be a pain in the ass, it still won't be very difficult. Now these bandits will form a bandit group in the future and become its leaders. In the future, they'll again target this village, and the village will again send a mission to Kanoha. This cycle will ensure that this village will always need Kanoha's help and will always feel indebted to Kanoha. Similarly, every village in the Land of Fire will feel indebted to Kanoha. Thus, a pressure will be maintained on the daimyo to keep supporting and perhaps funding Kanoha. Such a simple way to maintain influence. It doesn't cost Kanoha anything, but costs dozens of lives to each of these villages. Sigh, if the most peace-loving village is so brutal and cruel, I wonder what a cruel village will be. He then let a breath of air out and thought, well whatever, it doesn't exactly concern me. Chapter 49, Consecutive Rank C Missions They soon reached the village. 
On entering the village, the girl on Renjiro's back got a few curious looks. The squad entered the village chief's house again and laid the girl down on a bed in his home. Renjiro said, she needs immediate medical care. The village chief nodded and went out to send someone to call the village doctor. At that moment, a middle-aged man came running towards the village chief house. On seeing the village chief, he quickly asked while sobbing, Chi. Chief, am my daughter? Is she? The village chief quickly calmed him and said, Yes, she's safe. Enter my home. He quickly ran to the house and rushed to his daughter. On seeing him running, Rinjiro stopped him and said, She's injured, don't hug her or hold her tightly. The man finally stopped and sat down next to the bed and began sobbing after seeing the bandages on his daughter. Soon a doctor arrived and began attending to her. The father and the village chief thanked Renjiro and the Jinnins again and again. After a few minutes, the village chief handed Renjiro a paper and the squad left the village and moved back to the town. After reaching the town, Renjiro said, Take today off. Explore this town. However, stick together. We'll meet in the same restaurant as yesterday's at 1 p.m. After he left, Hoka said, You know, because so much happened, I didn't notice that we completed the mission and returned back to this town in merely two hours. Mieko nodded. Fujin sighed and said, Yeah, and the actual fight didn't even last for a couple of minutes. Even though killing was hard to adjust to, the fight itself wasn't a challenge. Hearing that, Mieko asked for all the details. Hoka had already seen it all with his Bikugan, so he didn't ask for it. After giving out the details, Mieko felt a bit anticlimactic about the Rank C mission. Fujin chuckled and said, Next time you snap at that guy, force him to give us a Rank B mission. Hearing that, Mieko loudly replied, Hey, who snapped? This yell attracted the attention of nearby people and made Mieko go red with embarrassment. She thought for a bit and said, But yeah, I guess we should ask for Rank B missions. The kids then toured around the town. They tried some of the local food there and played a few games. At 1 p.m., they met up with Renjiro in the restaurant. After occupying the seats, Renjiro looked at Fujin and asked, So, how are you doing? Fujin said, I am doing fine, Sensei. Renjiro nodded satisfactorily and said, Good. You have handled your first kill very well. I am proud of you. He then looked at Mieko and Hoka and said, Next, it'll be your turn. Prepare yourselves. The two young ninjas nodded nervously. Lunch came and the team started eating. While they were eating, Mieko suddenly asked, Sensei, when can we do rank B missions? Rinjiro squinted his eyes and asked, What brought this on? Mieko said, We want to fight against the enemy ninjas. Just fighting bandits is not much fun. Rinjiro scoffed and said, You guys ain't ready. However, he saw Mieko's determined face. Knowing the trouble she'll cause, he quickly added, If you ask this again, or pester me for rank B missions, I'll make you do rank D missions for an entire year. This threat made Mieko quiet down quickly. Team Renjiro didn't do much for the rest of the day. The next morning, a similar procedure was followed. Team Renjiro was hiding in a bamboo forest while looking at the bandit hideout. The bandits had cleared out a small area and constructed three small huts and one medium-sized hut to serve as their base. The medium-sized hut was in the center, while the other three were around it. Fujin had sensed twelve people inside those huts. Renjiro asked, So, who wants this one? Mieko beat Hoka by saying, Me. Renjiro nodded and said, All right, we'll leave this hideout to you. Mieko began walking forward stealthily. But soon she stopped and returned. She looked at Hoka and asked, Hoka, do they have any hostages? Hoka checked and answered, No, all twelve seem to be bandits. Mieko asked, How many are there in each of the huts? Hoka answered, There are nine in the central hut, two in that hut, one in the hut on the right, and the last one is empty. Mieko nodded and used Earth Military Movement Jutsu to stealthily move forward. 
She stopped five meters away from the hut which had two bandits and appeared out of the ground. The bigger hut was exactly behind the small hut from where she was standing. She quickly made the hand signs, Fireball Jutsu. The fireball quickly moved through the smaller hut. As soon as it moved through it, two people screamed loudly. Since the fireball didn't explode, it just burnt them and didn't kill them right away. The fireball moved through the smaller hut to the bigger hut. It exploded right at the center of the bigger hut. The explosion completely demolished the hit. Fujin saw four bodies being thrown out due to the explosion. The explosion killed seven bandits on the spot. Two bandits, who were thrown out, were still alive and were screaming due to being on fire. The status of the two bandits in the smaller hut was the same. Due to the huts being made of bamboo and leaves, they offered no resistance to the fireball. Hearing the screams, the last remaining bandit got out of his hut, only to see two huts on fire. He looked around and saw one of his fellow bandits burning and screaming. The view horrified him. Before he could decide to do anything, Mieko flickered behind him and used fire release for Jutsu to produce a heat ray that stabbed him through the heart and killed him. Now that all the bandits were killed or incapacitated, Mieko looked around her. She saw the dead bodies on fire. She could smell the flesh burning and hear the dying screams from three bandits. That scene immediately made her vomit. Rinjiro quickly appeared behind her and consoled her. Fujin, having already killed, was able to look at this scene without much struggle. Hoka, however, struggled due to the smell and the screams. Soon the screams died down and all the bandits were dead. After giving Mieko a few minutes to adjust, Team Renjiro retreated from there. Before leaving, Renjiro buried the whole place underground using an earth release jutsu. The next day, Team Renjiro again repeated a similar mission. This time, the mission was to arrest the bandits. Hoka completed it by knocking out all the bandits and tying them up. However, Renjiro made Hoka kill two bandits so that he could get his first kill too. Renjiro gave the squad off on the fourth day. On the fifth morning, Renjiro said, Today will be our last mission. You three have done well. Let's move out. On the way he said, Today's bandit hideout will be much bigger. So you will have to cooperate with each other. The Jinnins nodded in agreement. Continuous drills for two and a half months had made their teamwork very good. And being there for each other when they made their first kill had brought them much closer. So working together wasn't an issue for any of them. On reaching the hideout, the Jinnins noticed that the entire hideout was actually underground. Fujin scanned the entire base. He said, There are 63 people I can sense. He then looked at Renjiro and said, and five have higher chakra levels. Though they are only Jin and level. Rinjiro nodded, whereas Mieko exclaimed cheerfully, Yes, finally we will fight ninjas. Fujin asked, But Sensei, aren't missions that involve ninjas ranked B? Rinjiro nodded his head and replied, Yeah, but they are only Jin and level. There are many cases of people outside the hidden villages unlocking their chakra and reaching Jin and level by themselves. There are also many cases of jinnins defecting from the village. Anyways, they are barely ninjas, and many times ranked C missions include dealing with them too. So be careful. After all, there are over a hundred thousand ninjas in the world, so who knows where one can be. The jinnins nodded. Fujin thought, hmm, this is unexpected. Though it makes sense I guess. If the village begins ranking missions as rank B for only a chance of having to deal with a rogue Jinnin, then rank C missions will probably not exist at all. The team began by first mapping the base. The base was quite big. There was one big room at the center of the hideout. Fujin suggested, let's call it the main room. There were three exits to the main room, all almost equidistant from each other. These exits were connected to one big corridor that surrounded the entire main room. On the other side of the passageway were many smaller rooms. Hoka commented, I guess they use the main room as a common room for planning, celebration, etc., while the smaller rooms are their personal rooms. There were a lot of traps all over the base, which were spotted by Hoka. Of the five ninjas, 
three were together in the main room, while the other two were in the smaller rooms. Mieko said, hmm, both the ninjas in the smaller rooms have their rooms very close to that exit from the main base. Fujin nodded and said, yeah, we will have to be careful while killing them. If they make a lot of sound, it'll alert everyone in the main room. The bandits too were all over the base. In all, there were four exits from the hideout to above the ground. One was located in the main room, while three were just outside the exits from the main room to the corridor. Fujin thought, this base is very well built. I wonder if it started with something small and was slowly expanded as the bandit group grew larger. Or, if the base is something that naturally existed and was just occupied by these bandits. Also, if we didn't destroy those bandit groups, would they have grown in this manner too? Fujin looked at his teammates and said, So first, we have to decide from where to attack them. Mieko replied, Let's just attack the main room. Most bandits are present there. Hoka nodded and added, Yeah, this way we'll deal with the majority of them in one blow, and we can then pick out the scattered bandits one by one. Fujin replied, Yeah, good idea. But if we do that, then the scattered bandits can try to escape. Hoka replied, Yeah, but we can just chase and kill them. Fujin replied, But it'll be very troublesome to hunt them all down one by one. Especially if all of them run in different directions. Also, by destroying the main room, the bandits in all the other rooms will be alerted, and the ninjas will be alerted too. Hoka thought a bit and nodded in agreement. Mieko asked, Then, what do you think? Fujin pointed in a direction and said, That room there is at one edge of the hideout. And also has one of the five ninjas there. Let's start with that room. We will sneak up on the ninja and kill him. Then we will clear the nearby rooms and slowly and stealthily head to the main room. This way, this direction will already be cleared when we destroy the main room. So killing them all will be much easier. Mieko and Hoka thought for a few seconds and agreed with the plan. The Jinnins then discussed the plan further and decided on the details. Once everything was planned, they checked their weapons and were about to begin their attack. But Mieko suddenly asked, Wait, who will kill the ninja? Hoka quickly replied, I'll kill him. Mieko rebuked him, Why you? I will kill the ninja. They then looked at Fujin. He said, My sword provides me with a longer range, I think I'll be more suited to killing him. However, neither Hoka nor Mieko agreed to that logic. The argument about the kill went on for a minute. Rinjiro observed his jinnins and sighed. Fujin then said, Well, all three of us can kill him. So let's just decide with rock, paper, scissors. On hearing that, both Hoka and Mieko looked at Fujin with a deadpan expression. Mieko said, That's so childish. We are ninjas. Fujin scoffed and asked, Well, do you two have any better ideas? Hoka and Mieko looked at each other. Not having any other idea, they reluctantly agreed. They soon got in the posture to play the game and began playing. Rinjiro now looked over with amusement. The first three rounds were tied. Fujin thought, this is fun. I guess that's why Goku and Vegeta did this so often. Mieko thought, I am not sure if I'll why. Wait! As the trio began the fourth round, Mieko's eyes suddenly turned red. She saw that both Fujin and Hoko were about to do rock, so she went with paper. And said, I win. Hoka quickly protested, Hey, no Sharingan. That's cheating. Mieko rebuked him, Well, there were no rules stating that we couldn't use Sharingans. Fujin, who just wanted to start the mission, chuckled and said, Well, she got us there. Remember to set the rules properly next time. Seeing that he didn't have Fujin's support, Hoka reluctantly agreed. They then looked at each other and nodded. All three made hand signs and disappeared within the ground. The bandit base, which was properly hidden and even well defended due to being underground, was about to feel the terror of being hunted by a squad in which every member could freely move underground. Chapter 50 Raid In the hideout, Hirota Masa was relaxing. He had joined the bandit group three years ago. 
he had already unlocked his chakra before joining the bandit group. When the leader of the bandits noticed him, he quickly recruited and trained him. Now he was one of the leaders of this group, and even had two subordinates who helped him in everything. As Hiroto Masa was relaxing in a good mood, a hand, with two fingers pointing out, popped from the ground. It headed towards his chest from his back and released a heat ray that penetrated his heart and killed him on the spot. At the same time, Fujin slashed the head off one bandit, and Hoka jabbed two fingers in the chest of the remaining bandit. The raid had begun. All three bandits died, without even making a sound. Fujin, Hoka, and Mieko looked at each other and nodded. They separated and headed towards the other rooms. In less than a minute, the rooms on this side were all cleared. They had assassinated sixteen bandits, including a ninja. They gathered together again and looked in the main room. The bandits there were still unaware of the calamity upon them. As decided, Fujina and Mieko split off in opposite directions and began clearing the rooms there. Hoka, on the other hand, stayed there and rigged the entrance to the main room with traps so that the bandits couldn't escape in this direction. He created quicksand at the entrances and also created a lot of rock spikes around the quicksand trap. The second ninja bandit was closer to Mieko's location than Fujin's location. Therefore, she was the first one to reach him after she had killed six more bandits. Even though Mieko was as stealthy as she could be, the ninja noticed that something was amiss and asked his two subordinates to be prepared. As soon as he saw Mieko, who was rushing towards him at a very high speed, he threw a few shurikens to disrupt her. Seeing her enemy throwing shurikens at her, Mieko thought, damn, they noticed. Mieko used her Sharingan to skillfully dodge the shurikens and thought, oh well, this makes it more fun. She quickly approached him. To maintain the stealth, she couldn't use any destructive fire release jutsus and had to close the distance to use fire release for jutsu. She soon reached the appropriate distance and used her jutsu. Her right hand was stretched out, with her middle and index finger pointing towards the rogue ninja's heart and released the ray. Though the rogue ninja didn't know the jutsu Mieko was planning to use, her outstretched fingers warned him and he quickly moved backwards. Mieko followed, but the ninja hid behind one of his subordinates. Mieko screamed internally, cowered, and changed her target. She focused the heat ray on the subordinate and killed him. However, the rogue ninja used this opportunity to throw three shurikens on Mieko. Mieko had to dodge quickly due to the small distance. She barely managed to dodge at the last moment. She recovered and was about to continue her attack when a sword pierced through the heart of the ninja from his back. This annoyed Mieko as Fujin had stolen her kill. She said angrily, I could have killed him by mice. But a loud scream interrupted her. Seeing his boss getting stabbed through his heart shocked the remaining bandit. And he yelled in terror. Realizing her mistake, Mieko quickly threw a kunai at the bandit and killed him. Fujin ignored Mieko and focused on the main room. The battle had already created enough noise to attract some attention. And the loud scream had got the attention of all the bandits in the hideout. Fujin sighed and said, You weren't stealthy enough. Mieko snorted and replied, Well, it doesn't matter anymore. She began making hand signs. Fujin flickered next to her and made a hand sign too. At the same time, they released their jutsu, Fire Wind Dragon Jutsu. In the main room, the bandits were busy with sorting their recent loot. Some of the bandits had heard some noises from the side where Mieko was killing the bandits. However, it was mostly ignored by them. But soon, a loud scream attracted everyone's attention. The three remaining rogue ninjas too were on alert. One of them directed two bandits to go in and check what was happening. Those two carefully moved towards the exit in that direction. However, right before reaching there, they suddenly felt a lot of heat. But before they could do anything, a dragon head, made of fire, entered the room and engulfed them. They immediately began screaming in pain. The dragon quickly entered the room completely. The sight of a dragon made of fire scared the bandit stiff. The dragon began spitting wind explosion jutsus all over the room. Seeing that, 
one bandit quickly made hand signs and slammed his hands on the ground, causing a rock shield to be created in front of him. Some of the nearby bandits quickly ran behind that shield. The wind explosion jutsus hit seven bandits head on. The winds created by the explosion slashed the throats of two bandits, killing them on spot. However, they were much luckier than the ones who didn't die. For the remaining five, the winds created small cuts all on their body. As it was a combination jutsu, the wind was incredibly hot. So, along with the cuts, it also caused low-level burns on those bandits. And it was incredibly painful when their cuts were exposed to that hot air. One of those five bandits was even more unlucky as he didn't shut his eyes. It resulted in a lot of hot air bombarding his eyes, causing them to burn up. So though the jutsu didn't kill them, they were scarred and in immense pain. Even the bandits nearby were harmed by the hot wind slashes. However, they could still fight or run. The attack caused panic among the bandits. Three bandits quickly tried to escape out of the base. They rushed towards the ladder and began climbing it. Unfortunately for them, Hoka was standing just above the exit. Hoka waited for all the three bandits to be on the ladder and then made a few hand signs, stone spear jutsu. From the walls around the ladder, dozens of spears began appearing. They stabbed all the three bandits on the ladder, killing them on spot. It also blocked the access to the ladder for the remaining bandits. Two bandits ran towards the area which was cleared by Fujin earlier. On sensing the bandits running in that direction, Fujin made a hand sign and waited. As soon as the bandits exited the main room, Fujin exploded the explosion tag he had planted there. That caused the rocks from the ceiling to fall down and crush those bandits. It also sealed that exit. Five bandits ran towards the room where Hiroto Masa was supposed to be. However, as soon as they exited the main room, they fell straight into the quicksand trap. The quicksand Hoka had created had a depth of four meters and had covered the entire entrance. All five bandits were trapped there and were slowly sinking in. Eleven bandits were hiding behind the rock shield created by their leader and eight were still trying to escape in the directions of their fellow bandits. However, they stopped in their tracks after seeing what happened to them. Fujin used this opportunity to make the dragon bombard them with three wind explosion jutsus, injuring all eight of them to a certain degree. The dragon then circled around to get a clear shot at the bandits hiding behind the rock. The leader quickly made another rock shield. Sadly for him, Fujin and Mieko had anticipated it. Instead of bombarding, the dragon circled around more and launched two wind explosion jutsus in such a manner that they couldn't escape from there. They were surrounded by the rock shields on two sides and wind explosion jutsus on the remaining two sides. Only the three ninjas managed to jump and move to the other side of the rock shields. The remaining bandits were trapped and took minor injuries. The dragon then moved forward and engulfed all of those bandits. It set all the eight bandits on fire, but also caused the fire wind dragon to dissipate. This assault had incapacitated all the bandits in the hideout, with the exception of the three ninjas. Two among them were novices with no actual experience beyond their banditry. Only the leader had a bit of experience as he was once a jinin in the Kusagakure. He had noticed that the jutsu was about to dissipate and said, Hurry and follow me. He led the remaining two to the entrance from where the dragon had come in. However, on entering, he didn't see anyone there. Instead, he saw the dead body of his fellow bandits and one of his ninjas. Seeing him dead alarmed him and he became much more cautious. He said, Be careful they might still be around. Let's look for them, Toge. Suddenly he jumped up and looked below. The ground had moved and wanted to trap his feet in it. Even though he dodged, Fujin smirked underground, got them. He had trapped the other two bandits. Mieko saw that and appeared at the entrance. She quickly made hand signs, fireball jutsu. The trapped bandits couldn't dodge and were caught in the explosion. Only the leader managed to dodge. He saw his last two bandits burning with disbelief, it's all over. I need to escape. He quickly began running away. However, Fujin stealthily launched a shuriken enhanced with chakra flow at his left leg. Distracted by fear and the urgency to escape, 
the bandit leader didn't notice it. The shuriken hit his left leg from behind and cut through it like a hot knife through butter. Suddenly losing his left leg made him fall down and cry in pain. Fujin then used body flicker jutsu to appear right above him and stab a sword through his heart. The bandit leader died with despair on his face. Fujin looked at Mieko and said, Looks like this is over. Mieko asked, Aren't there a few still alive back in the main room? Fujin chuckled and said, Not anymore and began walking towards the main room. Mieko followed him. In the main room, Hoka had already killed all the bandits who were still alive from the Fire Wind Dragon's assault. At that moment, Rinjiro too appeared within the main room. He thought, not bad, they killed every last one of them. And they have adjusted to killing well. He said, good work. This mission is successfully completed. He then looked at his team and said, it's good to see you guys being able to handle the killing very well. The kids nodded. Even though they were still repulsed by the gore around them, they could handle themselves without vomiting. Rinjiro then led his team out of the hideout. He then made the hand seal for an earth release jutsu. Fujin quickly stopped him by asking, Sensei, isn't it a waste to destroy such a good base? The sudden question stopped Rinjiro from destroying the underground base. He asked, What do you mean? Fujin replied, Can't we use this base for our own ninjas? Rinjiro asked, And how will our ninjas use this base? Fujin thought for a few seconds and replied, Well, they could use it as a base during war. Or they could use it as a temporary resting place or perhaps create an underground supply depot. Rinjiro shook his head and said, The closest hidden village from here is Kusa. And they are allied with us. Even if they weren't, they can't penetrate this deep into the fire country. If there is any threat, then it'll be IWA which is beyond Kusa. However, if they are able to penetrate this deep into the land of fire, then that base will be useless anyways as the majority of the IWA ninjas are masters of earth release jutsus. They'll just bury all the troops underground. As for supply depots and resting places, there are already sufficient numbers of them. So it is unnecessary too. Fujin fell in thoughts and realized, yeah, that makes sense. Kanoha has been around for decades. Surely their infrastructure would be top-notch by now. And surely they'd have identified all the bases over the land of fire. He then nodded to Renjiro, who destroyed the entire hideout. On the way back to the town, Mieko asked, Sensei, were they really ninjas? Only one of them used any ninjutsu, and even that was only a rank E jutsu. They couldn't put up a fight at all. Renjiro answered, they were just common bandits who had unlocked Chakra by accident or luck. Only their leader was probably a former ninja gone rogue. However, he too barely had any proper training. So it wasn't a surprise that he wasn't a match for you guys, who are being trained by me. Hoka asked in excitement, Sensei, aren't there bounties on rogue ninjas? Rinjiro shook his head and replied, only if they are very famous. Someone who barely qualifies as a jinnin won't have any bounty at all. That drowned Hoka's excitement. He continued following the squad with his shoulders dropped. Mieko, who was still stuck on how weak her enemies were, asked, Sensei, when can we fight real ninjas then? Rinjiro turned his head and stared at her. He thought, nice way of indirectly asking me for rank B missions. On noticing that Rinjiro had noticed her thoughts, Mieko was embarrassed but she didn't allow that embarrassment to appear on her face. Fujin noticed that and thought, damn, these ninjas are born shameless. Rinjiro smirked and answered, after you have captured that cat a hundred times. That answer drained the color off Mieko's face. Hoka glared at her. While Fujin chuckled thinking, I guess no one can compete with the older generation in shamelessness. Mieko then began apologizing to Rinjiro and began a funny banter. Sadly for her, she was no match for Renjiro. 862 Chapter 51 Clash in Forest of Death Team Renjiro rested in the town for the day. Next morning, they left the town to return to Kanoha. On arriving, they went to the Hokage Tower to turn in the missions. 
Rinjiro handed the papers to the chunin responsible for checking them. After checking, he handed four packets to Rinjiro. The four missions combined paid them 280k. After Rinjiro divided them, each of the three kids got 56k. Fujin thought, 280k just for these missions? I'm pretty sure I could have completed them solo and in under a day. It's much faster than Fuinjutsu. Though it has some risks, if a strong ninja is hiding among the bandits. Anyways, I should be able to collect enough for a sword made from chakra metal pretty quickly if I take a lot of missions. Unlike Fujin, Mieko, and Hoka didn't concern themselves much with the money. Thanks to having rather rich parents, they never had to worry or think about money. After the division of money, Rinjiro dismissed them and said, tomorrow there won't be any training. We begin our training the day after tomorrow at the same time as usual. The kids nodded and dispersed. Since it was lunchtime, Fujin decided to head to Ichiraku. On the way, Fujin thought, seven rank D missions and four rank C missions. Isn't the requirement for Chunin exam just eight missions? I wonder when Rinjiro will make us take the exam. Will it be the next round, or will it be like Teru's squad? Thinking about Teru created new thoughts in Fujin's mind, yeah, isn't Teru's squad participating in the Chunin exam? I wonder what has happened with that. Did the Chunin exams already start, or is there still some time? This question resulted in Fujin realizing something very critical. He thought, now that I think about it, I am really clueless in regards to what is happening around me. Other than what I remember will happen in the future, I have no idea what is exactly happening. I need some means of gathering information. But, how to do it? He thought for a bit and decided, well, the least I should do is start getting newspapers delivered to my home. Though it won't contain any crucial information, it'll still keep me updated. Apart from that, I should probably make my own information gathering network. While I don't think I'd be able to make something as complex as what Jiraiya has, I don't really need it to be that good either. Just getting unfiltered and timely news would be sufficient. Oh well, I'll leave this for the future too. It'll take a lot of effort, time and money to actually create it. Right now, I barely have any money or free time anyway. His thoughts were cut by a loud shout. He heard, old man. Three miso ramens for me. Fujin turned right and noticed, eh, Naruto? I didn't even notice reaching at Chiraku. But considering that Naruto is here. Fujin then focused on sensing his surroundings. After sensing, he thought, as I thought. Two umbus are hiding nearby. Or perhaps one umbu and one root. I doubt Danzo wouldn't keep his eye on the lone Jinchuriki of Kanoha. He then released a sigh and thought, well, as much as I'd like to meet him now, it'll probably create a lot of deviations in the future. Not to mention that it'll also gain the attention of both Haruzen and Danzo. I'll leave this meeting for the future. At least until the time I can calculate and control those deviations. And until I'm strong enough to at least face these two umbus in case they have some stupid ideas. Sigh, this means I'll have to go to a different restaurant. Fujin then moved in the direction of a nearby sushi restaurant. After lunch, he searched for a newspaper stand near his house and bought a subscription. With the rank C missions completed, Team Ranjiro got back to their training. A week's rest suddenly made the morning workout seem much more difficult. When Ranjiro returned after the team's break was over, Mieko asked, Sensei, when can we go on the next mission? Hoka looked over with interest. Rinjiro replied casually, Rank C missions take a lot longer time than Rank D missions. So we'll only do one monthly. Rest of the time will be focused on your training. Mieko's shoulders slumped on hearing that. It meant that there was no escape from this deadly training. At the same time as Fujin and his teammates were training, two Jinin squads faced each other deep within a forest. Both squads consisted of three boys. However, one squad only had 10 to 11 years old Jinnins, while the other squad had three Jinnins who were almost 17 years old. The younger squad was from Kanoha, while the older squad was from Kusa. Yori looked at his opponents. They were much older than him, but he wasn't worried. 
After all, they weren't Uchiha's. Yokota Minoru, one of the Kusajinans, said arrogantly, looks like we are in luck. Kanoha sent little babies for the exam. Yokota Yoshiaki chuckled and added, why don't you little kids hand us your scroll and run to your mommies? The comments riled Yori up. He angrily said, why you? I'll show you the might of a. However, he was cut short by his teammate. Hataki Kane said, calm down, they're just trying to rile you. Tamaya Takahiko started laughing and replied, oh, we aren't. We are just stating the truth. Tara sighed and said, they really are arrogant. Kane chucked and added, especially considering that they are still only Jinnins despite being so old. Takahiko replied, old eh? I'll show you. He quickly began making hand signs. However, Hoka slammed his hands on the ground and shouted, too late. As soon as Terras slammed his hands on the ground, stone spears began appearing from the ground and completely surrounded the Kusa squad. Seeing their predicament, Kusanin stopped their hand signs and quickly jumped high towards nearby trees. Yuri, who was already making hand signs, thought, got them, and launched Phoenix Sage Fire Jutsu. Seeing the balls of fire heading towards them, Minoru and Yoshiaki quickly made hand signs, Water Shield Jutsu. On completing the hand signs, a shield of water began forming between the Kusa Jinnins and the Fire Jutsu. The shield was completely formed in the nick of time and managed to protect them from the fire. However, Terra used this opportunity to launch the stone spears at the airborne Kusa Jinnins. The stone spears easily penetrated the water shield, forcing the Kusa Jinnins to use a kunai to block the spears and direct themselves to land properly on nearby trees. As soon as they landed on the trees, they began making hand signs. However, before they could complete their jutsu, a tanto appeared behind Yoshiaki and stabbed through his heart. Kane, who had appeared behind Yoshiaki, whispered, Game over. He pulled his tanto out, and a lifeless body fell from the tree. Seeing their teammate die was very shocking for the Kusa Jinnins. Especially for Minoru, who was his cousin. He yelled, I'm going to kill you. Seeing Minoru lose his calm alarmed Takahiko. He quickly shouted, Minoru, wait. However, the shout fell on deaf ears. Minoru completed his hand signs, Water Pallet Jutsu. He launched the water pallet straight at Kane. However, Kane simply moved behind the trees, completely avoiding the attack. Seeing his attack missing enraged Minoru even further. He jumped towards Kane. Sensing the opening, Teru quickly made hand signs. Seeing Teru preparing a jutsu, Takahiko completed his hand signs and launched a water pallet straight at Teru. But Yori noticed it and thought, not on my watch. He quickly launched fireball jutsu to intercept the water pallet. At the same time, Teru launched a water pallet straight at Minoru. The jutsu hit Minoru on his left ribcage and knocked him off course. Seeing his teammate at a disadvantage, Takahiko wanted to rush towards him. However, he was intercepted by Yori and Teru. They engaged him in a fight and didn't allow him to move towards Minoru. The water pallet hurt Minoru badly, however he gritted his teeth and fought through the pain. He grabbed a kunai and continued moving towards Kane. On closing the distance, he attacked with his kunai. Kane raised his tanto to block the attack. Though Minoru attacked with a lot of force, as soon as the kunai and tanto clashed, an electric current passed through the kunai and hit him. Though not deadly, it was very painful, and Minoru had to take his hand off the kunai. Kane smirked and thought, current transfer jutsu. Always works. He just stepped forward and slashed his tanto at Minoru's neck. Minoru, who was blinded by rage, in immense pain due to the damaged ribs and still feeling the electric current, couldn't dodge and the slash went straight across his throat. His throat split open, causing blood to sprout out from it. He looked at Kane with unwillingness in his eyes. Sadly, he couldn't even control his body anymore and fell down, dead. At the same time, Takahiko was engaged against Teru and Yori. After exchanging a few blows, Yori closed the distance and launched Fireball Jutsu. Knowing that Takahiko will dodge, Terra threw shurikens in such a manner that Takahiko couldn't dodge the fireball. 
Not having any option, Takehiko used Water Shield Jutsu to defend. On seeing the Water Shield, Terra thought, all three have water affinity? Well, sucks to be them. He quickly made a hand sign and slammed his hands on the ground. At that moment, the fireball had engulfed the water shield. However, Takehiko was completely safe due to the shield. Sadly for him, at that very moment, a stone spear appeared from the ground. It easily penetrated the water shield and headed towards Takehiko. The spear alarmed him. He grabbed a kunai and attempted to block the spear. But the spear pushed him backwards, throwing him out of his water shield and into the fireball, burning him alive. On seeing him die, Terra sighed in relief. He said, All done. Yori nodded and said, Yeah, that was easier than expected. Terra chuckled and said, Yeah. Let's just hope that this guy wasn't carrying the scroll. Yori looked at Teru with confusion. But he quickly realized and cursed, Damn. That scroll will be ashes if he has it. At that time Kane appeared from behind. He said, no need to worry. The crazy guy had it. He then tossed the scroll slightly in the air and commented, We were very lucky. Such a weak team, and had the scroll we needed. Terry said, Cool, got the earth scroll. Let's head towards the tower. Yuri objected and said, That'll be boring. Why not just try to eliminate the weaker teams in the forest? That way the competition will be lesser in the next rounds. Kane shook his head and said, It doesn't matter. This forest will eliminate the weak teams anyway. Terra nodded and agreed, Yeah. Not to mention, the more time we spend in the forest, the more teams will set up traps near the tower. And if a team is weak enough to be eliminated by us in this round, then we will be able to do the same in the next round too. Seeing that both his teammates opposed his idea, Yori relented and accompanied his team to the tower. Chapter 52, Up a Few Notches After the mission ended, Renjiro continued the training of his students. One day, when the training was about to end, Renjiro observed his three students. He smiled seeing them, with a bit of pride. He thought, these three have turned out to be quite good. I'll be surprised if any of them aren't promoted to Jaonin before they turn 16. I suppose they do deserve some praise from their sensei. The training was completed soon and the Jinnins were about to leave when Renjiro stopped them. He said, three months earlier, I accepted to be the Jaonin sensei of your squad. Do you recall what I told you then? Fujin, Hoka, and Mieko all shake their heads. Hoka asked, what did you say sensei? Renjiro sighed and said, you guys are on a probation period, remember? Understanding that Renjiro just wanted to make it official, Fujin tilted his head and asked, What probation period sensei? Mieko, do you remember any? Mieko understood him and tilted her head too, Nope, don't remember. Any idea Hoka? Hoka too tilted his head and said, Nope. No idea what you're talking about sensei. Renjiro's face goes completely dark, looking at the perfect poker face maintained by his three students. Seeing his reaction, the three Jinnins couldn't help but laugh out loud. Renjiro finally gives up on the antics of his students. He composed himself and said, You guys have paw. However, Hoka cuts him off and says, We already know Sensei. And the three Jinnins flicker away, leaving their Sensei completely dumbfounded. Renjiro smiled bitterly and muttered to himself, I really need to have a word with the one who suggested I put the top squad of the year on probation. It had been four weeks since they had been officially made Jinnins. Fujin, Hoka, and Mieko were resting under a tree after the morning workout. Mieko started the conversation by saying, The final round of the Chunin exams will be tomorrow. Mieko nodded and said, Yeah, two of my classmates will be participating in the fight tomorrow. Mieko continued, Yeah, I want to see Yori's fight. I wonder if Sensei would allow us to see the fights. Fujin chuckled and said, Good luck asking Sensei for a holiday. On hearing that, Mieko looked at Fujin with an annoyed expression. Fujin ignored that and thought, That said, it won't be a bad thing to see how much Teru and Yori have progressed. 
They have been jinnin for a year longer than me. After the break, Renjiro appeared and gathered his squad. On seeing him, Mieko quickly wanted to ask him permission to watch the next day's fights. However, Renjiro stopped her and said, We'll be taking another mission. We will leave tomorrow at 9 a.m. Mieko quickly asked, Sensei, can't we take the mission a couple of days later? Renjiro squinted his eyes and asked, Why? She replied, Sensei, we were wondering if we could watch the Chunin exams that will be held tomorrow. Renjiro, with the same expression, asked the same thing again, Why? Mieko put up a diligent expression and answered seriously, We want to observe the tactics, strategies, and jutsus that ninjas from our neighboring villages use. That way we will be more prepared when we have to fight them. Fujin chuckled internally at the answer. Renjiro didn't forbid any ideas they had. Just that, he required a solid reason to agree to them. That was why Mieko prepared such an answer. Renjiro dismissively waved his hands and said, It's merely Jinin's fighting. You won't learn much. He then looked at his squad and said, Let's get back to training. Mieko slumped her shoulders in disappointment. Fujin thought, that's a bit surprising. I thought he would agree with that reasoning. Well, whatever, it doesn't matter much. The next day, Team Renjiro accepted the mission to accompany a merchant carvin to the land of rivers. The mission was very uneventful with only one small bandit group trying to assault the carvin. It took nine days to reach the land of rivers and the return journey took another day. The squad returned to Kanoha around midnight. After completing the formalities, Renjiro dismissed the squad. Fujin, on returning home, saw a bunch of newspapers lying outside his door. He picked them up and went inside. He made a couple of shadow clones to go through the papers while he went for a bath. The clones went through the papers briefly and dispelled themselves. On receiving all the information, Fujin thought, I see, both Teru and Yuri became Chunin. A bit surprising, but I guess Kanoha is still trying to increase the number of Chunins and Jounins. Well, I suppose my promotion too should happen in my first attempt then. Not having much to do for the remaining day, Fujin decided to brush up on his few Injutsu. He made three clones, and all four together created all the seals that they knew. While revising his few Injutsu knowledge, Fujin began reviewing his progress over the last few months. He analyzed, It's been four months since I graduated. The progress has honestly been phenomenal. I really underestimated the effect of having a dedicated elite Jounin guiding you. Then again, I never expected that we'd be taught this well. My chakra reserves have almost doubled. The amount of pressure I can handle from my training seal is up to 18%. Despite not training, I can now sense up to a kilometer away. Taijutsu too has improved a lot due to constant sparring. And undoubtedly, my ninjutsu and kinjutsu have improved the most. I can now use chakra flow on my sword with ease. I really want to get into an all-out fight to test my power. I wonder if I'll get any such chance soon. The next day, at 4.45 a.m., Fujin arrived at the training ground. Mieko and Hoko were already there. Seeing them, Fujin asked, Yo, ready for another three to four weeks of hardcore training? Mieko's shoulders dropped and she replied, I'd rather go on missions. Fujin and Hoka chuckled looking at her reactions. Four months of training together and two long missions outside the village had improved the relationship between the three a lot. Their teamwork was also very good. Though it still needs to be tested against a proper ninja team. At five, Rinjiro flickered in front of his team. Seeing his team is ready to begin their morning workout, he nodded internally. However, knowing what was to come, he couldn't help smirking a bit. Seeing that smirk instantly made his jinnins very worried. Fujin thought, okay, what now? Rinjiro started by saying, in the last four months, I have drilled all the basic formations into you. You'll use these formations even when you become jinnins. The team calmed down after hearing this. Fujin thought, finally. No more boring training sessions on team formations. But why is he smirking? He won't become kind all of a sudden. Rinjiro continued, so, from now on, 
I'll be entirely focusing on increasing your capabilities. So the training will go up a few notches. Hearing that all the three Jinans were stunned, Mieko freaked out, a few notches? Fujin was also sweating a bit, doesn't he already make us exert our 100%? Hoka too wondered how intense a few notches would be. Chapter 53, Senjutai Jutsu Style Rinjiro just chuckled at their expressions and said, First, we are going to increase the pressure applied by the training seals. What are the pressures you are using right now? Mieko replied, 3%. Hoka, 38%. Fujin, 18.5%. A slash in, Fujin's seal has twice the upper limit as compared to the other two. So it's just barely below Hoka's. Rinjiro nodded and said, Good. Mieko, you'll increase it to 5%. Hoka to 45%. Fujin to 22%. The Jinans follow the instructions of their sensei. After increasing the pressure, Rinjiro began the morning workout. In addition to increasing the pressure from the seals, the training itself was made much tougher. And instead of ending at 9, it continued till 10. At the end of the training, all three Jinans were lying under a tree in a lifeless manner. Rinjiro laughed looking at this scene and said loudly, How will you guys achieve your dreams if a simple training session defeats you? You have an hour's break. The afternoon training will continue from 11 to 2. On saying that he flickered away. After half an hour, Fujin and Hoka gained some energy. While Mieko was still sleeping, Hoka asked, any idea why he suddenly doubled the intensity of the training? Fujin replied, who knows? Maybe he plans to enter us in the next Chunin exam. Or maybe he was just letting us take it easy as we just graduated. He took a deep breath before continuing, anyways, it seems like it'll be very helpful for us. Hoka sighed and said, I always thought I was the one who looked forward to training the most. But it seems like you are even more of a maniac than me saying that he laughed lightly. Fujin looked back at him, before chuckling a bit and said, Oh well. Let's hope that we get out of this alive. He then grabbed his ration bars and devoured them and began stretching. Hoka followed. At eleven, Rinjiro appeared again. He created two shadow clones and said, Today we will be discussing how to increase your growth rate. Follow one. Mieko and Hoka follow a shadow clone each into the forests, while Fujin stays there. Rinjiro looked at Fujin and asked, Who do you think has grown the fastest among you three? Fujin thought for a bit and answered, Probably me. Rinjiro nodded and replied, Indeed. You've grown much faster than any of your academy teachers predicted. Even faster than I predicted. However, compared to your two teammates, you have a huge disadvantage. Do you know what it is? Fujin fell into thought on hearing the question. After a minute, he answered, Kekiai Jinkai. Rinjiro nodded, right, but not completely. Along with their Kekiai Jinkai, they also have their huge clans, which have already developed complementary jutsus to leverage the advantage their Kekiai Jinkai gives them. Hearing that, Fujin fell into his thoughts. Rinjiro continued, Both Hoka and Mieko are very talented. Soon, their families will begin heavily investing in them, boosting their growth at a high speed in a systematic way. What do you have to contend with? Or will you be left behind by them? Fujin replied seriously, that is why I invested time into becoming a censor and learning swordplay. I don't have any Kekiai Jinkai. So obviously, I won't get any sudden boost to my powers. But as long as I keep training my skills to the limit, I'll surpass the ninjas who depend on their Kekiai Jinkai. Rinjiro maintained a serious face and asked, What makes you think that the ones with Kekiai Jinkai won't train to their limits? Do you really think that you can surpass them despite all the advantages they have over you? Fujin smiled and put his hand gently on his sword handle. I've heard that the strongest samurai in the land of iron can go head to head against Akage with nothing but his sword. Even in Kanoha, despite having so many people with Kekiai Jinkai, the second, third, and fourth Hokage are all ninjas who didn't have any Kekiai Jinkai. Similarly, no member of the Sanans has a Kekiai Jinkai. 
So as long as I keep training hard, I don't think I'd lose to anyone with a Kekiai Jinkai. Rinjiro was surprised to hear this answer. More importantly, he was surprised to hear the confidence in Fujin's voice. He smiled wryly and thought, oh well, this one has no need of any encouragement or confidence boost. Though he might need a reality check. At the same time, Fujin was thinking, was he planning to give me a pep talk or something? Anyways, while Kekiai Jankai is good, it's not something that would churn out rank S ninjas. Other than Eternal Menjiku Sharingan, Rinnegan and maybe Tensegan, others are really overbearing. I guess the Senju treat the wood release with the highest respect, but in all honesty, it was Hashirama who made wood style overpowered and not vice versa. Besides, of my two teammates, one is about to die soon, while the other has a cursed seal put on him. Not really something I'd be jealous about. After a short pause, Rinjiro began talking again, that's a good perspective to have. But don't forget that whether it's the second, third, and fourth Hokage, or the three Sanans, all were extremely talented and hardworking. So while it's a good thing to take inspiration from them, don't forget that you'll have to train extremely hard to even dream about reaching that level. Fujin nodded and replied, Yes, Sensei. Rinjiro smiled and added, There's one another thing I want to tell you about Kekiai Jinkai. But you are not ready for it yet. I'll tell you when you complete your first B-rank mission as a Chunin. Fujin wondered what Rinjiro wanted to tell him. He replied, All right, Sensei. Rinjiro then asked, What is your analysis of your current capability? And how do you plan on continuing your training? Fujin thought for a bit, before answering, To start with, my ability as a sensor nin is developing decently. But that'll be my secondary ability. In terms of fighting, it seems like my mainstay will be wind release and swordplay. Swordplay is my preferred choice of close combat, while wind release gives me mid and long range capabilities. Of course, both still have a lot of work that needs to be done. I can use some earth release jutsus for defensive purposes. And I have body flicker jutsu for mobility. My physical strength, speed, and chakra are decent too, I guess. At least for a jinin, that is. Rinjiro was impressed by Fujin's analysis. Fujin continued, as for what I'm missing or need to improve. I need some strong jutsu in my arsenal that can create a deadly impact or devastation on the battlefield. And my taijutsu needs to improve. All I have there is the basic academy style. On completing his answer, he looked up at his sensei. Rinjiro replied, on point analysis. You don't need to worry about a strong jutsu though. When you become a jounin, you'll get to look at rank A jutsus that our village has. For now, stick with rank C jutsus. Preferably for the next couple of years, until your chakra grows considerably. You are right about your taijutsu though. While you did rank high in the academy, that basic style won't aid you much in growing stronger. That's why I'll be teaching you the taijutsu I practice. That is the Senju Taijutsu style. Chapter 54 the path to becoming an elite. That surprised Fujin. He quickly thanked his sensei, thank you sensei. But can you just teach it to someone who isn't from the Senju clan? Rinjiro raised his eyebrow and asked, what do you mean someone? You are my student. He then laughed and said, don't worry, our techniques are for the whole village. Anyone who can learn it can use them. Of course, the key word is can. Fujin asked, what do you mean by Kinsensei? Rinjiro replied, The people from our clan are blessed with high levels of chakra. Surely you'd have sensed that by now. Fujin nodded. Rinjiro continued, So our techniques usually have high chakra requirements. If anyone else were to try and learn, they'll run out of chakra very quickly. You, on the other hand, have a lot of chakra as compared to your counterparts. In fact, it's more than both Hoka and Miki combined. So you'll be perfect to learn Senju Taijutsu style. Fujin quickly understood and nodded, All right. When can we start, Sensei? Also, can you explain what exactly is Senju Taijutsu style? I haven't ever read it. Rinjiro replied, We'll begin right away after I explain the basics. 
Senju Taijutsu style is actually pretty straightforward. Actually, the Academy Taijutsu style was created by referring to our style. What makes Senju style lethal is the use of chakra. Any Taijutsu style basically consists of users fighting with their arms and legs or some other body parts. Of course, there are a few exceptions, like Hyuga Taijutsu which releases small amounts of chakra from their fingers or palm, and a clan in Kiri that uses bones. In Senju Taijutsu style, your every move will be reinforced by chakra. You want a punch? Your fist needs to gather chakra first and release it on impact. You want a kick? You have to do the same. You want to block? Infuse chakra into the body part you want to block with or is about to hit. This ensures that your defense is like a fortress, while your attack is devastating. Of course, such a style means that not only do you need to have a huge amount of chakra, but you also need to have very good chakra control. Else, even a huge chakra reserve will get depleted very quickly. Rinjiro's explanation shocked Fujin a bit. He analyzed, isn't this similar to Tsunade's fighting style? In fact, I did already make some attempts of infusing chakra in my punches. To think this is the Senju style. Tsunade's fighting style probably represents the Senju Taijutsu style used by someone who's reached the peak of chakra control. Anyways, this is very good. Finally, a Taijutsu style that can allow me to compete or even overpower others. After analyzing, he said, let's start Sensei. Rinjiro nodded and began the training. He said, first, we will start by getting you to completely infuse your chakra in your whole body. Once you can do that, we will begin concentrating on infusing it with individual body parts only. Display your entire chakra first. Fujin obeyed and released his entire chakra. Rinjiro looked at Fujin. He could see a blue chakra completely cloaking Fujin. His first thought was, marvelous. Fujin too was in thought, actually, I do have some basic understanding of this. While I never exposed it for obvious reasons. Now will be a good time to use it to just show it as natural talent, hee <laughs> hee. Following Fujin's expectations, Renjiro gave his next command, now try to contain that chakra inside your body such that it flows through your entire body. Think of it as similar to you doing chakra flow on your body rather than just your sword. Fujin followed his guidance. He slowly began containing that chakra in his body. In around two minutes, the blue aura cloaking him slowly disappeared. But if someone were to observe closely, they'd notice blue chakra flares being expelled occasionally from his body. Renjiro, who was standing right in front of him, was shocked. He thought, so fast. This. He swallowed his saliva before exclaiming to himself, this is unbelievable. Though the control isn't perfect by any means, he managed to contain the chakra in just a couple of minutes. It's as if this technique was made for him. Fujin looked up at Renjiro, before asking, is this proper sensei? Renjiro nodded and replied, yes, very good. But you are losing a lot of chakra while trying to maintain this form. The next phase of your training will be to perfect this form. You'll activate it and meditate until you can properly contain your chakra with zero loss. Until then, no ninjutsu or kinjutsu practice for you. In fact, even when doing your morning workout, you'll start doing it by maintaining this form. Hearing that he won't get to practice ninjutsu or kinjutsu disappointed Fujin a bit, but seeing the importance Renjiro stressed on this, he could vaguely guess that this will become something that might define him for a long time to come. It might even be what breaks him apart from the normal ninjas and pave his way into becoming an elite. Renjiro's thoughts too were along the same lines, now that I've seen your potential in this, no way I'd allow you to not raise this aspect to the peak. Apart from a short lunch break, Fujin ended up training alongside Renjiro till 8 p.m. Finally, at 8, the training ended and Fujin was allowed to leave. Before leaving, however, Renjiro said something that left Fujin tongue-tied. He said, tomorrow, increase the pressure on your seal to 30% during the morning workout. Fujin looked at his teacher skeptically, but seeing the serious look on his face, he just nodded helplessly. On reaching home, Fujin ate a few ration bars and straightaway dived into his bed thinking, damn. 
my entire body is sore. It's as if each and every cell in my body is screaming in pain. This is nuts. No wonder Renjiro asked me to double my ration bar intake. Still though, the progress that I made just today is crazy. If I manage to keep up with this training for months, I have no idea how strong I'd become. Not having the energy to do anything, he fell asleep. Chapter 55 Rapid Improvement The next morning, when he woke up, something left Fujin completely shocked. His body had no pain whatsoever. He speculated, does this training also heal the body in some way? Or is it something else? More importantly, is this safe? I need to consult him ASAP. Rinjiro appeared at the training ground at 5 a.m. as usual and asked the Jinans to begin their workout. However, today, Fujin said, Sensei, I have some queries. Understanding what query he'd have, he replied, All right. Hoka, Mieko, you two begin your workout. Fujin will join you too soon. Hoka left wondering what query Fujin had, while Mieko left begrudgingly as Fujin got to skip out on the workout a bit. Rinjiro then looked at Fujin and asked, Is it about the quick healing? Fujin nodded. Rinjiro answered, It's a side effect of this training. Since you infuse chakra in your body, it ends up activating each and every cell of your body. This will increase your passive healing and also reduce the amount of time you need to recover from fatigue or exhaustion. He then smiled a bit and continued, There's actually a few more advantages of this training. It'll increase your stamina, and more importantly, your chakra reserves. Fujin's eyes widened on hearing that. He quickly asked, Isn't it too much of a hax? Rinjiro smirked and said, Not really. The passive healing, while good, isn't really groundbreaking. As for chakra increase, it is only visible when you start this training and if your chakra reserve isn't already very high. So while you may see a huge boost to your chakra and stamina in the next few weeks, later on, the effect won't really be that obvious. That killed Fujin's excitement a bit as he sank into his thoughts, oh, then it's not that big of a hax. But still pretty good though. After all, the very requirement to learn this style is having high chakra. And if the effect of learning this style was a boost to your chakra reserve, then it just doubles down on that advantage. He looked back at Renjiro and asked, Is there any harmful side effect to using this technique? Renjiro was a bit surprised by that question. After all, any other 10-year-old Jinin would just be too happy with such a huge buff. He remembered that he himself had been lost in delight when he had learned this technique. He answered, Don't worry, this is a very old Senju technique. There are no harmful effects. In fact, Considering the long lifespans of my clan members, it might even be having a good effect on your health. Hearing the answer, Fujin let out a sigh of relief. Rinjiro looked at him and said, If you have no more questions, begin your workout. Your teammates have left you behind considerably. Fujin thanked him and started the workout. While he had increased the pressure from the seal a lot, infusing chakra meant that exercises were actually easier for him. Of course, that wasn't foolproof. After all, the moment his chakra ran out was the moment Hell began feeling real to Fujin. Later that day, Fujin talked with Renjiro about the issue of chakra running out during the morning workout. But Renjiro just smiled innocently and said, You have enough chakra to be able to go through the whole morning workout without running out. It's just your control that is lacking. So if you don't want to run out of chakra during your workout, train and improve your control. Fujin gave a deadpan look to his teacher's innocent smile. He could bet all his money that he was laughing at his misery. The training continued in a similar manner for Fujin. After three days, he finally managed to last the entire morning workout without running out of chakra. On day seven, he finally managed to contain all chakra in his body properly. He still didn't reach zero wastage, but the amount of chakra leaking out now was very negligible. These seven days, however, had blown Fujin's mind. The result of this training was phenomenal. He muttered to himself in disbelief, just one week of this training has increased my chakra reserves by 
In addition to the chakra increase, Renjiro made Fujin increase the pressure on the training seal from day 3 onwards. Right now it was up to 40%. The next month was spent on properly mastering chakra control for the Senju Taijutsu style. At the end of the training, Fujin could finally freely control his chakra and employ it in a spar against Renjiro. This training increased his chakra by another 35 to 40 percent. In just over five months since he graduated, Fujin's chakra reserves had a fourfold increase. His thoughts were incredible. I now have more chakra than even Jenki. And he was an elite chunin for four years at least. Damn, I really want to test out my ninjutsu right now. Unfortunately, he was still denied permission to train ninjutsu. With all three students training intensely, Renjiro didn't take any missions for a couple of months. Renjiro spent a few more weeks drilling all the basics of Senju Taijutsu style in Fujin. The process of increasing pressure from the training seal continued during this time. At that moment, it was at 55%. Fujin always had to keep infusing his body with chakra while doing rigorous training or sparring. Otherwise, this pressure would slow him down a lot. And if he was doing some normal activities, like walking or running or resting, then the pressure shouldn't really bother him much. By this logic, Renjiro had Fujin maintain that pressure all the time. Finally, one fine evening, Renjiro watched a tired Fujin panting on the ground. They had just finished another one of their spars. He smiled and said, Great work, kiddo. You have finally got all the basics down properly. Fujin just nodded. Clearly, he was too tired to answer back. Renjiro smiled and said, Let's end here. Take a rest and take tomorrow off. Hearing that, Fujin suddenly looked up. There were almost tears in his eyes. He thought, finally. Renjiro chuckled at his reaction and then flickered away. Fujin rested a bit and then dragged himself across Kanoha to his house while thinking, finally. Two months, and not a single day's break. Hoka and Mieko got off days saying that they needed to master their clan jutsus. But for me? I didn't get even a single session off. He went to sleep while complaining about the unfairness in his heart. Chapter 56 Supercharged Wind Jutsus The next day, Fujin, for the first time in years, slept like a log till noon. On waking up, there was no soreness from the earlier day. He thought, got to admit, I really love this aspect of this training. I always wake up in full health and stamina. Anyways, no more ration bars today. After freshening up, he left home. While talking he thought, I really miss the advanced technology. In my previous life, I could never imagine myself being without a smartphone for years. Heck, I would have most likely spent today on the net, while lazing on my sofa and ordering all the food home, haha. <laughs> Soon, he arrived at Ichiraku. He sat there and said, Old man, give me one of each bowl you have. Tuchi was surprised at the order. After all, it's not daily when someone would overeat ramen. He smiled and said, You've come here after a long time, Fujin. Fujin sighed, Yeah. Another old man made me train all the time. So I had no free time at all. Tuchi smiled and encouraged him, hang in there young man. And he began making the ramen. Ever since he graduated, Fujin's trips to Ichiraku and Yakiniku had increased. His food was usually just ration bars, and when he got an opportunity, he would visit these two restaurants. So his relationship with Tuchi was good. Soon two bowls were served in front of Fujin. Tuchi wore his trademark smile and said, eat up. You'll need all the energy you can get. Fujin wasted no time in digging in. Soon, he ended up eating all seven types of ramen in Ichiraku. Once done, he said, they were delicious, old man. Give me two more miso and tonkatsu ramen. Tuchi smiled and yelled, coming right up. After lunch, Fujin went into the forest he used to train earlier in. He smirked while thinking, finally a break. Now let me test my jutsu. On reaching the deepest part of the forest, he stood in front of a tree. Well, here goes nothing, and he uses his great breakthrough jutsu. 
The jutsu uproots the tree, as well as a few more trees behind and adjacent to that tree. In addition, the winds created by the jutsu created deep slashes in many nearby trees and stripped them of all their leaves and most of their branches. Watching the scene, Fujin grinned, excellent. This is almost 40 to 50 percent stronger than it was two months ago. And now, Fujin's grin grew wider. He suddenly exerted his chakra, causing a blue aura to form around him. He began preparing another great breakthrough jutsu. Only this time, instead of releasing it, he began pouring a lot more chakra into this jutsu. In 30 seconds, he managed to pour 10% of his chakra into the jutsu. In another 30 seconds, it reached 15%. Great breakthrough jutsu. He exhaled the jutsu. Only this time, instead of normal jutsu, it was supercharged with chakra. The jutsu hit the tree in front of him, completely obliterating it. In a fraction of a second, hundreds of trees in the vicinity were uprooted or cut into pieces. Thousands were stripped of all their branches and left with deep scars. A slash in, apologies climate lovers. Luckily, Naruto world isn't threatened by climate change, lol. Fujin was shocked on seeing the destruction. However soon, the shock on his face was changed to a grin that seemed to be plastered on his face. Excellent! Marvelous! Now, this is what a jutsu is. But that said, the amount of time needed to supercharge the jutsu is too long. Any capable ninja will kill me a dozen times if I stay in one spot for a minute. I'll have to increase the speed of pouring my chakra into the jutsu. Preferably reduce it to under two seconds. And have to do it while moving around, or even better, while flickering around. I guess this is why Renjiro asked us to focus on rank C jutsus. Now, let me test the other jutsus. Fujin quickly made a hand sign. Soon winds gathered around him. He infused chakra into his jutsu for 30 seconds. The winds then spun around him in a dome shape at a very rapid speed. The wind kept spinning around Fujin for a couple of minutes. Even before the wind dome dispersed, Fujin made a hand sign. The winds turn into two wolves. They are three meters in height and almost seven meters long, looking incredibly ferocious. They ran towards the nearby trees and shredded a few of them with their claws and teeth before disappearing. Next, Fujin once again gathered his chakra and poured it into Wind Dragon Jutsu. He managed to pour a little over 20% of his max chakra into it. It resulted in a 50 meter long dragon forming in the forest. The dragon opened its mouth, forming a huge wind explosion jutsu, and launched it toward the trees. The sphere traveled in a straight line and exploded on hitting a tree, snapping it into two. It then traveled in a zigzag way through the forest, slashing many trees with the winds in its large body. It managed to travel 200 meters through the thick forest cover before dispersing. Soon after, two spheres of wind appeared in Fujin's hands. Their size quickly increased to around 50 centimeters in radius. Fujin launched it at the same time on a boulder. They exploded on the boulders and created a few scars all over them. Fujin analyzed them, hmm, the damage increase is kinda unnecessary. After all, it's just slashes of wind. Any random slash can give a fatal blow to a normal ninja anyways. And if someone does create a strong defense, then it'll end up blocking the enhanced wind explosion jutsu with these two. Yeah, it's unnecessary. Let's just increase the speed of launching. At the very next moment, Fujin began spamming the wind explosion jutsu. In just a minute, he ended up launching 84 wind explosion jutsus. Fujin grinned, excellent. And it cost me around 7% of my chakra. This will be a very annoying tactic at mid-range, haha. <laughs> Next, Fujin looked around himself to look for an appropriate stone. He finally found one, a few dozen meters from him, which he guessed would weigh around 15 kilograms. He concentrated on the stone. Immediately, strong winds began blowing around the stone, trying to get underneath the stone. After a few seconds, the stone started getting lifted into the sky. After around half a minute, Fujin was able to raise the stone to a height of 1.2 meters. He then raised his arms towards the stone. 
Wind Retrieval Jutsu. The stone slowly began moving towards himself. He brought the stone to him and caught it in his hands. The amount of power I can exert with these two jutsus has increased too. I wonder if I'll be able to fly with the help of these two jutsus. Though I guess I'll need much more chakra and much better control. And probably, even then it might not be useful for long distance travel. Chapter 57 Analysis and Weird Situation Tossing the stone away, Fujin put his hand in his bag and tossed twelve shurikens one after another in the air. Projectile Control Jutsu Fujin used the jutsu to control the shurikens and had them move through the forest while avoiding all the trees. The shuriken moved continuously through the forest and all of them hit the same tree around 500 meters away from Fujin. At the next moment, Fujin appeared next to that tree using wind instantaneous body jutsu. He retrieved the shurikens while concluding, Wow, I didn't think that two months of senjutai jutsu training would end up boosting my ninjutsu so much. In the great breakthrough jutsu, I could pour up to 15% of my chakra. While it took a minute, the result was very good. The spinning shield of wind could only take up to 2.5% of my chakra. I just couldn't add more to it. It was similar to the wind gale wolf jutsu. I could just pour 2% of my chakra into each of the wolves. The wind dragon jutsu on the other hand could take 20% of my jutsu. And using wind instantaneous body jutsu to my current limit of 500 meters requires 1.5% of my chakra. Wind projectile jutsu requires a negligible amount of my chakra now. While each wind explosion jutsu needs less than 0.1% of my chakra. Wind levitation jutsu doesn't have much battle use for now. Wind retrieval jutsu can be used to create some chaos though. Anyways, just this short show of my jutsus cost me almost 50% of my chakra. I wonder if Renjiro has more means to increase my chakra levels. Though it shouldn't be an issue for now as I can't really supercharge any jutsu in combat. Fujin began gathering chakra again and slammed his hands on the ground. A rock shield appeared in front of him. Seeing the shield, Fujin sighed, no wonder it is just a rank E jutsu. It has already long reached the limit for me. There's no scope to improve it anymore. The size of the rock shield was no bigger than what Fujin could do two months ago. That said, I need to discuss with Renjiro and see if he could have any method to release the jutsu by stepping on the ground rather than slamming hands down. Oh well, I'll ask when he restarts ninjutsu training. After concluding, Fujin made a hand sign and disappeared underground. While underground, he sighed, I've been so busy with everything that I never really practiced this jutsu after graduation. He kept moving underground for a bit, before suppressing his chakra signal and making another couple of hand signs. In an instant, he disappeared and reappeared around 150 meters in the direction he was facing. Hmm, earth instantaneous body jutsu and wind instantaneous body jutsu are perfect for escaping without leaving any trail. Earth instantaneous body jutsu would actually be perfect for infiltrating enemy territory. I wonder what counter has been developed against this jutsu. He then rose up from the ground, made another hand sign, and placed his hand on the ground. The ground ahead of him transformed into a moat of mud. The size of the moat was 6 meters in radius and 10 meters in depth. He moved to a different spot, made a few hand signs, and slammed his hands again on the ground. This time, the ground rose slowly, as if trying to trap someone. Fujin analyzed, earth holding jutsu is just too slow. Kinda a similar situation with mud moat jutsu. Then again, these two are the only jutsus that I can use to trap enemies. Should be sufficient for now. Having tried and analyzed the current status of most of his jutsus, Fujin decided to return home to rest. While leaving, he muttered to himself while looking at the ground, my jutsus should be good enough for now. But I do need the earth wall jutsu. That'll improve my ability to defend further. And my current chakra should be plenty for it. Though I guess Renjiro won't allow it. Anyways, I hope that we get to participate in the next Chunin exam. I really want to test myself in combat. It should be fun. He grinned and looked up. What he saw made him feel a bit awkward. 
A good chunk of the forest was utterly destroyed by Fujin testing his jutsus. He wondered, if someone were to come here and see this, I wonder what they'll think. Luckily, this area is kinda remote and people shouldn't be coming here. But in any case, I should hide my tracks in case someone did come here. Also, it would probably be best if I don't return here in the near future. Fujin jumped onto a branch of one of the trees that still had branches. Gale Jutsu A gentle breeze blew through the forest, covering up every footprint in it and also dispersing the scent slightly. Once this task was done, Fujin made a hand sign and disappeared from his spot and appeared on another branch around 500 meters away. He used wind instantaneous body jutsu a few more times before getting out of the forest. After leaving the forest he flickered away toward his house while wondering if anyone would ever see the havoc there. A couple of months later, two special jounins from the Hyuga clan happened to pass through this forest when they unwittingly entered the area where Fujin had caused the devastation. Seeing the number of uprooted and sliced off trees left them dumbfounded. Coincidentally, a squad of Umbu too happened to cross through the same area at that time. Seeing the two Hyuga present, they instantly began asking them for the reason why they destroyed the forest and inquired whether there was any battle there. The Hyugas denied the charge and said that the forest was already wrecked. The Umbus looked around carefully and realized that it had been a long time since the destruction had happened. They investigated around and asked the Hyugas to help them, but found no clue. They wondered if someone was training here, but couldn't understand why anyone would train here when there are so many training grounds available around Kanoha. The unusual nature of this destruction made them report the situation to the Hokage. Hiruzen too was confused similarly. He sent out an Umbu squad specializing in investigation and tracking to check. Unfortunately, Gale Jutsu, two months of time, and a few showers of rain had removed anything that could have been used to find a clue. The Umbus would return empty-handed, and Hiruzen dropped the case as there were no clues and it wasn't worth allocating more resources to. Of course, Fujin would forever remain ignorant about such an incident happening. Chapter 58 Discussion After testing his jutsus, Fujin returned home and took another short nap. Later he revised his few jutsu skills before having dinner at Yakiniku. The next day once again started with an intense morning workout. In the afternoon, the team again broke up to train with Renjiro and his clones. Renjiro looked at Fujin and said, I have taught everything I know about Senju Taijutsu style. How much you manage to master depends on you now. Fujin bowed a bit and said, Thank you, Sensei. Seeing his humility, Rinjiro's face softened. He said, You had once said that the Sanins too don't have any Kekiai Jinkai. One of the Sanin, Lady Tsunade, uses an advanced form of Senju Taijutsu. She modified this style to complement her perfect chakra control, making it much more deadly. Your own talent with this style too is very high so work hard on it. Fujin nodded and said, Yes, Sensei. I'll keep improving it. Rinjiro continued, Regardless, it's time to focus back on ninjutsu and kinjutsu. We will practice all your jutsus once. And then we will begin working on supercharging your jutsus. Fujin instantly got excited upon hearing that. Rinjiro noticed and squinted his eyes. He asked, You have already tried it, haven't you? Fujin laughed nervously before confirming it. Rinjiro sighed and said, I hope you didn't end up destroying anything. To which Fujin obediently shook his head, saying, Don't worry, Sensei. I shot everything straight up in the air. Rinjiro asked, All right. So what were your observations? Fujin replied, It takes a lot of time to supercharge jutsus. So it just won't be usable in battles unless I can bring the time down a lot. Rinjiro nodded. Fujin continued, apart from that, I couldn't supercharge all my jutsus. Especially rock shield jutsu, which didn't improve at all. Great breakthrough and wind dragon jutsu had the best effect on supercharging. Rinjiro said, yes, that's how supercharging works. While you can try to pour a lot of chakra into any jutsu, not all jutsus can be supercharged. The amount of chakra you can pour in also depends on your chakra reserves, chakra control, mastery of the element, 
mastery of that jutsu, and the jutsu itself. Though Kanoha lacks wind jutsus, you are lucky to have wind affinity. As almost all of the rank C wind jutsus can be supercharged. As for the rock shield jutsu, its capacity is very low. So don't concern yourself with it. In the next few months, I'll be teaching all three of you how to supercharge your jutsus quickly in battle situations. Since your chakra reserve is the highest, you'll need to work the hardest here. Before we begin, do you have any queries? Fujin nodded and replied, Yes, Sensei. I have a few. The first one is related to rock shield jutsu. I can now perform the jutsu without any hand signs, but I still need to slam my hands on the ground. Do you know any way to perform the jutsu by slamming the feet down instead? Renjiro raised his left eyebrow and asked, Why do you want to do that? Fujin answered, It'll improve the efficiency of the jutsu a lot. I carry swords in my hands, so to slam my hands on the ground, I'll have to discard my swords temporarily, which doesn't seem to be a good idea. If I can perform the jutsu with just my feet, I can just use it while I'm fighting with my sword. And if the enemy makes a huge attack on me, then I can just retreat back while slamming my feet on the ground and creating multiple rock shields. Renjiro was surprised by Fujin's tactical thinking. He replied, Good thinking. I never thought about rock shield jutsu along those lines. I guess your intention is to eventually use this for all Earth-style jutsu, right? Fujin nodded, Indeed, that will be very convenient. Renjiro continued, Unfortunately, it won't be possible. Or at the very least, it won't be easy. The hand signs for that jutsu result in earth nature chakra gathering in your palms. Though you perform the jutsu without any hand signs, you do it by merely replicating the way chakra is molded when you perform the hand signs. Doing what you said will be no different from creating a whole different jutsu. Fujin quickly replied, In that case, Sensei, can't we create new Earth-style jutsus that work in this manner? Rinjiro shook his head and answered, It's too difficult. While small jutsus are always created, what you are saying will completely revolutionize the jutsus of Earth element. At the very least, I can't do it. Also, while your idea is very innovative, it's highly unlikely that you were the only one who came up with it. And considering that no such jutsu exists to my knowledge, it's safe to say that no one ever managed to create it. Fujin was dejected a bit upon hearing this, oh well, there goes one of my ideas to annoy the enemy infinitely. Seeing the dejected look, Rinjiro chuckled. Fujin looked back at Rinjiro and said, so since I can't improve my rock shield jutsu anymore, can I get earth wall jutsu? Rinjiro shook his head again and answered, no, that's a rank B jutsu. Though your chakra reserve is good, you shouldn't be dependent on rank B or higher jutsus till you are promoted to Chunin. The answer was as Fujin expected. So he just asked his last query, Sensei, while practicing with supercharged jutsus, I ran out of chakra very quickly. Do you know any more means of increasing my chakra quickly? After all, the training of infusing chakra into the body is barely giving any gains in that regard. Rinjiro had a slight disbelief on his face that Fujin actually asked this question. He replied, Brat, do you think they sell chakra in grocery stores? Your chakra is already four times larger as compared to your teammates. Be happy with that and don't get greedy. Also, don't bother searching for more means of increasing your chakra reserves. Other than hard work and natural growth, almost every method has some form of drawback that'll highly restrict you. As for the battle, you can always eat soldier pills to improve your stamina. So don't bother with it. Fujin was a bit shocked at how dismissive Renjiro was. He thought, really, no other means? Sigh, I guess I was expecting way too much. After all, the current boost is already very high. Oh well, I'll leave this issue to the future. If I really desperately need chakra, I can try to steal a tailed beast. Thinking about tailed beasts, Fujin sighed internally, how good it'd have been if I could just throw some poke balls and capture them. Rinjiro asked, any more queries? Fujin shook his head and replied, let's begin Sensei. Chapter 59, Rank A Jutsu Rinjiro trained the trio for another month. 
This month, Fujin practiced supercharging his jutsus a lot. He could now infuse 20% of his chakra into the Great Breakthrough Jutsu in under 15 seconds. More importantly, he could infuse 5% of chakra into the Jutsu in just over 2 seconds. This was usable in battle as long as he maintained some distance. He also mastered Wind Gale Wolf and Wind Dragon Jutsus and could now perform them without any hand signs. The ease with which he became capable of using these Jutsus without any hand seals shocked Renjiro. Fujin's Kenjutsu also improved a lot. All the basics regarding Samurai Saber techniques were taught to him. He could freely control chakra flow through his samurai swords. He even managed to properly infuse his wind chakra through the normal chakra flow. Rinjiro couldn't help him much in this regard as he himself never added a nature chakra to chakra flow. He specialized in earth and water elements, and neither were suitable to be added to chakra flow. Nonetheless, it was learnt with rather ease by Fujin. In fact, while learning it, he also learned a technique that he had dreamed about performing for over a decade. The teen was given a day's break once again, which all three used to rest well. The next day, in the morning, the team met up once again. Hoka saw Fujin coming to the ground and asked, Hey, how's the training progressing? Fujin replied, It's progressing rather smoothly, what about you guys? Hoka smirked and replied, It's going very well. I want to spar with you once again. Fujin smirked back and replied, Well, let's hope that you can touch me this time. That annoyed Hoka, who begrudgingly replied, Due to you, Sensei drilled me with ninjutsu training for three months straight. Hearing that, Fujin laughed. Mieko, annoyed at being left out of the conversation, butted in by snorting, I'll beat both of you at the same time in a spar. Hoka and Fujin turned to her. Fujin replied, Well, let's hope that you have some energy to spar after the morning workout then. Hearing that, her shoulders immediately dropped, while Fujin and Hoka laughed at her expense. The poor girl complained about the unfairness to herself, it's not as if I'm slacking on those workout sessions. It's just that every time I am about to reach Sensei's target, Sensei just makes it even more difficult. While Mieko was depressed, Rinjiro appeared. He announced, We have trained continuously for the past three months. Next, we will be taking continuous rank C missions. That instantly perked up Mieko. After all, missions would mean no more rigorous training. Hoka and Fujin also sighed in relief, as their bodies needed a break badly. Unlike Mieko who drop out early rather regularly, Hoka and Fujin gritted through the entire workout daily. Rinjiro continued, Today we won't do any workout or training. Instead, you guys will spar. This immediately gained the attention of the three jinnins. Rinjiro continued, You three will fight out against each other in a three-way battle. You are not allowed to team up with each other unless the circumstances force you to but I can disqualify you if you purposefully cooperate to defeat the third. The battlefield will be this entire training field. You guys have time from now till 6 p.m. to decide on a winner. You can defeat others by knocking them unconscious or making them give up. Obviously, I can interfere and declare someone to have been lost. And of course, you guys aren't allowed to seriously injure anyone. No soldier pills. And Fujin, no swords. Mieko suddenly asked, Why no swords for Fujin? Isn't that his go-to weapon? Hoka also nodded, as he had the same query. Neither of them wanted to win against someone who was handicapped. Rinjiro shook his head and said, Fujin's way of using his swords is solely to kill. If you were to win by using his swords, you guys would be injured badly. Regardless, he is forbidden to use his swords in any spar with his colleagues. They understood the reasoning but were still a bit unconvinced. Fujin butted in, Aren't you two looking down on me too much? Sword or no sword, neither of you will even be able to touch me. And he smirked on saying that. Hoka and Mieko looked at him irritatingly. Among the three of them, Fujin had the highest speed and excelled in fighting at long range. In the few spars that they had, they never managed to actually reach him. Rinjiro interrupted before they entered into an argument, no more questions. My rules are final. Anyways, 
You guys didn't hear the exciting part. The winner will get a reward. That once again attracted the attention of all three. Mieko asked, What reward? Rinjiro replied, The winner will be awarded a rank A jutsu by me. That shocked the trio. They all had the same thought, Will he really allow us to learn a jutsu higher than rank C? Rinjiro understood what his students were thinking. He smiled innocently and said, Of course, I'll only give it to you when you are promoted to Chunin. Hearing that, all three Jinins gave him a deadpan look. Not wanting to hear any complaints from them, he shouted, Begin. Even before he completed the word, all three Jinins flickered away in different directions without making any hand seals. Now, at more than 100 meters away from each other, they observed the other two, while wondering how they should approach this. The best way would have been to team up with one of the other two, eliminate the third, and then decide the winner. Unfortunately, that option was not available. Suddenly, Hoka and Mieko noticed Fujin smirking. At the very next moment, he disappeared. Chapter 60, Spar, Hoka vs. Mieko Mieko and Hoka both cursed him and his annoying wind instantaneous body jutsu. Hoka activated his Byakugan and noticed him appearing 600 meters away. But he disappeared soon, and this time went out of the Byakugan's range. Mieko cursed, Fujin is as cowardly as usual. Hoka and Mieko looked at each other deciding what decision to take. Around a kilometer away from the initial location, Fujin kept sensing the location of the other two. They were still in the same position. He smiled thinking, the duration of the fight is 13 hours. I guess Renjiro analyzed that we won't be able to decide the winner in a few fights. So the winner will depend on who has the most amount of chakra. The best way for me would be to force multiple rounds so that all of us lose an equal amount of chakra. And I'll be able to win easily due to my larger reserves. Especially considering that Byakugan and Sharingan use a decent amount of chakra while being activated. But knowing these two, I have no doubt that they'll fight intensely, hee <laughs> hee. Back at the starting position, Mieko and Hoko were observing each other. Hoko was analyzing, so what do I do? Do I hide too until Fujin comes out? Or do we track Fujin first before fighting? Or should I try to beat her first and then beat Fujin? No, that'll be tough. Not to mention, Fujin loves to sneak attack. He won't miss the chance to attack when we are fighting. On the other hand, Mieko too was having similar doubts. But compared to Hoka, she was a lot more arrogant. She dumped all the questions she had while deciding, I'll just defeat Hoka quickly before Fujin can act. In a 1v1 fight, I'll be able to defeat both of them with ease. Having made her decision, Mieko activated her Sharingan and rushed toward Hoka. This broke Hoka out of his thoughts, and he prepared to fight. He cautioned himself, I have to avoid looking into her eyes. While I can break her Jinjutsu easily, it'll be tough to do so quickly enough. Mieko flickered a few meters ahead of Hoka and rapidly made a few hand signs and launched a fireball jutsu on him. Hoka quickly moved out of the way and then ran towards Mieko with the intention of using gentle fists to close her chakra points. Mieko quickly flickered out of range and launched shurikens on Hoka. Knowing that she uses strings on her shuriken, Hoka too threw his own shuriken, which collided with hers and deflected them. Mieko used this opportunity to close the distance and use fire release for jutsu on Hoka. Hoka barely managed to dodge, but it raised past his shirt, burning it. A bit of the skin on the side of his abdomen was also burnt. He bore the pain and closed the distance. This time, Mieko didn't back off and engaged him with her Uchiha Taijutsu style. Using her Sharingan, she ensured that she never got hit by his gentle fist. Instead, she tried to use her fire release for Jutsu on Hoka. However, Hoka noticed it every time and kept dodging it. All this time, Mieko kept trying to put Hoka under Jinjutsu, but it never worked on Hoka. Hoka's Byakugan can determine when Mieko is about to cast a Jinjutsu. So, whenever she prepares her Jinjutsu, Hoka avoided looking into her eyes and disrupted his own chakra slightly. This ensured that Mieko never managed to cast a Jinjutsu on him. 
but this also distracted him, which allowed Mieko to fight him equally in close combat. After a few minutes, however, Mieko ended up having a lot of close calls, with Hoka almost hitting her several times. So she flickered backward. Hoka followed her, but she flickered again, starting a tag game. Mieko's control over and skill with body flicker jutsu was much higher than Hoka's though. So she regained her advantage. Not able to keep up with Mieko's flickers, Hoka gave up chasing her and stood his ground, knowing her arrogance, she'll come close to fight me anyways. So I don't need to chase her. Seeing that Hoka had stopped chasing her, she came close to him instead while leading hand signs. However, unlike what Hoka predicted, she stayed at mid-range and uses fire dragon jutsu. Not having anything to counter, he flickered away from the line of fire dragon. Finally sick of trying to engage her in close combat, Hoka used stone shuriken jutsu. The jutsu surprised Mieko, but thanks to her Sharingan, she was able to dodge or block all of them. Unfortunately for her, she overlooked Hoka, who using this time, appeared right in front of her and stabbed two fingers toward her. Seeing that, Mieko freaked out a little, damn, I have to block. In a hurry, she put her arm in between, and Hoka hit a chakra point on her arm. As soon as her arm gets hit, she flickered away. Hoka expected her to return, but instead, she just ran away, surprising Hoka, never thought she'll run away. He waited there for a few seconds thinking, both my opponents ran away. So shouldn't I be the winner? He then sighed, unfortunately, the next step will depend on Fujin. I and Nieko are finally far away from each other and tired from a battle. Even injured. So the question is who will he attack? Around a kilometer from where the fighting was happening, Fujin kept sensing their chakras throughout their clash. When they kept fighting, he really wished that he had some popcorn and a TV to watch the fight. Unfortunately, he had to stay hidden long away. The fight continued for over seven minutes, before he sensed Mieko's chakra signature going far away from Hoka. Chapter 61, Fujin's Decision Fujin concluded, Oh, so Mieko lost and ran away? Who's the coward now? Anyways, whom to attack? Since Mieko ran away, it's safe to assume that she's injured. Most likely Hoka managed to block some of her chakra points. Maybe one or two. Any more, and Hoka wouldn't have given her any chance to run away. Hoka too was thinking at the same time, Fujin will most probably target Mieko, as she's the one who ran away. I should be ready to hit him after he fights her for some time. Mieko sat while resting against a tree after retreating to the opposite end of the training ground. She was very annoyed with herself. I put my guard down, that's why I got hit. Otherwise, I could have beaten him as I was suppressing him throughout the fight. She looked at her left arm. It was swollen, he blocked the chakra point on my left arm. I won't be able to create hand signs. Even moving this arm is very painful. She began applying first aid on her left arm. She didn't bother hiding, as she knew that both Fujin and Hoka wouldn't have any issue tracking her. While applying first aid, she thought, Fujin will most likely attack me soon, I need to be ready. Hoka kept his Byakugan activated. He kept an eye on Mieko while waiting for Fujin to make a move. Soon, he noticed something moving at a very rapid speed. In the next second, he noticed Fujin approaching him, so fast. Why is he moving towards me? He's already here. Hoka looked straight ahead, Fujin was already standing on a branch. He took his fighting stance. Unfortunately for him, as soon as he reached there, Fujin released a supercharged 5%. Great breakthrough jutsu toward Hoka. Hoka quickly erected a rock shield to protect himself. He was shocked by the power of the great breakthrough jutsu. Why is this so strong? Did he learn any rank B jutsus? Damn! Not good! The rock shield obviously couldn't give complete protection to Hoka and flickering away wasn't an option. So he went underground and used Earth Instantaneous Body Jutsu and managed to move 125 meters to the south. He used it twice more to completely get out of the range of the deadly Jutsu while wondering, why did he attack me? Two minutes earlier. 
Fujin thought for a few seconds before concluding, normally, attacking Mieko would be the best choice here. Except that there could be an issue. Mieko, though smarter than Hoka when it comes to tactics, is just way too arrogant. Hoka, on the other hand, will most likely move to help Mieko and prevent me from defeating her when she's injured. Even if he doesn't, his Byakuvian will provide him with all the info, and he'll have the initiative of attacking or being a spectator. So that means my target should be. Having concluded, he quickly used wind instantaneous body jutsu to approach Hoka. Though Hoka ran underground, Fujin had no trouble sensing him. He followed him with body flicker. Hoka too could see that Fujin was following him as he expected, as expected, he can track me with ease. I need to get out and engage him in close combat. I don't think he can use that strong jutsu again. However, before he could get out of the ground, Fujin landed on top of where Hoka was and punched the ground with his full power chakra enhanced punch. Since Hoka sensed Fujin building up chakra, he didn't completely get out of the ground. However, how could he have imagined that Fujin would punch the ground? The impact created a shockwave that traveled through the ground toward where Hoka was. While the shockwave was harmless, it caused the entire underground to become a mess. The random movement of the ground hit Hoka many times while he was underground, even injuring him. He tried using Earth Instantaneous Body Jutsu again, but as the underground was a mess, he couldn't perform it. As a last effort, he hardened the walls next to him by using a rock shield. It provided him with some cover, but he was already injured. His right elbow and shoulder had taken hits. Many rocks also hit his chest, abdomen, and his back. Later, even despite the protection of the rock shields, his left ankle got injured, rather badly. Finally, the tremors died down and Hoka managed to get above the ground. That's exactly where Fujin was, but unfortunately, he didn't have a choice. As soon as he got out of the ground, a kunai was placed at the back of his neck. He saw Fujin standing in front of him. He said, give up. You've lost. Hoka unwillingly accepted his loss, I give up. As soon as he said that, Fujin's wind clone dispersed himself. The fight only took two attacks. One great breakthrough jutsu and one punch. Mieko noticed the winds blowing and heard a big noise when Fujin punched the ground. Unfortunately, she was too far away to understand what was happening. She wondered, are Fujin and Hoka fighting? Should I go and check? No, I'm injured, let me wait for a bit. The chakra point will open up soon. As soon as Hoka gave up, Fujin flickered away toward Mieko. He noticed that Mieko was now standing in a spot with no trees around, not bad. She knows that hiding is pointless. So she stayed in open ground to not give any chance to sneak attack. Actually, I can still sneak up on her from behind. But, I'm pretty sure that she has deliberately left this opening. The area around her should be full of traps. Having figured out her tactic, Fujin began making wind clones. Twenty wind clones appeared around Fujin. Fujin then suppressed his chakra and hid behind a tree. His wind clones dispersed through the forest, surrounding Mieko from all sides while still hiding. One clone moved to a path that allowed him to sneak up on her. En route, the clone noticed that there were a lot of strings on the ground. He smirked, having guessed right. Chapter 62 Aerial Explosion Jutsu Fujin's wind clone tried flickering behind her quickly while avoiding all traps, but Mieko realized it and quickly turned around. When she did, Fujin's clone noticed that Mieko was holding two strings in her right hand. Seeing Fujin heading toward her, Mieko smirked, I knew it. She flickered behind while releasing the strings. As soon as those strings went slack, a couple of dozen shurikens rained toward Fujin's clone. At the same time, Mieko activated her Sharingan and observed Fujin. She frowned on noticing that Fujin's chakra amount was very low, a wind clone. This guy never fights head on. Fujin's clone dodged the shurikens with ease and chased after Mieko while forming wind explosion jutsu and launching them at her. He consecutively launched seven wind explosions at her. Mieko dodged each time. But she was getting increasingly worried, 
I need to keep a watch on any sneak attacks. It's very likely that he has more wind clones hiding nearby. Renjiro observed this clash, his control over wind nature is really impressive. Wind clones are the weakest elemental clones. Any capable sensor can easily differentiate between a wind clone and the main body in a moment due to how unstable the clone is. However, the weak nature of the wind clone allows anyone to create a lot of them. And the instability of the wind clone's chakra makes it immune to Jinjutsu. And due to being made of wind, they are usually even more mobile than the user. He then looked at Fujin who was hiding and smiled, he really is carefree and thinks that he has already won. While he will win, he's in for a surprise if he thinks the win will be this easy. After all, both Hoka and Mieko too have made huge progress in the last three months. The wind clone finally begins getting low on chakra. Fujin analyzed, hmm. I need to pour more chakra into two to three wind clones so that they can last longer. Others I can make with the minimum requirements as I'll need the numbers. Since he was about to disperse, the clone poured most of its chakra into another wind explosion jutsu. He then flickered towards Mieko. Mieko flickered away, but the clone followed her with another flicker and threw the wind explosion jutsu right at her. On doing that, the clone dispersed. In a hurry, Mieko threw a kunai that had an explosion tag attached to it toward the incoming wind sphere. The blast created by the explosion tag easily overpowered the jutsu and dispersed it, however, Mieko had to jump back to avoid getting hit by the explosion. The explosion, alongside the earlier wind explosion jutsus, however, activated or destroyed most of the traps that she painfully placed. Unfortunately for her, as soon as she jumped backward, another two wind clones appeared behind her and launched the wind explosion jutsu on her. Since she was airborne, she couldn't flick her away. In a panic, she threw a shuriken, with a string attached to it, to the tree next to her, and used it to pull herself away. But some winds created by the explosion still hit her, creating many small cuts on her that immediately began bleeding. The two clones immediately pressed on the attack, without giving Mieko any time to think. While she engaged them, another three clones appeared and tried to sneak attack her. Though none were successful, they added even more injuries to her. Fujin still kept observing the fight while hiding, not bad, she's grown much stronger. My wind clones are rather annoying to deal with. But, is this all? The fight is kinda too easy. Over at the battlefield, Mieko was bleeding a lot. And she was incredibly annoyed, why can't he fight with some honor? I'll show him. She gritted her teeth and endured the pain and made a couple of hand signs. Trying to weave hand signs while having a chakra point half blocked was incredibly painful. Fujin could see her wincing in pain. And he could sense her chakra building up. One of the clones used all his chakra to use a great breakthrough jutsu. Since he didn't have enough chakra, it wasn't strong enough. But it still made Mieko lose her balance and be dragged across the ground. The clone got dispersed as well due to running out of chakra. Seeing her being unable to fight back, another clone appeared and launches a wind explosion jutsu at her. However, before the jutsu could reach her, she managed to get up on her feet and jump above and landed on a branch. She said, fire release, aerial explosion jutsu. Hearing the word explosion, Fujin's clones got on guard. However, no explosion occurred, hmm, where's the explosion? Only a breeze passed through the area once. Realizing that something was off, they immediately begin sensing Mieko. Soon the clones, as well as Fujin, noticed that some sort of gas seems to have been released by Mieko. And it was spreading throughout the forest at a very fast speed. Fujin's clones didn't discover the gas earlier, as it was both colorless and odorless. Fujin wondered, what jutsu is this? However, he had no idea. Oh well, whatever. I'll get to know soon enough. And he disappeared underground. In around 10 seconds, the gas spread in a 60 meter radius around Mieko. All of Fujin's clones were in this area. Not knowing what to aspect, the 5 to 6 clones who have already exposed themselves continue their attack. Seeing the clones running towards her, 
Mieko smirked and stated, Let's see where your main body is hiding now. As soon as she said that, she spit out a small fire. That fire ignited the gas, causing it to rapidly expand and generate strong outward winds. The winds carried the gas up to 100 meters around Mieko and soon the whole area exploded. The ignition flame destroyed all 18 of Fujin's wind clones. It set fire to each and every tree in that area. And the fire seemed to be spreading further. Both Fujin and Hoko were left dumbfounded by the destruction. Chapter 63, Winter Mieko? Fujin was shocked at what he was sensing. What the fuck? All my clones were destroyed. Which jutsu is this? Hoka too was stunned by the destruction. When did Mieko get so strong? He quickly calmed himself and analyzed more. But, this jutsu shouldn't work on me as my Byakugan will notice the gas being released even if it is colorless. So I can just move out of the range. Fujin calmed himself down as well and observed the jutsu further. Hmm, the heat generated from the explosion seems to have already dispersed. It's just that there were trees around which got burned. So if I were to take this hit head on, it won't kill me. Though I'll be badly burnt. The wind clones are just too brittle. So they all were dispersed by the jutsu. While hiding underground, Fujin analyzed a bit more inside, I have never seen or heard about this jutsu. It was likely taught to her by the clan. I really shouldn't look down on any jutsu that wasn't used in the series. This world has way more jutsus, which are extremely lethal if used properly. Especially when I have no idea about these jutsus. Though the destruction caused by this jutsu is impressive, I can easily nullify it with even just a breakthrough jutsu by blowing the gas away. But I just didn't have any idea about this jutsu, which resulted in my clones getting wrecked. I wonder if she yelled the name of her jutsu purposefully. Rinjiro nodded and smiled, seeing Mieko counterattack successfully even when being in such a disadvantageous position. This performance by her is very good. I did expect her to retaliate but didn't think it'd be this successful. Fujin found the battle to be too easy, and hence let his guard down and played around instead of focusing entirely on defeating her quickly. This provided Mieko with a window of opportunity to use this move. He then looked at the spot where Fujin was hiding underground and a complicated expression appeared on his face, he is just way too careful. Though he did drop his guard slightly, he was always extremely safe. While this is good and will ensure that he stays alive, he's missing out on opportunities to gain crucial experiences. After all, if he never faces a crunch situation while sparring, and if he suddenly faces one during a mission, he'll find it very difficult to stay alive. Unfortunately, I can't get him to be more proactive during spars. I hope that this doesn't end up causing him any serious loss. After using the jutsu, Mieko dropped to her knees. The jutsu took a major portion of her chakra. And she had to use fireproof jutsu to protect herself from being burned as well. So her chakra level had dropped a lot. Fujin didn't miss this fact. So he created a shadow clone with roughly 60% of his remaining chakra. The clone exited the ground and confirmed that the gas had already dispersed. The clone then made five wind clones. They dispersed and approached Mieko from all sides. While the shadow clone went back underground. The first wind clone reached where Mieko was and looked at her. Her chakra reserves had dropped very low and her whole body was covered in small wounds, many of which were bleeding. She looked back with her Sharingan and observed that it was another wind clone. Fujin's wind clone said, Give up. You are too injured to continue. Mieko snorted and shouted back, as if I'll give up against someone too scared of showing his own face. Fujin's clone chuckled, Even if I just hide from you, you'll end up losing consciousness due to exhaustion and perhaps even blood loss. Mieko smirked and taunted, I already destroyed all your clones once. I'll do it again until you are forced to fight me yourself. Saying that she began making the hand signs again. But four more clones appeared around her and all attacked her, disrupting her jutsu. Earlier, only Fujin's wind clone saw her hand signs. So he didn't know the hand sign she does for that jutsu. But it didn't matter, as he no longer wanted to give her any more opportunities. 
Mieko tried her best to dodge, but was hit by winds caused by multiple winds caused by the wind explosion jutsu and took a breakthrough jutsu head-on, resulting in her flying back for dozens of meters and falling on the ground. She yelled in pain while being cut and flung away. The forest was still burning, so Fujin's winds became very hot, which hurt her even more despite having a high resistance to fire. She tried getting up, Arg, this hurts a lot, but I finally have some distance. I'll use it. She was about to use up all her chakra to use another aerial explosion jutsu, but her Sharingan noticed a chakra signature underground. Is he doing another sneak attack? Wait! His chakra is very high. Finally, he is attacking with his main body. I just need one chance, and I'll win. Her thoughts were cut by Fujin's arm appearing out of the ground. He grabbed her neck, while exiting the ground, and slammed her on the ground while strangling her neck with his right hand and pinning her to the ground. He looked at her and said, You've lost, give up. But Mieko smirked despite being in pain. In his moment of carelessness, Fujin looked straight into her eyes. Sharingan Jinjutsu At the very next moment, the scene changed for Fujin. The Mieko he was grabbing transformed into flames and escaped his grasp. The burning trees around him began moving and walking toward him. Mieko reformed her body in midair while laughing arrogantly, you looked into my eyes. She laughed even more before saying, it's my win Fujin. No one can match an Uchiha in a fair fight. Chapter 64 Waterfall Jutsu The burning ants exhaled flamethrowers on Fujin. But he just ignored the damage. He looked at Mieko and sighed, you really need to know when to give up. In the real world, Fujin's wind clones chuckled when they saw Mieko using Jinjutsu on his shadow clone. One of them softly said, Defend her sensei. He used up all his chakra to create a wind gale wolf, which pounced on the shadow clone and dispersed it. His claw continued towards Mieko's abdomen when Renjiro flickered in and dispersed the wolf. In the Jinjutsu world, as soon as Fujin's shadow clone said that, he disappeared due to being destroyed in the real world. Not understanding what was happening, she broke her Jinjutsu and saw her sensei standing next to her, with three of Fujin's clones still watching her. Rinjiro announced, Fujin is the winner. Not understanding, Mieko asked, what hap? Unfortunately, the Sharingan Jinjutsu took the last bits of her chakra. She blacked out without completing her question. Rinjiro checked on her while asking loudly, how long are you going to hide? Hearing that, Fujin exited the underground and flickered next to Renjiro with a smile on his face. The wind clones dismissed themselves. A slash in, hey guys. Please let me know your thoughts regarding this fight. Whether anything can be improved, or if any unnecessary stuff was added. The fights in the Naruto series, or any other manga slash anime, usually involve too much talking between the fighters or screaming the names of their jutsus. In some cases, they also explain their own abilities. I don't intend to follow that. Honestly feel stupid. The dialogues I add in the fights will only be absolutely needed ones. If any additional is added, it'll either be due to that character being dumb or arrogant or would be in a way that the character uses his words to distract the enemy. Rinjiro looked at Fujin and said, Good work. Now pick her up and move towards where Hoka is. I'll douse this fire before it engulfs the entire training ground. Fujin nodded. He picked Mieko up and flickered to where Hoka was. He put Mieko down next to him. Hoka had already seen the result of this fight. He sighed on seeing Fujin completely unharmed and wondered, What could I have done differently to win this fight? Knowing that Renjiro will most likely use a water jutsu to douse the fire, he kept his focus on sensing Renjiro. He said to Hoka, keep an eye on where Sensei is. Hoka nodded and activated his Byakugan once again. Renjiro had jumped high up in the air. He was almost 100 meters high in the air. And at that time, he began building up his chakra. Fujin and Hoka were both shocked by the amount of chakra gathered by Renjiro. Fujin swallowed his saliva, what chakra? Elite Jounin indeed. I guess this is the first time I'm seeing him perform a jutsu seriously. 
At 100 meters up in the air, Rinjiro made a hand sign. Water release, waterfall jutsu. He expelled a huge amount of water from his mouth. The water fell down right under him like a waterfall and then flooded out in all directions for around 500 meters. Fujin and Hoka were shocked once again. Hoka asked, Hey Fujin, how did he gather so much water when there's no water nearby? Fujin replied, No idea. Remind me to bug him later about this. Hearing that answer, Hoka smirked, If we could summon so much water, all our opponents would just be washed away. Fujin nodded while adding, Not all, but most yeah. He wondered, Isn't this similar to what Tobarama did against Haruzen? Makes sense that Renjiro's water jutsus are so strong. Tobarama probably left all the details regarding his own water release and Senju libraries. The flood doused all fire, releasing a huge amount of steam up into the air. Renjiro checked whether any fire was remaining. On confirming that none was, he flickered towards his genins. On seeing Renjiro, Hoka for the first time was very impressed with his sensei. While the training Renjiro provided was very good, seeing such a display will always create a greater impression on 10-year kids. Renjiro walked towards Mieko and lifted her and put her on his right shoulder. While Hoka was being awestruck, Renjiro walked behind him and lifted him by grabbing the back of his neck with his left hand. That snapped Hoka out. He realized how he was picked up and immediately started flailing his hands and legs in the air, completely losing the famous Hyuga composure, put me down sensei. What are you doing? Fujin saw the comical scene in front of him. A huge buff Senju guy had a prideful and arrogant Uchiha girl lying unconscious on his right shoulder and an aloof Hyuga kid flailing desperately in his left hand. In a mere second, he began laughing uncontrollably, ha 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 damn, this brings memories of guy carrying Kakashi from Suna to leave, ha ha ha. The laugh annoyed Hoka and he flailed even more before being smacked by Rinjiro. What are you struggling for? I'm taking you both to the hospital. Hoka replied, I can walk there sensei. Rinjiro asked again, on one foot? I don't have time to waste an hour walking with you. Hoka continued complaining, but sensei. Unfortunately, he was completely ignored by Rinjiro. He looked at Fujin and said, we will take a mission as soon as these two are healed up. Don't do heavy training till then. Preferably take a complete break from training. Fuji nodded, while still laughing at the sight in front of him. Rinjiro was about to leave, but he suddenly recalled a certain memory. He looked at Fuji and said, The reward of rank A Jutsu is what I'm awarding you, and not the village or Senju clan. So you can only ask for a Jutsu that I know or can easily get. This suddenly put an end to Fujin's laugh. However, before he could complain, Rinjiro had already flickered away. Fujin muttered internally, smart bastard. While traveling to the hospital, Rinjiro sighed in relief, good thing that I cleared this up. So later on he can't pester me. This brat asked the third for swords worth tens of millions of Ryo. Who knows which jutsu he'd have asked me if I didn't clear this up. Chapter 65, Bernal Rinjiro reached the hospital and put Hoka down. They walked into it, and Rinjiro asked a nearby nurse to arrange two beds for his students. Rinjiro was a well-known name. So she arranged it immediately. Seeing Hoka struggling to walk, the nurse asked, Do you want to sit in a wheelchair, so that we can take you to the room? Hoka immediately declined, No, I'll walk myself. The nurse seemed to be at a loss as to what to do when Rinjiro asked, Should I carry you once again? That question sent a chill through Hoka's body. He reluctantly said, I'll sit in the wheelchair. On reaching the room, Rinjiro laid down Mieko on a bed. Hoka took the bed next to hers. Rinjiro asked the nurse, Check if any medical ninja is available. Send anyone who knows mystical palm jutsu here. The nurse nodded and replied, Yes, sir. She left to check who was available. While waiting for a medical ninja to appear, he looked at Hoka and asked, Any thoughts on the fight? Hoka sighed and replied, We lost at the moment we decided to fight against each other instead of chasing after Fujin. At the very least, we should have stopped before one of us got injured. 
that way we could have still been able to fight. Another issue was the lack of information. Fujin's two attacks surprised and overwhelmed me too much. If I had prior knowledge regarding it, I could have fought equally against him. Rinjiro nodded and commented, it should also be a lesson for you, who are too obsessed with taijutsu. Both Fujin and Mieko worked on ninjutsu that can cause large-scale destruction. If they get an opportunity to use the jutsu when the opponent has guard down, it becomes an easy win for them. You, on the other hand, will first have to reduce the gap between yourself and your opponent and then hit him to get an advantage. While not bad, it leaves you at a huge disadvantage against ninjas who can fight from range. I understand your obsession with taijutsu, but if you want to be able to use your taijutsu effectively, you need to learn other skills as well. Hoka nodded and reflected on what his sensei advised him. Soon, a medical ninja came. She healed Mieko and Hoka. Mieko had a lot of small cuts and bruises. However, none were serious. They were all healed easily. But Mieko kept sleeping due to the chakra exhaustion. Hoka, on the other hand, had a slightly serious injury to his left ankle. She healed him entirely as well, but advised him to rest for two days and not put any stress on his left ankle. After the procedures were done, Rinjiro left. He gave a message to Hoka's and Nieko's families informing them about their kids, and to Fujin, that he'll have a three-day break at least. A few hours later, Mieko woke up. She was surprised at seeing herself in the hospital, with her mother sitting next to her and Hoka in the adjacent bed. Their family members bugged them for quite some time before they finally stopped bothering them. When there was no one else in the room, Hoka asked, Mieko, what was that jutsu you used? The question brought back memories of her horrible defeat and turned her mood down once again. She replied, it's a secret jutsu of our Uchiha clan. Fire release, aerial explosion jutsu. It releases a lot of gas that is odorless and colorless. So it's very hard to notice and it is very easy to ignite. Hoka understood, oh, no wonder Fujin got caught off guard. Mieko smirked and agreed, yeah. This jutsu has the drawback of needing a few seconds for the gas to spread to have maximum effectiveness. That's why I yelled the name of the jutsu so that his clones would get on guard and not attack recklessly, giving me the time I needed. Hoka nodded, nice tactic. Too bad that it only hit his clones. Hearing that, a scowl once again formed on her face. She said, My plan was to secretly use this jutsu while we three were engaged in close combat. That way you both would have been hit by it and I would have won easily. She gritted her teeth, I never imagined that Fujin would fight so shamelessly and never appear in front of me at all. Even when I taunted him, he still kept hiding. Damn, this is so frustrating. Seeing her reaction Hoka laughed, Yeah, I agree. Next time, let's not fight each other much until we can engage with Fujin. Mieko sighed and agreed. It was tough for her to agree to this due to her pride. But unfortunately, there wasn't any other way. Yakiniku Restaurant Unlike his two teammates, Fujin spent the day eating in his favorite restaurants and taking a well-deserved break. Earlier, when Rinjiro tracked him to inform him about his teammates, he saw Fujin at Ichiraku eating without a care in the world. Seeing him eat so relaxingly after beating up his teammates made Rinjiro sweat a bit. But he didn't comment. The next morning, Fujin wondered, should I go to check on those two? He thought for a bit before concluding, well, they are my teammates. And I was the one who injured them, so I should go and check on them. After freshening up and doing some light stretching, he began moving toward the hospital. But suddenly he stopped, wait. When visiting people in hospitals, isn't it tradition to get something for them? Yeah, that used to be the tradition in my previous life. Even in the Naruto series, I recall many carrying flowers or fruits while visiting patients. Yeah, let's carry a gift for both. He then fell into another dilemma, so, what do I get for them? Flowers kinda seem like a waste. Fruits are kinda too cliché. I'm sure their family members have already brought a lot of fruit. Hmm. What should I get? And then it suddenly hit him, I know. 
I should get a burn all for both of them. Ha ha ha. Chapter 66, Scary Mom He flickered to get a couple of gifts for both his teammates, and then flickered to the hospital and inquired about the room they were in. He quickly found their room and entered it. Both of them were up. Hoka's left leg seemed to be plastered. He had a few more bandages on him. Mieko, on the other hand, was put in enough bandages that one could easily mistake her for a mummy. As soon as Fujin entered, they both gave Fujin a stinking eye. Seeing their childish reactions, Fujin couldn't help but smile, I really should have brought them Bernal, haha. Seeing that neither of them wanted to talk first, he greeted them, Hey guys. How are you doing? Both of them snorted and looked away. Fujin sighed loudly and said, After I went through all the trouble of getting you something. Oh well, I guess I'll just eat it myself. That attracted their attention. They saw a pack of cookies and a set of dango in Fujin's outstretched hands. In under a second, Hoka snatched the cookies, while Mieko snatched the dango. They both began eating it right away. While they were eating, Fujin tilted his head while looking at Mieko and asked, Shouldn't you check whether they're real or just clones first? That pushed Mieko over the edge. She instantly got up and yelled, Bastard. The next time I'll beat you up. Wait, no need for next time, I'll beat you up right now. Stating that, she got off her bed. Fujin created distance between them and asked, Oh, and are you sure I'm not just a clone? She was about to make a move when a middle-aged lady walked into the room hearing the commotion. Her features were similar to Mieko's, just much more mature. She saw Mieko standing up and narrowed her eyes and asked, Why are you out of your bed? Mieko immediately apologized, Sorry mom and jumped back into her bed. Fujin smiled at her antics, Oh, looks like she is terrified of her mother. Mieko grabbed her second dango stick and was about to eat it when the dango disappeared from her hand. Mieko turned her head to see her mom standing next to her bed, holding her dango as well as all the remaining dango in her hands. Her mom looked into her eyes and said strictly, You are recovering, young lady. Why are you eating dango instead of the fruits that I brought for you? Mieko nervously replied, Sorry mom. But I have already healed completely. So it should be fine if I eat a little bit of dango, right? Mieko's mom didn't reply and just stared Mieko into her eyes. The stare down continued for 30 seconds before Mieko backed down and apologized again, Sorry mom. I was wrong. Her mother sighed and then began giving her a long lecture. Fujin's eye twitched at this interaction. He was thoroughly amused by this interaction, she spoke thrice. All three times she started with sorry mom. This is funny. Hoka had already seen how strict Mieko's mother was on the day before. However, instead of finding the situation amusing and laughing secretly, he first stuffed all the cookies in his mouth and gulped them down rapidly. Mieko's mom noticed this and stared at him as well. However, he never looked at her and kept looking outside the window. She continued her lecture and lectured Mieko for five minutes straight. During these five minutes, Hoka kept awkwardly staring in another direction, while Fujin awkwardly stood next to him. Mieko, meanwhile, looked down at the bed the whole time, while trying not to cry at the injustice she was facing, first that irritating guy appeared and teased me. He did make it up by bringing me my favorite dango, but he taunted me once again. And then, my own mother took those dango away. Not to mention, she's also lecturing me in front of my teammates. After lecturing her, she looked at Fujin and said in a straight voice while staring at him, Fujin Kuen, you first beat my little girl, and then you brought her dango to eat? Now Fujin became alert, is she going to lecture me as well? He quickly replied, sorry auntie. Sensei said that she was already healed yesterday so I didn't think it'd be an issue. Before she could reply, he looked at Hoka and Mieko and said, I have some work to do with Sensei. I'll see you around later. Without waiting for anyone's response, he flickered out of the window. Hoka looked enviously at the window, at least he could run away. I'm stuck here. Mieko, on the other hand, was too embarrassed to think about anything. Mieko's mom was surprised. 
She said to her, Your teammate can lie with a straight face without any embarrassment. You were right about him. Hearing that, Hoka looked toward Mieko's mom and saw her staring at the empty pack that had his cookies. He screamed internally in horror, Crap! Fujin was walking on the streets while thinking, Well, that was awkward. No wonder she acts like a stuck-up bitch all the time. She probably spends all the time back home being embarrassed. Anyways, both of them have pretty much healed. So we should start taking missions on the day after tomorrow. So how should I spend these two days? After thinking for a while, he sighed, other than training, I really haven't gotten any hobby in this world. Perhaps few in jutsu, but that too is a part of training. After thinking for a bit more, he had an amusing idea, should I recreate some of the famous manga or novels from the past world in here? After all, the literature here is pretty underdeveloped due to constant wars and the lack of a safe environment. So those manga and novels should be a complete hit. He analyzed the idea more. But soon he shook his head, while I remember their general stories and plot, I don't really remember all the details. It's just been way too long. Not to mention, it'll take a lot of time. Not something I can spare right now. Not having anything to do, he explored other restaurants around Kanoha and later visited and relaxed in the famous hot spring bath in the village. A couple of days later, Team Renjiro assembled outside the Hokage building. Chapter 67, Bandit Exterminators Team Renjiro entered the Hokage building together and went to the mission room. On seeing the Chunin in charge of distributing missions, Renjiro said, Give us all the C-rank bandit elimination missions in the area between Kanoha and Tenzaku area. The Chunin nodded and handed seven missions to Renjiro. Rinjiro read the missions while thinking, I haven't been taking any missions for the last seven months. I know the old man wanted to give me a break. But I have had a long enough break. He declined to give me an S-rank mission. So, I should at least clear out some basic issues. These bandits would be a good start. Hopefully, some of these C-rank missions will get upgraded to be rank. That'll also provide some good training for the kids. All three of them are already ready to be promoted to Chunin. He stored the mission request forms. Then he looked at his squad and said, Let's move. The Jinnins nodded and everyone flickered towards Kanoha's entrance gate. In the next week, seven bandit camps were completely decimated. In that month, Team Renjiro slaughtered 18 bandit camps in the Land of Fire. The team started taking these missions with excitement. But by now, they were sick of it. Hoka, Fujin, and Mieko waited outside the Hokage building while Renjiro was selecting more missions. Mieko complained, Why are there so many bandits in our country? Also, why aren't they stronger? Hoka sighed and said, Yeah. Eighteen camps and there wasn't a single bandit as strong as us. Fujin added, I think our missions are purposefully chosen so that we don't end up fighting anyone strong. Mieko commented, That's even more frustrating. Fujin sighed and nodded, yes. I had heard that many rank C missions go wrong and get upgraded to rank B or even A. I thought that it was a rather common occurrence. But it seems like I was wrong. Hoka replied, they don't happen that often. But they often cause serious injury or death. That's why you hear about them very often. Fujin said, oh. That makes sense. I didn't think about it that way. Mieko interrupted, you guys are getting off topic. Think how we can get a better mission. Should I yell at that mission-giving guy again? Last time he gave us a rank C mission. So maybe he might give us a B rank mission. Fujin looked at her and asked in a bored tone, last time I threatened him with you burning a baby. I don't think he'd really mind us burning bandits. That comment made her face a bit red due to embarrassment. They were about to talk more when Renjiro walked out of the building. He announced, Today, we won't be taking a bandit hunting mission. Hearing that the team was excited, Mieko asked quickly with a lot of expectations, Can we do a B-rank mission, Sensei? Renjiro was amused by her question. Her expectations came crashing down as Renjiro shook his head and replied, No, we will be escorting a merchant to Degarashi port in the land of tea. 
Hearing that, all three Jinins gave Renjiro a deadpan look. Fujin asked, What will we be protecting him from, Sensei? Renjiro smirked and answered, Bandits, of course. He enjoyed the look of betrayal on his students' faces for a few seconds and then said, This will be a long trip. We will need around two weeks to reach there and around three days to return back. So pack your stuff, we will be leaving at noon. The Jenins dejectedly replied yes and left. While leaving, Mieko asked Fujin, Fujin, do you think threatening that mission guy with the life of the merchant might work? The team hadn't walked far away. Rinjiro immediately sweated a bit as he heard it properly. He said slightly loudly so that his students could hear him, it won't. I'll just take you to do bandit extermination missions for. Not wanting to hear their sensei's threat, the Jinins just flickered away while laughing. Rinjiro just sighed at the antics of his students and muttered, I'm too old for this shit. Kanoha's main gate. At noon, Team Rinjiro gathered here. As usual, Fujin arrived last. Rinjiro, Hoka, and Mieko were standing here, alongside eight merchants and two carriages filled with goods. Each of the two carriages had its reins attached to two bullocks. Fujin walked towards Hoka and Mieko who were standing behind Rinjiro while he was talking with the most well-dressed merchant. On seeing Fujin, Rinjiro said, This is Fujin, Toshio-san. The last member of our group. Fujin looked at the guy and said, Hello. The merchant smiled, slightly bowed towards Fujin, and replied, I am Iha Toshio. A merchant from the land of tea. We will be in your care, Fujin Kuen. Please take care of us. Fujin nodded while thinking, This guy is awfully polite. Did he say this to all three of us? On a serious note, however, though he seems very carefree, he is actually very tense. He looked at Rinjiro and stared at him while wondering, Is there more to this mission than he said? Now that I think about it, why did he suddenly take such a long mission? Earlier he seemed rather obsessed with making land of fire bandit free. Rinjiro saw Fujin staring at him and wondered, has his sensory skills become so acute that he can even sense worry? I knew he could detect lies from chakra fluctuations, but has his sensor skills improved to this degree? Very few outside the Yamanaka clan can detect worry. And most of them are very experienced and veteran ninjas. Not wanting Fujin to catch on to anything, Rinjiro stated, the path that we are taking has a number of bandit camps. We have eliminated most of the bandit camps between Kanoha and the lands of river and rain. Through this mission, we will exterminate the bandits en route from Kanoha to the land of tea. So keep your guard up, as there are at least 17 known bandit camps in our way. The Jenins nodded on hearing this. Mieko and Hoka sighed internally. While Fujin wondered, is he just worried due to the bandits? Or is it something else? Oh well, we should find out soon. I should stay on guard though. Rinjiro then did an inventory check, while Toshio checked whether all his goods were packed. In 15 minutes, Team Rinjiro left alongside the merchants of Land of Tea. Chapter 68, Trade Boom Two carriages pulled by bullocks, eight merchants, and four ninjas traveled on the road, steadily moving away from Kanoha. They traveled until evening without a break and then set up a camp. No bandits were encountered as all bandits in this area were exterminated by three of those four ninjas not long ago. While having dinner, Hoka sighed and said, they move just way too slowly. Fujin agreed, yeah. We spent the last four months training and just hunting on our own. So we pretty much always moved at top speed. Mieko joined the conversation, yeah. At least this one is a bit faster than the previous one though. That last escort mission to the land of rivers had 12 carriages. And their wheels broke off so frequently. Hoka smirked and said, yeah. We remember how frustrated you were. Fujin added, Yeah. I suspect the main reason Sensei kept standing next to the carriages at that time was that he was worried you'd burn them yourself. Ha! Huh. Hoka joined in the laughter, while Renjiro ignored their antics. Mieko just snorted and ignored them. After dinner, Renjiro said, We will begin moving tomorrow at 4 a.m. Tomorrow's traveling speed will be faster than today. 
Tonight, we will all keep watch turn by turn. Fujin, you are first. Wake Hoka up after two hours. After Hoka, it'll be Mieko and last me. The Jinins nodded. Rinjiro had a word with Toshio. Soon Hoka, Mieko, Rinjiro, and the merchants went to sleep. Fujin sat on a branch and began meditating. Soon, he could sense all chakra within a 1.2 kilometer radius. Fujin thought, I haven't trained my ability to sense for months. Still, the improvement has been decent just due to the increase in my chakra reserves, chakra control, and regular spars. I should try and keep this on for two whole hours. Should be good training. I wonder if I'll last that long considering that my chakra reserves are full. Fujin stayed in that meditating position for the entire two hours. During this time, he used all his sensing skills to examine the merchants and their goods but found nothing unusual. He had to keep changing the range of his sensory field between 600 meters and 1.2 kilometers for optimal chakra management, but he managed to last the two whole hours without any issues. He still had around 60% of his chakra left. He woke up Hoka and went to sleep. The group traveled for four days in this manner without any issues. On the fifth day, around 9 a.m. in the morning, the group was surrounded by bandits who were hiding behind the trees or on them. All four ninjas noticed the bandits but didn't react. Fujin softly asked, so who gets them? Hoka immediately replied, I want them. I haven't fought or trained for four days straight. Mieko, however, argued, neither have I. And as you know, ladies first. Hoka commented, you are just a little girl. Say that when you become a lady. That immediately infuriated her. She shouted back, why yo? However, Rinjiro interrupted her, quiet down. Mieko shut up and looked at Hoka angrily. Rinjiro stated, all three of you will take them on. I won't help you guys, but do remember that you also have to protect the goods. Fujin asked, should we just kill them, or also find and destroy their camp? Rinjiro answered, both of course. But only for this group. Every time a bandit group attacks, you'll take permission from me before attacking their camp. The three nodded. Hoka looked at Fujin and asked, where to check? Fujin replied, 700 meters northwest. And 900 meters east. Hoka activated his Byakugan and checked, 900 meters east is just a few normal homes. The camp is at 700 meters northwest. Fujin asked Renjiro, Sensei, will you be protecting the goods when we attack the camp, or should we defend it then as well? Renjiro replied, after you eliminate the bandits here, all three of you can go. Fujin replied, all right, let's begin then. All three moved at a high speed, which made it look like all of them had disappeared. Both, the merchants and the bandits, who were keeping an eye out secretly, were shocked. In under a minute, all the bandits surrounding the group were dead. A few dead bodies or even heads fell down from trees next to merchants. Surprisingly or unsurprisingly, they didn't freak out as they had seen similar scenes multiple times in the past. Though they were surprised to know that the killers were three innocent and sweet nine to ten years old kids. The Jinnins then flickered towards the bandit camp and eliminated everyone in there as well. They killed two more bandits who were at another spot in the forest, completing the bandit elimination submission in under five minutes. The group continued on its way. Over the next eight days, fourteen bandit camps were eliminated. The trio wondered whether they get a bandit exterminator nickname back in Kanoha. Unknown to them, their team was already known by that name among the Chunins who distributed missions. By now, the swift and brutal one-month campaign of Team Renjiro around Kanoha to exterminate bandits was well spread. Many bandit groups had moved away from Kanoha. A few even began leaving the land of fire entirely and continued their banditry in the weaker neighboring countries such as the land of rivers, land of grass, land of rain, and land of rice. This time, it was the turn of the bandits on this route to suffering. In under a month, the bandits close by would get the news of the slaughter. Some would visit to check if something did happen. 
and they would see the gore and would end up either quitting banditry or moving away and making trading easier for Kanoha. Hiruzen would soon pick up on these movements and launch an even more brutal assault on these bandits. This would not only boost Land of Fire's economy due to increased trading, but also improve Kanoha Ninja's reputation and get them more jobs that would require lesser effort to complete. Kanoha would also receive more funds from the Daimyo of Land of Fire due to this act. And it'll prove to be a huge aid for Kanoha to recover from the losses of the Third Great Ninja War. Especially over the next three years when more than a thousand Jinnins will join the reserve force and a few hundred will begin training under a sensei. Of course, the loss of Jounins due to Kyuubi's assault won't be overcome for almost a decade. And even more importantly, while the recovery was in progress, Kanoha would end up losing their strongest clan to internal friction. Chapter 69 Schemes in the Darkness Team Renjiro and the merchants from the Land of Tea were traveling for the thirteenth day. Toshio said, We should enter the Land of Tea by evening. We will need another two days to reach the port though. Renjiro nodded and said, Keep an eye out. The Jinnins obeyed. The group journeyed until noon when they came across an open field. They decided to take a break for lunch there. The field was about as big as a football field and it was surrounded by dense forests on one side and a hill on the other. Fujin and Hoka checked whether the area was safe and didn't find anyone. While having lunch, Renjiro noticed something but didn't say anything. His students or the merchants didn't notice any change in his expressions. However, he was observing his students closely. Fujin, while eating lunch, activated his chakra field out of habit. When he did, he was shocked. Around 200 people had entered the forest and were around 600 to 900 meters away from them. They were moving rapidly towards them. Unlike Renjiro, Fujin's change in expression was easily noticed by Hoka and Mieko. They became alert and looked at him. Fujin said, Around 200 bandits have surrounded us and are closing in. 150, in the forest and 50, on the hill. Mieko scowled, More bandits? Fujin looked at Renjiro and said, not just bandits. Around fifty have high chakra. With maybe a dozen Chunin level and two Jounin level chakras. That shocked Hoka and Mieko. They both looked at Renjiro. Renjiro was impressed with Fujin's alertness. He smiled and said, well, here's your B-rank mission. Or was supposed to be. This looks more like rank A. He then got serious and commanded, prepare to deal with the bandits and jinn and level attackers. I'll deal with the stronger ones. Don't worry about the goods. Give main priority to your and your teammates' lives. And then to the lives of the merchants. The team nodded and got up. Seeing them get up, the merchants understood that there was an issue and got alert too. Toshio in particular became very worried. They all immediately got up and hid behind their carriages. Two days earlier, two people stood and observed the open field in the middle of nowhere. Both of them were Jounins. One of them was Wagarashi Tomio, who was from the rival family of the Wasabi family. The other was Tamanaha Norio, who was a rogue ninja from the land of rivers. He had a bounty of five million Rio. Wagarashi Tomio said, from the information that our spies sent, five escort teams were moving from Kanoha toward Digarashi port. One of them will be passing through here. When they do, they are bound to rest here. Tamanaha Norio asked, Who is escorting them? Wagarashi Tomio replied, The weakest team. A Jin and squad. Tamanaha Norio was surprised, and then began laughing arrogantly, Just Jinnins? They'll be dead in no time. Wagarashi Tomio was annoyed by his arrogance. He warned him, Don't underestimate them too much. They are led by Senju Renjiro, an elite Jounin. The Senju clan has a strong relationship with the Wasabi family. So it's a possibility that they are trying to sneak him in with this team. Also, their Jinin team has a Byakugan user. So we will have to be very careful. Tamanaha Norio frowned upon hearing that. He thought for a bit and said, Elite Jounin will be tough to kill. The only way will be if he desperately defends the Jinnins. As for Byakugan, 
I have a way. One of my men has a rat summon. He can use them to keep an eye on from a long distance. Once they have their guard down and rest, we can make a move. Wagarashi Tomio nodded. This plan was appropriate. They might not be able to kill Rinjiro, but killing the merchants shouldn't be an issue. As his genins were about to engage in battle, Rinjiro recalled his meeting with the Hokage before accepting this mission. Hokage's office two weeks earlier. Rinjiro entered the Hokage's office and saw the Hokage and another old man. Hiruzen said, Rinjiro, meet Wasabi Daichi. Rinjiro looked at the old man and asked, Wasabi? From the land of tea? The guy nodded and replied, Yes, from the land of tea. Hiruzen continued, There's a power struggle in the dark in the land of tea. There appears to be a scheme in the works against the Wasabi family, and maybe the daimyo as well. Rinjiro analyzed the information and asked, The Wasabi family has had a good relationship with Kanoha as well as with the Senju clan for decades. So do you want to help them? Hiruzen nodded, Yes. Unfortunately, we can't as it is just a scheme. If we interfere, we will damage our relationship with the tea daimyo. Rinjiro nodded, as he had already reached this conclusion. Hiruzen continued, Daichi here has an important position in the Wasabi family as he handles their finances and many important deals. So their opponents want to eliminate him. I want you to escort him along with your team. This surprised Rinjiro. He asked, this seems to be a rather important mission. Why send Jenins? Hiruzen replied, their rival faction has a few hundred ninjas under them. Even if I send an Umbu team, they won't be able to protect him. The only way to protect him will be to send a larger team to protect him, but... Rinjiro completed his sentence, but you can't do that as the T daimyo won't like it. Hiruzen nodded and added, and if I were to send a huge force with him, the opponent won't attack and stay hidden. So it won't accomplish much. So we will follow this tactic. First, we will split up the enemy forces. There are five routes from here to the land of T. You'll take Wasabi Daichi with you while going on a rank C mission to escort merchants. You'll leave through the fifth route, as it's farthest from the sea and will prevent any interference from Kiri. Soon after, I'll send three Chunin squads on such escort teams along three other routes. Finally, a squad of Umbu will escort a decoy along the central path. They will send the majority of their forces against these decoys as they have the stronger teams assigned to them. This way, we will split their forces into five and have a legitimate reason to kill the ones attacking them. The other four teams will be allowed to retreat after killing as many of them as they can or engage in a hit-and-run tactic if they can. You, on the other hand, will need to move to Digarashi port at a fast speed so that their remaining forces don't regroup and target you guys. Rinjiro and the Hokage then discussed the strategy more and fine-tuned it and took action to implement it. Back to present. The bandits at the front were just around 100 meters from the edge of the open field. Hoka excitedly said, finally a good fight. Mieko was also excited. Fujin, who was thinking, suddenly said, don't activate your Sharingan or Byakugan. I think they are trying to disguise themselves as normal bandits, so let's pretend that we didn't notice them. I have a technique I want to try. Saying that he walked in toward the forest. Hoka and Mieko wanted to argue against him, but bandits had started to rush out of the forest. A few also began descending from the hill and shooting arrows. Hoka and Mieko noticed it. Hoka quickly made a hand sign, Rock Shield Jutsu. A rock shield appeared behind the merchants. All the arrows shot at them were blocked by it. At the same time, around fifty bandits, fifteen of them being ninjas, came running from the forest toward them. Since the ninjas were disguising themselves so that they could take the enemy by surprise, they too were moving at the same speed as bandits. More bandits were exiting the forest every second. Fujin unsheathed one of his swords and held it in his right hand. Chakra immediately began flowing through it and transformed into Wind Chakra instantly. He then held the hilt of his sword with both hands, pulled his sword back, and then swung it with full force forming an arc towards the incoming bandits. As he swung the sword, a sword slash appeared, 
and began moving at a rapid speed. When close to Fujin, the slash was extremely small, but as it moved it expanded exponentially. Alongside the slash, strong winds appeared which caused some dust to rise. Chapter 70 The Beginning of a Legend The bandits, as well as the ninjas, didn't understand what move was made. But considering that it was made by a kid, they didn't attach a lot of importance to it. The slash didn't have any color, so they couldn't actually see an incoming slash. Instead, they just noticed wind moving towards them at a high speed and dust rising up as the winds approached them. The bandits hadn't ever seen any ninjutsu. So they just kept running straight banking on their numbers. The ninjas, however, were alert. When the slash came close, they jumped five to six feet in the air to avoid it. When the slash reached them, it was around 50 meters wide. It first hit the bandits who were running like bulls. It immediately cut them in half at their abdomens. The bandits who were following them didn't get any time to react and were cut in two as well. Next, the sharp winds that were generated by the slash hit the jumping ninjas. It created shallow cuts all over their body. The unfortunate ones had their throats or wrists slit open. A few had winds cutting through their nails and skin, causing them to scream loudly in pain. Almost all had their eyes getting cut by the winds. In all, only four jinnins and two chunins were lucky, or perhaps unlucky, to survive. One chunin and two jinnins lost both their eyes, while the remaining two jinnins lost an eye each. They were horrified. The entire first wave of fifty bandits and ninjas was defeated by a single swing of the sword. And it still wasn't over. The bandits in the second wave, who had just reached the edge of the forest, were terrified of what they saw happen to their fellow bandits. Color drained from their face at that sight. The sword slash, which was initially colorless, now had a tinge of blood-red color to it. In no time, it hit the forest and flew through it, cutting down bandits and trees alike. Unlike the bandits, the ninjas in this group reacted quickly. Some dug underground. Some grouped together and created a layered rock shield protection. Others just ran up the trees to the top and jumped as high as they could. After penetrating around 40 meters into the forest, the slash lost its edge and died down due to the high number of trees in its path. The attack littered the field with blood and pieces of human bodies. The forest adjacent to the open field was completely in ruins. Though this attack was watched by a lot of people, none of them knew that this was the start of a legend. In the future, this attack would form the groundwork for that young man to create a whole new combat style that would wreak havoc in the ninja world. Hoka and Mieko were stupefied on seeing the result of a single swing of Fujin's sword. Their mouths were wide open in shock. Unlike them, who were just shocked due to Fujin's attack, the fifty bandits on the hill who saw the attack were terrified. The scene seemed like an extremely bad nightmare. A few bandits fainted due to fear and trauma. One bandit yelled in terror. That woke up the rest and they began scurrying away. Even the ninjas were terrified and began retreating along with the bandits. Tamanaha Norio, who was leading them, wanted to stop them, but he realized that there was no point in stopping them as their morale had hit rock bottom. So he decided to retreat and regroup. While retreating, he looked at the kid who swung the sword and thought, that's a jinin? Seeing them about to retreat, Rinjiro sighed and created a shadow clone. I knew Fujin's attack would create such an impact. He looked at the scurrying bandits and smirked, these guys are really unfortunate. He and his clone slammed their hands on the ground, pouring a huge amount of chakra into it. Earth Release, Rock Avalanche Jutsu Earth Release, Mud River Jutsu As soon as they slammed their hands on the ground, a rock avalanche formed and began rolling down the hill. The ninjas were about to run away when the ground under their feet turned into mud, making them lose their balance and fall. Everyone one of them fell into the mud river, including the Jounin. And a few seconds later, the rock avalanche went down the river. The bandits as well as the ninjas saw the terrifying scene in front of them. They couldn't move as their legs were stuck in the mud river. The river began dragging them down the slope, toward those murders down the hill. And, in front of them, huge rocks were rolling toward them. They yelled in despair, 
but in a mere few seconds, they were all crushed to death. Only one survived. Tamana and Norio, too, freaked out seeing the huge rocks rolling toward him. He was about to jump when his legs got stuck in the mud river that suddenly formed under him. The mud then began moving down the hill at a quick speed. He quickly made a few hand signs, water prison jutsu. A water barrier soon formed around him. At the next second, a rock rolled down on him. It hit the water bubble and pushed it to the bottom of the mud river. But it couldn't pop it. The rock was about to roll over. So Norio sighed in relief. Unfortunately for him, in the next second, a stone spear appeared at the bottom of the mud river and penetrated through it. It quickly penetrated the water prison bubble. Norio noticed the spear at the last moment and tried to get out of the way. It still stabbed through his body, but he was able to avoid getting hit on any vital body part. Rinjiro was surprised when he sensed that the guy was still alive. However, he wasn't worried, he is just extending his own misery. While he managed to stay alive, getting stabbed by the spear disrupted his control over the water prison. It collapsed and he got buried under mud. Norio gritted his teeth, with blood flowing through his mouth, and forced himself against the flow of the river, trying to remove the stone spear from his body. Unfortunately for him, his struggle, grit, and determination for survival will never be known to anyone. At the next moment, small spikes began growing out of the spear that stabbed him. That stopped his attempt to move immediately, causing him to yell in pain and vomit more blood. When he yelled, the mud from the river entered his mouth. Soon the small spikes grew into spears, poking out of his body. His struggle finally ended, as he died, with a dozen stone spears poking out of his body and he was buried ten meters deep in a mud river. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on part 3. Peace.